morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting of March the 7th, 2020-23. Uh, as we begin this morning, we're going to call upon Commissioner Moore to introduce her guests who will be bringing the invocation. Uh, after the invocation, we will ask Commissioner Moore if she will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, Bishop Cabarrus, uh, after the invocation, I will come down and we will do a special presentation to you at that time. Uh, after that, uh, I believe we have several um, proclamations. Uh, that will be presented. Uh, so with that, Commissioner Moore, you're recognized at this time. Yes, uh, Bishop uh, Cabarrus looks a little familiar because uh, two weeks ago, the mayor asked him to pray. But I have to say, Mayor, I asked him first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he is, I'm proud of you. He's a District 2 resident. We're happy to have you today. Bishop Kelvin Cabarrus is a native of Orlando. He's the loving and devoted uh, spouse to Deidre Cabarrus and the proud father to Kelsey and Kyler. Bishop Cabarrus is a child prodigy preacher, and he started preaching at the age of five. Over the past 30-plus years, he's served the body of Christ in various capacities. He presently serves as international revivalist and urban consultant for the Church of God International Headquarters of Cleveland, Tennessee. He's the founder and president of Bridge Builders Network, an ecumenical organization which unites cultures and generations for the advancement of God's kingdom and fulfilling the prayer of Christ, whose charge is to lead racial harmony and bring people together. Uh, Bishop Cobaris has served as senior pastor of multiple churches throughout the state, and he's also served as the state evangelism and home missions director for the Florida Cocoa Executive Office of the Church of God. He is an active member of our community and a trusted voice. Bishop Cabarrus also received the distinct honor and privilege to serve on the White House Office of Faith and Opportunity Initiative. Additionally, he's the proud graduate of Jones High School and earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Palm Beach Atlantic for organizational management. Bishop Cabarrus, would you lead us in prayer today? Good morning. Let us pray. Dear wise and loving Father, first let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. And thank you for life itself, for the measure of health we need to fulfill our callings, and for sustenance and for friendship. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thanks as well for the freedom to embrace you or the freedom to reject you. Thank you for loving us even so from your boundless and gracious nature. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to obey the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor I pray for our commissioners, and I pray for the various levels of county officials, and in particular for this assembled commission, I am asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times, a sense of welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and righteousness, confidence in what is good and fitting, Give them the ability to work together in harmony, even when there is honest disagreement. Give them personal peace in their lives and joy in their tasks. I pray for the agenda set before them today. Please give them an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved county of Orange. It is in your most blessed name I pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Okay, we don't have any proclamations this morning, so uh, we're going to move uh, right into our agenda this morning. And the next item on our agenda is public comment. And uh, uh, Bishop Cabarrus, you're certainly welcome to stay, but <laughs> if, if not, this would be a good time for you if you have to leave. Uh, we will, uh, we appreciate your attendance here today. Uh, in terms of the public comment, uh, at this time, uh, we invite members of the public to come forward regarding interests of concern that are within this board's authority. However, there are certain matters which are not appropriate for public discussion during this public comment period. These matters include pending procurement of land use issues or concerns that should uh, properly be brought to another board rather than this board. Uh, we will, of course, solicit public input during each public hearing scheduled for this afternoon. Uh, with that, Mr. Boyce, do we have any members of the public who wish to be heard at this time? Good morning. Yes, sir. We do. We have seven individuals from the public that wish to be heard this morning. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. I'll call you all three at a time. We'd ask that you line up on that opposite wall. And when you approach the podium, I'll invite you to do that. And I'll ask you to say your name and address for the record. And then we will start the time for you. All right. So we're going to start with Mr. Joel Breckles, followed by Ruthie Reeder, followed by Michael Perkins. Mr. Joel, if you'll state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes, sir. Thank you. My name is Joel Breckles, address 452 Heather Hills Drive, Claremont 34711. 452 Heather Hills Drive, Claremont 34711. Okay, so I am. what brought me here today is the uh, need for absolute justice. I was at the location of Dr. Christina Bosch at 5155 South John Young Parkway, Orlando, Florida, 32835. Um, visited the dentist one hour later. I had searing, burning pain for five to six days, mild nausea, felt like both palsy. I saw strains of talk. I was talking like this. The sunburn pain was numb to the area for four to five days. Area felt much larger. New physical sign on the left side of my face nine days later. The lips felt burnt too. All of the skin peeled off my lips, had bloody nose, sweats, chills inside of my cheeks felt strange. Bones got absolutely tired and sore, became very lethargic and weak, had diarrhea, yellow and orange, body aches, mus muscle weakness, canker sores everywhere in my mouth, joint pain all the time. A purple blue spot showed up on my lip, which indicates a high dose of radiation. Have credible documentation to prove this. Uh, stomach pain, bloody noses, neck stiffness, dry mouth, itchy eyes, um, lack of appetite, extreme sweats, goosebumps, on and on and on with these medical symptoms. Inspection report indicated an x-ray machine was made in 1989. Uh, DOS computer technology back then, Dr. Christina Bosch acknowledged in her email to me that her x-ray machine shorts and assured me that no extra radiation comes out and the x-ray comes out blank. Well, I suffered textbook radiation sickness grade two from the Center of Disease Control and continue to have waves of physical weakness and fatigue and has forever changed my life uh, and health going forward. There's disfigurement on my face and it continues to expand over time. I recently just had a breakout near my eye with red bumps. Um, my biopsy uncovered many things uh, that would point to radiation as well. Uh, of course, I was supposed to uh, hire and find an attorney and take care of all this, you know, medically and all that. Uh, well, they told me, every attorney told me I had to, had a medical diagnosis. It right. took uh, thank you, Mr. Breckles. over two uh, years to get a medical diagnosis. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, however, I'm sure you're aware that this board has no regulatory authority over dentists. Um, they are regulated by the state. And so I believe that your complaint, if there's a complaint there, is better addressed uh, with the State Department of Health or either. Yes, sir. I have, board. I have addressed. I've actually, I, if, if you will, barked up many trees. I guess I've been barking up the wrong one. I appreciate the time for you guys to actually listen and take the time to hear me. I really sincerely appreciate that. If you could point some direction. I mean, I, if there's a meeting, I know Mr. Lucas had said something about, uh, you know, possibly arranging something. I've got all kinds of information. I can show you who I've reached out to. I can show you who's reported by. We will, uh, thank you for your presence. Thank you, we'll, sir. We'll provide you the appropriate uh, people to contact. Okay. Yes, sir, I'll reach out to you. I'm Lucas. All right, next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Miss Ru Ruthie Reeder, followed by Mr. Michael Parkins. Miss Ruthie Reeder. All 
right, we'll go to Michael Perkins, followed by Trini Kiros, followed by Chantel Bennett. Mr. Perkins, if you'll state your name and address for the record, you have two minutes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Michael Perkins, 13644 Sun Shower Circle, Orlando, 32828. Mayor Demings, Commissioners, thank you very much for the time this morning. I come to you speaking on behalf of the Christian Service Center. I am the president of the board of the Christian Service Center, uh, located on West Church. We have three locations, actually. We have one in Winter Park. We have another location in Winter Garden. Our West Church location serves upwards of 650 to 750 people experiencing homelessness every day. We see the problem getting worse, as you all do in this community. We appreciate the mayor's recent decision to create an advisory board regarding tourist development tax dollars. We think that that board may serve a great opportunity to look at innovative ways that we can create forms of dealing with homelessness. We realize that there are restrictions regarding how those funds can be spent, but we hope that this board takes every opportunity to look at <coughs> unique and innovative ways to expend those funds in a way that can help reduce this problem. That as our rents increase and as our home prices increase, will only continue to get worse. I was recently in Atlanta, and the Atlanta that I saw regarding homelessness this year was a completely different town from the Atlanta that I saw last year. Homeless tent cities scattered around the town. We are on our way to having this unfortunate incident develop unless we do something very soon. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for your comments and uh, there'll be more to follow on both issues. Okay. Uh, next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Trini Kiraz, followed by Chantel Bennett, followed by Carol Blanco. Ma'am, please state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. Trini Quiroz, 2000 East Hillcrest, Orlando. It's been a while since I stand here. Today was a lucky day. As the pastor or gentleman that spoke before, I'm an advocate for the homeless people, the people that no one wants to be next to them because they smell so bad or don't look right or sleep in the streets or they are evicted because this uncontrollable rent increase is going on nuts, crazy in this county. It's all right for other states that have overpopulation, but this shouldn't be happening. The information says that there are 7,000 homeless people in Orange County, triple that amount. I should know, I visit the camps. I had a different speech, but because of the gentleman addressed the issue of high rents, evictions, and all of that, I'm going to leave it at that, and I will appreciate that any of the elected officials direct me to the right office, to the right place, so we won't be going around in circles. My heart bleeds for them. In my 30 years living in this county and living well as a homeowner, I had never seen the despair, the anguish, the crisis that we have, and we have elected officials. I need to know what we're gonna do to bring housing to the homeless and to stop the violence of increments of rents over $500 at times for people that cannot pay it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Kuros. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Ms. Chantelet Bennett, followed by Carol Blanco followed by Linda Sibley. Good morning, I'm Council and Mayor. I'm Chantelle Bennett, my address is 3290 Northeast 163rd Place. That's in Central Florida, um, 32113. 
I'm representing NPA Independent Decision, and I'm appearing in front of you today based on business done in Orange County, a hospital state. Um, for my first issue is I'm piggybacking on my um, one month ago, I came before you guys and asked y'all about an audit on Orange County Sheriff's Office. Now, I understand Ms. Demings, Val Demings has been being paid $100,000 a year to be a consultant, and upon that, what has happened, I don't understand, you had a consultant paying, being paid $100,000 a year to tell you that you need to listen to somebody else's brain thoughts um, and do your job. I don't understand what the misunderstanding was with that. I am in front of you today, Mr. Demings, for the last time and for, for four years now. You had an opportunity to make this issue right. I'm asking you to step down, address the people, let them know exactly what you have done and, what, and how you are slave, really slaving me. I want you to understand what has happened as treason to the country and, I, and you are slaving me. You are working me without pay. And you need to identify those Asian doctors at Orlando um, ORMC and you all need to be charged for medical malpractice. And I do not expect you to not acknowledge it or keep walking around like can't save the day when you know you got some really dirty issues in Orange County. You need to shut it down. I don't, you, I don't want nobody listening to my brain. Anybody in here f familiar with brain inferior? Well, let me let y'all know what brain inferior is. And brain inferior is a, is a, is a, a new project de developed by Elon Musk where people can listen to your brain. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bennett, for your comments. And, uh, you know, a lot of what you just said simply is not true, but... Uh, thank you for your comments. That, that is not true. You should not even okay. say that's not true. You should not even uh, say that's uh, not true. Okay. Um, I don't know where Ms. Bennett got most of what she just said to the public. Uh, first off, uh, I probably would be aware if my wife was acting as a consultant. That's simply not true. Those other things that you said simply aren't true either. And so to, to our listening audience, sometimes, you know, we, um, as a public entity, we allow people to come in and to make public comment. Those comments should be centered around issues that really this board has some authority over. Uh, that's why we have public comment. This is not a place to come for personal gripes or to come in feral uh, inaccuracies and uh, untruths. That's not. Uh, the purpose of this board. When we do so, what happens is you really um, disrespect the Board of County Commission during that process and you disrespect the citizens of Orange County uh, who uh, are here to hear meaningful issues. And so I say to uh, all of you, we uh, exercise an abundance of uh, liberty to allow our residents to come forward. Uh, I would just ask, don't abuse that process. Okay. Um, Ms. Bennett, you're out of order. You're, you're, you're out of order. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Ma'am, you're disrespecting this gathering of the public at this time. So it is really unfortunate. <laughs> that this that this happens sometimes. So you, some people suffer. Some people suffer, unfortunately, from mental illness, and it is what it is. It's a sad set of affairs. But okay, uh, let's move to the next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Miss Carol Blanco, followed by Linda Sibley. Name and address. Um, Carol Blanco, 6016 Montel Court, Orlando, Florida, 32810. Just start. Um, okay. It was almost a year ago that I and another resident were here to voice our concerns about our failed numerous attempts to get the noise ordinance enforced. We live in residential, unincorporated Orange County near Pine Hills, and we are not noise-sensitive people. 
We were being told by responding deputies that there was no noise ordinance or we had to call code enforcement or it was an EPA issue. After we spoke here, a sheriff's deputy came to our homes that evening with a report in hand recommending that four of us file for injunctive relief to stop the frequent noise harassment. It had devolved into a situation where one person was deliberately blasting music and setting off alarms when he knew we were home, then stopping when we departed. I'll go as far to say that the person causing all the noise is a former Orange County first responder and military vet with a history of erratic behavior, substance <coughs> abuse, and hallucinations. It doesn't help us that some of the responding deputies know him personally. He was ordered to get a full mental health evaluation by the judge presiding over our restraining order hearings, but that never took place. Two years of calling for help, and it hasn't even yielded a single written warning, and we are still being deferred to code enforcement, and it's a downright dereliction of duty. This situation has revealed serious flaws in our county noise ordinance and how it is handled by the Sheriff's Department. Only one of us was granted the restraining order, and she now refuses to call the sheriff for help. She has been told by responding deputies that the judge, and that's Judge Barbara Leach, doesn't have the authority to tell her stalker to limit his noise, that this is a county noise ordinance issue, and if she has a problem, she needs to call code enforcement. So we can't even get deputies to enforce the restraining order that the sheriff's department recommend that we get. We feel we are being forced to move and we would be joining the seven households that have either sold or vacated their homes. Thank you, Ms. Blanco. Um, uh, uh, Master Deputy Curtis Barnes is standing right in the back. If you would give him your information, we'll do some follow-up with the Sheriff's Office to see if there's a gap in, in the ordinance that needs to be uh, addressed by this body. So thank you for your presence. All right. Uh, next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Ms. Linda Sibley. Mayor. Mayor. We, we, we just wanted to address uh, Kara's concerns because she's a constituent of District 2. And so okay. we appreciate you getting her with um, uh, Deputy Barnes. But um, this family is having to wear headphones in their own house to stay there because of the noise coming. So anything that we can do to help her, it's just been intolerable. And I would like to support any review that we can have of the noise ordinance. We continue to get updates. I think the more urbanized we get, the more we realize that Potentially, it's outdated, and it could be time. Okay, we'll, we'll delve into getting the facts, and and then uh, where appropriate, we'll bring it before this board. Uh, Commissioner Scott, did you have anything on this issue? I'm good, Mayor. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, you all. Okay. All right. With that, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Linda Sibley. Address for the record, and you have two minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Linda Sibley, 5501 Thomas Square Drive, Winter Garden, Florida, in District 1. <coughs> speeding on Hamlin Gross Trail and how the speeding impacts the communities of Overlook and Cove. When a Cove or Overlook resident attempts to pull out of their respective neighborhood onto Hamlin Groves Trail, regardless of whether they are making a right or a left turn, they immediately encounter one or a combination of several other factors. Exiting drivers are forced to pull out onto the crosswalk at each egress to adequately view the oncoming, usually speeding northbound traffic. While doing so, pedestrians, runners, and cyclists routinely attempt to use the crosswalk by walking in front of the vehicle. When the driver finally has an opening in traffic to pull out, they are then confronted by the pedestrian or the cyclist in front of their vehicle. Speeding vehicles make it extremely difficult to gauge how much time you have to safely pull out onto Hamlin Groves Trail, particularly during inclement weather. Boyd landscaping still to this day blocks many of the intersections. Coven Overlook residents should be able to safely and easily egress out of their neighborhoods without being forced to deal with the excessive unenforced speeding on Hamlin Groves Trail and the pedestrians and the cyclists that walk in front of each of the vehicles. We request that Orange County seriously consider having some kind of traffic pedestrian cyclist control device placed at 
Hamlin Groves Trail and Porter, as well as Hamlin Groves Trail and Gwinnett, regardless of the current traffic count. The roundabouts have been proven to reduce speeds, eradicate street racing, and also provide safe cyclists and pedestrian crosswalks. All right, thank you, Ms. Uh, Shipley, for your comments. Um, our public works director is here, Mr. Joe Conkle. <clears throat> I'm going to ask him to kind of uh, research this a bit and uh, um, advise me accordingly, but, but thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Our next speaker is Zachary Moldoff. Oh, sorry, I got to bend down. I'm a little tall for the microphone. Oh, got you. I should have known that. My name is Zachary Moldoff. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I reside at 6928 Mills Road in uh, District 5. Um, I'm here today because of skateboarding. Um, I got arrested as a kid and had a pretty tough childhood and my entire life it's been very difficult to overcome some unfortunate circumstances from my childhood. Finding employment is not easy, but I've been fortunate to make a career for myself doing gang outreach, youth intervention, creating software that helps um, municipalities administer services through skateboarding creating cultural heritage programming with the state of Florida, with multiple libraries across Florida and Los Angeles, and basically found a range of ways to interface with municipal government productively over the circumstance of skateboarding in order to provide some much needed services in these times of radical change in our society. When we're realizing that so many youth are displaced and not given a productive path forward, skateboarding provides many of the paths and those paths are determined by participants rather than an authority figure who says, follow these steps and you can have good results. When I moved back to Florida um, last year with my wife, I was startled to find that the skate park infrastructure here is not adequate for providing services, let alone for creating spaces that are accurate to skateboard culture where skateboarding can take place. So Orange County is missing out on a tremendous asset and citizens are missing out on a, one of the most productive ways to avoid childhood criminalization. I've provided some documents uh, through an email that, that shows some pretty startling statistics. Within three years after opening a skate park in Long Beach, the, the local police department reported an overall decrease of 30% in childhood arrests. So when you think about that, you're talking about half as many kids roughly would be getting arrested today if you had more skate parks out there. And I don't want to bang on what has happened in the past, but with the amount of guns that are coming out and being used in the hands of kids, I can provide a lot of great alternatives. But I've spent the last eight months getting no response as I've reached out to a lot of people who do a lot of work for the county. So I'd love to use this as an opportunity to go forward productively. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. As we move forward, we plan our parks and other spaces. We try to take into consideration all those things that would improve uh, the quality of life for our residents, and we, we will continue to do so. In fact, in the very near future, the citizen safety panel that uh, and task force will be looking at some innovative ways to reduce uh, violent crime, particularly that uh, which involves the youth of our community. And so uh, there will be public uh, comment opportunities and uh, research that will be presented. And we'll certainly look at uh, promising uh, efforts that have occurred in other jurisdictions to see if it's an appropriate uh, response for our jurisdiction here. So thank you very much for your comments today. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. Mr. Zachary, my aide, Wes, is in the back. We actually do a skateboarding event every year with pro skateboarders. So love to connect with you so you can help us in the fall when we have our event. And That'd we just improved our skate park. So Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm, cool. I'm available if any of the, the council members would like to reach out. I'm happy to provide, like, just information or, or anything else that you might yeah, need right now. Yeah, we work with Galactic G. Yeah, yeah. And on our event. So please, Great. please talk to him. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And, and uh, I think what I was hearing uh, Commissioner Scott say was that uh, Barnett Park is one of those locations. So we do have them in our parks, and I know that the city of Orlando has uh, some facilities as well. So we'll follow up with you. All right, thank you for your comments. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Boyce, are there any other speakers? No, sir. That concludes our public comment portion for this morning.
All right, uh, to those of you who join us today for public comment, thank you for your presence. We're going to move forward to the consent agenda at this time. Uh, I'll go to the county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks, to present the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor Demings. We have one item to pull off the consent agenda. That one item is J4 under Planning, Environmental, and Development Services Department. Uh, J4 is to do with the Rises West Town Center. Uh, it will be considered this afternoon concurrently with public hearing D11. Uh, so with that, with the uh, removal of J4 to be heard this afternoon, Mayor staff presents the bulk of the consent agenda for board consideration. Uh, all right, and well, with that, if there are no other items to be pulled, is there a motion so for So moved, you reading? Second, more. We have a motion and a second, and just for the clerk, the seconder was Commissioner Moore. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. And the motion passes, and it is uh, unanimous. Um, with that, we'll move forward to our discussion agenda this morning, and we're going to ask Ms. Beth Jackson, uh, the environmental program supervisor, to come forward to present this item regarding environmentally sensitive land uh, acquisitions, and she will be presenting the annual report at this time. It's for general information for the board, no action is uh, being requested today. With that, Ms. Jackson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Today I'm going to be giving you an annual update of our um, progress on the preservation of our environmentally sensitive lands within Orange County. You can't hear? Okay. I'll try to speak up. Okay. Um, uh, to the sound technicians, uh, there's uh, someone in the, in so, the audience is saying they, yeah. they can't hear, but uh, uh, we can hear you, uh, Beth, okay. up here, but uh, okay. maybe we can uh, make some modifications there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So today I'm going to cover a, a program, Green Place program overview and a overview of our environmentally sensitive lands acquisition process, our progress on our acquisition, and then a summary. So <clears throat> um, the vision of the Green Place program is to preserve our environmentally sensitive lands to foster a community that is ecologically, economically, and socially resilient. I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm a little nervous today. So as you're aware, um, the preservation of our uh, environmentally sensitive lands has many benefits. Particularly, they help to protect our wildlife habitats. Um, they protect our water resources. They foster a resilient community. We worked on a project last year with the East Central Regional Planning Council on a study that tied the preservation of environmentally sensitive lands to stormwater and flooding and climate change. It helps to provide uh, foster sustainable growth, um, economic diversity, and a healthy community. So ecologically, it provides a habitat for our diverse and rich wildlife and plant so, species. So Beth, you want to get to slides? Oh, I'm sorry. I like that you know it so well. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm blessed with a good memory. <laughs> Thank you, Byron. So um, it's important to protect our surface waters and groundwater resources. It helps both in water quality and water quantity. It attenuates flood water. It provides storage for flood water. Resilient community, we need to be, maintain our resiliency. Economically, it's important because it's one of the factors that attracts both large and small businesses to a community when they want to wish to relocate. Also, it provides um, indirect and fi uh, direct financial benefits and jobs uh, for uh, that support the environmentally sensitive lands and the people who like to go out there. And also healthy, our health. It's important for both adult and childhood obesity rates. And right now I need a little of that stress reduction that it helps with as well. So um, 
Orange County has be, been preserving our environmentally sensitive land since the 1990s. To date, we have managed to preserve 23,354 acres. Of those acreage, 18,000 plus is open to, for nature-based recreation. And Orange County, um, our staff, we actively manage 5,101 acres. The rest is managed by our partners. And we're proud to um, say that we have the Green Place Advisory Board in place. We have seven members. Would you please stand up? And so we had our first meeting in February. And, and you know, I get to come up here and present to you, but I couldn't do it without my great staff. So I'd like them to recognize them as well. And so support for the program came from the mayor's transition team report, uh, our sustainable operations and resiliency action plan. And both of them had a goal to increase um, our environmentally sensitive lands by 20 3,000 acres by 2030. And so now I'm going to go over some of the milestones. So in January 26, 2021, we pro EPD provided a work session where we provided a funding and um, acquisition strategy to you. And later that day, the board approved a uh, payback strategy for a bond of 7% over 20 years for $100 million. And at that presentation, the board asked us to come back and give you a, an overview of our proposed resolution for the creation of our advisory board, as well as the proposed uh, revisions to the administrative regulation. So in September, the board approved $100 million for the purchase of environmentally sensitive lands, and we're truly grateful for your um, guidance and your wisdom in approving that. Um, and later in that month, we approved the resolution that created our Green Place Advisory Board, and we look forward to working with them. <clears throat> and then in February, we um, revised the administrative regulations. So some of the criteria that we added at that time was uh, ecotourism value and then um, nature-based recreation things like that. So we look at the manageability of these parcels, the current regulations or threat of a degrading event, and then um, <clears throat> water resource protection adjacency to our other publicly owned lands and privately, ecosystem diversity, rare habitat, non-imperiled and imperiled species. And so next I'm going to cover the parcel evaluation process. So it was very important for us to take that criteria that's in the administrative regulation and create a standardized evaluation and scoring methodology. We wanted it to be consistent and predictable. Um, so to do that, we um, developed a scoring companion guide. And in that companion guide, we have a list of resources that we can review um, during our evaluation process, each one, and then we, are, we provide a ranking for each one of these criteria. And then we also, um, it was important to the board members that we had a parcel nomination process, so we streamlined that. We have our parcel nomination form, and to date we've received about 216 forms or recommendations to look at parcels. Not everyone results in a uh, a form, and then we have we've set up a step-by-step -step process that we provide the um, individuals who nominate the parcels, and we have an acknowledgement and results letter. And so we can't do this alone. We have developed a great partnership with um, our real estate management um, division, and so we've worked on an efficient workflow process with them, and then we acquire the parcels and accordance with the administrative regulations that govern that. So now <clears throat> I'm going to cover the progress since uh, we started the process. 
Um, this diagram shows that we have so far been able to close on five parcels, but we've brought to the board since um, the beginning uh, 11 parcel uh, contracts for approval. Currently underway or have been completed 78 appraisals. We have identified, we've s submitted 215 willing sellers to REM to see if they would be interested in potentially selling their property to Orange County. And then um, to date, we've evaluated since uh, July of 20, July 2021, 458 parcels. So although we've only closed on 39 acre, 39.67 acres, um, the total acreage once we close on the uh, contracts that have been approved will total 381. We so far that would commit it to that would be $9.7 million. That does not include the support costs as your as you may remember, I said there are support costs that come along with this. You know, we have to appraise the parcels. We have to do phase ones and boundary surveys. And then so the average cost per acre is $26,000. And so far, we've been able to make purchases within District 2 and District 5. And so this map just shows you. Um, the parcels in the east portion of the county, they're depicted in red that you all have approved to date in that area. And I'm just going to highlight two of them. The first one is the Bagshaw Hampton. It is in the Econ Lackahatchee River drainage basin and the river actually forms the western boundary of the parcels. It expands on a 900 plus ecological corridor. It was the first purchase that the board approved. It was for 24.08 acres, and we purchased that for $1 million. And there's just some photos of the property there. And the next one is our, the Jean Dell property. It's within the St. John's River drainage basin. It also expands on an existing ecological corridor. It's 15.59 acres, and we purchased that one for $550,000. And it's directly adjacent to our Savage Christmas Creek Preserve and the East District Park. But the vision is to potentially link it up to the Seminole Ranch Conservation Area, Orlando's Wetlands Park, Charles H. Bronson State Forest, and then Southern connected, the Southern Route. We're hoping to connect Pine Lily Preserve and our Hidden Pond and House Scott up to, to those areas as well. And so this map is in the northwest part of the county, and we've uh, approved, recently approved two, five contracts. And I'm just going to highlight one of them. It's the Lewis Gress parcel. It's within the Wakaiva Rain, River drainage basin. It's one, it's, although the county has preserved scrub habitat through our parks uh, department before, this is the first one in the Green Place program that we've been able to preserve scrub habitat. And I want to point out there was an error in your um, package. It said 2.46 acres. It was really 42.46 acres. And we purchased those. That, yeah, that's a big difference. <laughs> I apologize for that. And we purchased that for uh, $1.49 million, those um, parcels. And then in summary, um, the board approved $100 million for funding and uh, for environmentally sensitive land acquisition. Enhancements were made to the evaluation and acquisition process to ensure transparency and predictability. We wanted somebody, if they wanted to pick up that companion guide to be able to figure out the score that we uh, figured came to or close to it. We've uh, managed to uh, acquire or have under contract 381 acres. And we are making progress towards the goal of um, adding to the county's ESL holdings. And that's the end of my presentation, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jackson, and uh, you're correct in terms of uh, 
this commitment that we made to increase uh, the number of environmentally sensitive lands within Orange County, it's a work in progress. Uh, yes, sir. But we're being very intentional about uh, moving forward with this endeavor uh, with the assistance of our, our Green Place Advisory uh, Board as well as um, our wonderful staff uh, that is involved from real estate and parks and recreation. Uh, we uh, are endeavoring to increase uh, the number of lands over time. So we do have uh, a relatively new uh, Chief Sustainability and Resiliency uh, Officer that we brought on board. Uh, she's been with us now for several months and, and so uh, she is going to be working uh, with community partners as well uh, in this endeavor. So um, let, let me just say uh, thank you. The, the goal here is to give the board an update so that we stay focused on uh, these efforts. And so we do have a number of members of the board who have uh, expressed a desire to make comments. And to the board members, I'm, I'm experiencing some technical <laughs> difficulties with the system today. Um, so, um, you know, just bear with me. So I may have to just kind of look uh, left and right uh, to make certain that we recognize you uh, be because of some of the technical difficulties. So I'm not uh, ignoring you. It's, it's, uh, I'm just trying to deal with the technical thing. Staff is working on that at this point. So we'll begin with uh, Commissioner Wilson, uh, followed by Commissioner Uribe, and then Commissioner Gomez Cordero. Well, well, you just got wiped out. So. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, <laughs> and uh, Commissioner Bonilla. So I'll go to Commissioner Gomez Cadero, then Commissioner Bonilla. Okay, all right, with that, uh, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. No worries. I was going to say, you know, I'll just start flagging down here, <laughs> waving my arms in the air. Um, but thank you so much. I know you said you were nervous starting out, but this was like, you know, one of these updates that for those of us who cared about this, I know we've been able to talk so many times about it. Um, it just, it, it is so resounding, and the message is so clear, I hope, to our public that it's a priority. Um, I, I can't say it loudly and clearly enough that I'm grateful for the funding that was earmarked when I came in for, so that this could kind of be part of this program. I will say that, and, and it's something that I, I know can't be probably answered right this second, but what I would like to hear from the Sustainability Board and EPD and the um, our Green Place Board eventually is, you know, this money will eventually run out. And we know expensive land is getting to be more and more of a premium. And having some um, sustainable and enduring way to continue to fund this program well past our times here would be such a, I think, gift to our community and our children and grandchildren. And um, so the idea, you know, has been brought up, you know, many times in many places with people when we talk about impact fees. And I know those are a different creature statutorily. Um, established that can it be tied to development you know that we literally take in um, a certain amount of money for various services when development happens and we think of those as being critical services and I can't think of anything more critical than providing the oxygen and water that these green places provide and I know it can't fall into that impact fee um, particularly language but you know I just want to plant the seed of looking for some nexus with the things that are impacting the environment to be able, able to help us offset the cost of acquiring, um, you know, and I, I know we go back to this idea of mitigation and people are like, well, that's what mitigation is. But the problem with mitigation is often it doesn't serve the area that's being impacted by the development. So I like the idea of some nexus to the impacts that are happening, having some input funding wise for the continued acquisition of natural lands. And it just seems like a very fair thing to bring to our public after they've observed some of the devastating impacts of development. Um, so I wanted to plant that seed. And then I wanted to ask, do you anticipate, because we've seen so many exciting things come out of HPD this year, including the wetland mapping and the wetland, state of the wetland update, um, do you anticipate that it's going to help the process of evaluation as we move forward? Because I know that part of the issue with some of these parcels is that they have elevated um, real estate costs and, and, and they've marketed themselves as something that's developable it at a high acreage when really, if you look at the map, there's a potential amount of that acreage that isn't developable. But we, we didn't really have a great picture of it until I think very recently. So kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I got to say my group is a map mapping geeks. We use GIS all the time in evaluating. So we've been pretty instrumental in helping with the wetlands importance mapping project. Um, it will, but 
we're not only interested in preserving our precious wetlands, we're interested in preserving our precious uplands, which um, they don't have the same regulatory protection as the wetlands do. So when people, people think we're just in it for, to preserve the wetlands, no, we, we, we equally or value even more the uplands that we can preserve through our program. And I think the Lewis Grass um, acquisition showed that. Um, so I do think that all the efforts that EPD and the county are undertaking to ensure that we are a resilient community will certainly be a benefit to us as well. I, I couldn't agree more and I, I'm so excited to see this, you know, the valuation and the upland, but I think my, my thought towards that mapping and, and what we know going into potentially negotiations over a parcel was the angle I, you know, I was hoping to see if there was um, a better understanding going into negotiations with a landowner or um, broker for a parcel that is being negotiated for 72 acres when we sort of know um, that potentially part of that acreage would be off limits. And I know it could be a totally different discussion for a different time, but I have, you know, I have that thought like any angle we can get to try to help um, because we're, we're really competing in some places with the open market on these parcels that are being marketed um, as developable in, in totality when we really know that some of them are or most of them are. Well, our, our real estate um, management uh, staff really know what they're doing and, and the appraisals reflect the, you know, some of the information we provide them is the breakdown of the uplands and the wetlands so that they can coordinate that information with their, uh, the appraisers. So that is all being taken into account. And I leave, I leave the negotiations up to the experts. Well, I appreciate everything everyone does. And I, I just, like I said, this today felt like a really great day to, to, to reflect you. on the work. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And Commissioner, every now and then, believe it or not, we do have landowners uh, who yeah. voluntarily do participate in these types of programs. We wish yeah. we had more. Uh, we're going to move to Commissioner Uribe at this time. Beth, first of all, I want to say thank you for you and the team and our MAP uh, experts on everything you guys do. Um, I do have a question, <clears throat> which it's great to get this updated information, specifically on District 1 and District 5, <clears throat> which have still a lot of underbuilt areas but i want to bring up as we're talking about acquisition and the quality of of these lands district three is very built in clearly you know we're the most dense and what i'm starting to see and uh just recently we had this issue with jeff charles about some of our lands that we have which are pocket pieces actually are getting very dirty and contaminated and there really isn't a plan in the county to to try to help. And, and so what I'm seeing also is as I continue to go in little caveats of the district is we'll have a piece of wetland in the middle of 360 development. So now we worry about the quality of that wetland. And then when we're seeing issues of trash and debris, we don't really have a plan to upkeep these areas. We designate them, they're non-buildable, builders go and build all around it. And I would love to see some sort of progress. I would volunteer on how we can try to, it's, they're already very, the quality of that wetland is not very good. It's something we've learned because of EPD when we've been on our tour is not good, but it's only making it worse when we've now created a trash field in that wet field and that wetland because no one really, no developer around it ever really cares to upkeep it at that point. It's almost like, well, we can't build on it we gave them what they wanted, move on. <clears throat> and we're starting to see this grow and grow. And now, with homelessness, we're seeing people camping in these areas tremendously. And because we're not always monitored, this is a growing area. And it, it's quite dangerous too, because there's usually snakes and all those kind of things in there. And so I'm curious to see if we're, we and the board are gonna look at a way to Maybe, I mean, I'm sure there are people who would be willing to help keep these areas, um, you know, upkeep them after. And that's what worries, because we're such an old county and it's only going to continue as this afternoon we look at 19 cases on development going forward. Well, I think 
a lot of what you're talking about are these HOA conservation areas, but I, I see an opportunity like you do that perhaps um, not not the Green Place program, but um, you know, we we do have a volunteer program, but we could also partner with our neighborhood yeah, services. And, and it's folks. not always. I'm actually finding it more and more in business areas. Okay. There's one in particular off of Orange Blossom Trail where it is a, a wetland, and then, you know, it's there. Um, I have a case that we were able to designate a conservation area, which they have literally not touched it. They removed the homeless people who were in the area, but they didn't even clean it, you know. So we're, we're seeing, we're continuing to see this. I'd love to see it. And then as a follow-up, I, I love all the work we're doing and, and what we do to support it, but as a follow-up, do we look at a minimal acreage before we invest it or, and, and that kind of feeds off of what I'm saying. When you look at small plots in the middle of, you know, I think it's great that we're acquiring and trying to do this, but what's the plan going forward? It's like you buy a house, there's going to be upkeep on that house. You know, um, have we considered that and is this a conversation taking place internally? So once we purchase them, they, they became, we, we become the managing entity, so we have a lot of different contracts in place to help us maintain our Green Place programs as, as well as um, uh, our, our team. Um, I, I see twofold what you're saying. I think maybe perhaps uh, working with uh, other individuals throughout the county, developing an edu educational um, material for these HOAs and businesses that own these conservation areas. But, you know, we do, um, we take great pride in how we maintain our Green Place um, properties uh, because once we open them up to the public for nature-based recreation, we want to ensure that everybody has a great experience. We, we don't want to um, have people not enjoy themselves out there because we want them to experience and love the properties like we experience and, and, and value them and appreciate them. So, and people, you know, people don't protect what they don't know or love. So that's, you know, one of our guiding principles. So you've given me a lot of food for thought. Right. And you said there was no minimal on acquisition or you shook your head, but we never answered. No, it, we evaluate. It, it doesn't matter we will, if it's a half an acre, we will evaluate it. I'm not saying it would rank very high and that we would probably move it to the, to the, through the acquisition process unless it's like that half acre that will fill in the gap between a thousand acres. And, you know, that's, okay. that's, you know, the infill properties. But no, we, if somebody submitted something to us and it was a half an acre, we would take it through the evaluation process. Thank you for all your hard work and continued oh, hard work. I we love what I do. You. Appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Commissioner Gomez Cadero, and then Commissioner Bonilla, and then Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Beth, for you. always being there for me. Thank you oh. for this presentation and for District 4. I know we have been going out to tours yes. like every month almost, but thank you so much. Um, and I have some questions that sure. I think you already answered them, but it was, one was what ideas do we have for the residents to enjoy these green places? Um, and I know you said, you know, um, based in recreation and so, but what exactly, you know, we, we planning to, to still conserve them, you know? Sure. And, if so we're going to have public coming in. We, we kind of, you know, we have our great parks and recreation parcels, and they're for the active uses, but what we like to see occur on our Green Place properties are very um, passive in nature or nature-based. So that's um, creating trails that aren't paved okay. so people can walk through the woods, kind of try to get away from the hiking term, terminology mm -hmm. because then people think, oh, I got to buy this and I got to buy that. And they, they just get overwhelmed. But if you preface it, that they can go out and take a little walk in nature and hear the birds singing and the butterflies fluttering through the flowers and all the scents that you can um, get experience okay. through. We also um, provide a lot of um, equestrian trails um, 
in District 2, we have our Lake Lucy Conservation Area that we, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the equestrian people like to go ride their horses. Ours are smaller experiences, you know, some other groups like the long 50 mile rides, but we provide, if you just have an hour or two and you just want to go out and ride your horse, perfect places to go to a green place. Um, you know, we're trying to highlight the special unique features that of um, some of our Green Place properties. We have a project in planning for District 4 at our Crosby Island Marsh Preserve. We want to put out an observation pier into the actual Crosby Marsh so that people can experience that. And because mm -hmm. it's not a habitat that people normally can experience. So very passive. Um, so but we're be, always open for ideas. Okay, so it would be something like split oak that, you know, you can... Yes, ma'am. Okay. Exactly. On your bike, you can yeah. use, you know, yeah. dogs, animals, can I go in on less terror service animals? And, okay. uh, we, we, we d at first, we didn't allow dogs, but we recognize that people love their dogs, and as long as they keep them on the leash, because it's for their own protection, the animal's protection, because, you know... Okay. These properties are home to some things that can hurt us. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, Commissioner Bonilla, then Commissioner Moore, then Commissioner Scott. Yeah. So I just wanted to um, start off by saying, like, I remember when this first came up um, a couple of years ago, and there was going to be an amendment, and I had some concerns, and... And I went through it, and you all were so open and caring and respectful. And um, it was just amazing working with you all. And, you know, just your, your reaction and the way you just participated with me was just really good. And I wanted to thank you all because, like, you're just amazing. Oh, thank <laughs> it's just you. So, so great to work with. And, you know, you took those concerns and, you know, I want to thank the board, too, because from those concerns, you know, we realized, well, we have this, but we don't have any funding. <laughs> and then the mayor brought up, you know, well, let's give $100 million, which was amazing and great. Thank you, Mayor. Um, because we wouldn't be able to do all these purchases or even work with this without the funding. So, you know, I just... You know, thank you so much for taking those concerns and making it into something like so much bigger and better that than I even had imagined when I addressed, you know, we're explaining those concerns. So, and, you know, also thank you so much for those, um, the recommendations that I've sent you. I, so I was driving down Lake Pick and just saw this for sale sign there by the river. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be a perfect park there, like by the river, people could take their canoes, and there's different connections to that river too, yes. um, north and south of that, that so it'd be a great way to um, ride your canoe, your kayaks, and get on and off. Um, and I think I brought it up to Matt Sudemeyer first, and then he brought you in, and it was just like, yeah, it was great. And just, I was approached by another landowner, so we are approached by people who want to sell. And so I think um, his was another one that was purchased, and I directed him to, to the program. And so, you know, one of the things that um, one of my, the things I brought up in the beginning was that it was an administrative regulation, so not too many people could find out about it. So I wanted something more um, public. So I think the advisory board that was implemented helps with that, yeah, and definitely. Um, I think more advertising, whatever we could do to just get the word out to these develop, you know, or not landowners who are willing to, you know, sell would be great. Yeah. Yes, we're really looking forward to engaging with our Green Place Advisory Board and helping us with our public engagement strategy. And just so you know that we are um, working with our capital projects to do a feasibility study on the Bagshaw Hampton parcel to see um, how we can put a trailhead in there as well as perhaps put a kayak, kayak canoe launch there because that is the amenity for that um, parcel because the river's right there. So we yeah. did, Thank we're you. working on it. It, it doesn't take, uh, it takes a while. Yeah, everything takes a while at the county. Yeah. Oh, at any government, yeah. <laughs> that's understandable. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you appreciate right. it. Commissioner Moore. Yes, th thank you, Beth. Yes, our <laughs> ideas come quickly, but trying to get everything done is another story. But except in this case, it seemed like yesterday we, we voted for that $100 million plan, and here you are. Yeah. And I think it was a, a, an excellent uh, annual report. Thank you. Uh, very you know, simple, easy to read for, for the public. So I really congratulate uh, all of you on your efforts. And, and I have to, to piggyback on uh, Commissioner Uribe because uh, I was talking to them before the meeting about some of my concerns in uh, the Wakaiva area that um, we have all these HOAs with uh, being left, which is great, 35% passive land, and they don't have the knowledge, understanding of how to manage these passive lands. And so I looked at my calendar. I'd like you to, to be the main speaker at my neighborhood leaders meeting April 20th, and uh, we could start, if that's enough time, to start educating them on what to do and not to do with all their passive lands that they have because that's what we have to do. We, when a new neighborhood comes in, we say 35% is left passive. It's under the control of an HOA that may not have the, most of the time they don't, the knowledge and understanding to manage significantly. So I'm breaking my cardinal rule. I know they probably have this. When we post something on uh, social media that we finally got something done and then people come in with 30 more things they want you to do. <laughs> We never really care for that, and look what I'm doing to you. <laughs> I'm giving you something else to do. But um, it's only because you're all doing such a great job. So I hope you'll work with me on educating these HOAs. I appreciate it. And, uh, just keep the ideas coming. We can't think of everything. Commissioner Scott. I just had a quick question. Um, so with this purchase, um, does this also include any municipalities? Like, would you identify any lines located in any municipalities, or it's only unincorporated Orange County? We have purchased um, properties within different mus municipalities. Okay. So it wouldn't preclude it. Okay. And it could be a partnership opportunity there with the municipality as well. I like partnerships, because maybe yeah. then they'll incur some of the financial burden. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, this concludes the presentation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jackson, for the, for the uh, wonderful update. We're going to move forward now pleasure, on our agenda. Uh, we have a couple of items uh, left for this morning's discussion agenda, and um, they may be fairly lengthy. Uh, the, the next one, I'm going to ask Mr. Brian Sanders, the Assistant Manager for Transportation and Planning, to come forward. He's going to present. Uh, the Metro Plan Orlando Board meeting uh, briefing, and on this item, uh, no action is requested. And he'll be followed then by Ms. Donna Weish, the manager of our Mental Health and Homeless Issues Division, and she'll be uh, giving us an update in that regard. And so with that, Mr. Sanders, you're recognized at this time. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Comptroller Diamond. Uh, here to present a briefing uh, for tomorrow's MPO uh, board meeting. Uh, Go. The uh, first thing that will be uh, requested for approval is the consent items, which include the minutes from the February 8th board meeting, approval of the January financial reports, certification of transportation disadvantaged local coordinating board membership, that's a mouthful, as well as the approval and appointment of new community advisory committee members. This first bullet should say approval of the January 2023 financial reports where uh, no budget amendments were necessary. Uh, the next item is the certification of the transportation disadvantaged local coordinating board membership where the MPO board as the designated official of, uh, planning agency for the coordination of transportation disadvantaged services is responsible for certifying that the uh, transportation disadvantage uh, membership is in compliance with Florida Administrative Code. The next item is approval and appointment of new Community Advisory Committee members and uh, these five uh, nomination applicants were selected from a pool of 42 qualified uh, members. Um, 
Also, as part of the selection process, uh, the CAC uh, allows non-voting members that are in good standing uh, the opportunity uh, to become a voting member. And two of the uh, alternates uh, did come forward uh, requesting that change, and that's going to be recommended as well, and, and those uh, two are listed there. Also, other action items include the FDOT amendment to the 2022-23 to 26-27 TIP, which is a roll call vote. Uh, this is adding additional funding to the uh, Fortune Road, Simpson Road intersection in Osceola County, and this amendment was due to the increased construction costs that we've all been experienced, experiencing. Uh, and finally, the approval and acceptance of FDOT annual certification report. Uh, the annual certification ensures that Metro Plan is following the federal processes and that they are in compliance. Uh, it also includes a, a, an evaluation of financial and business practices. Uh, Metroplan was given a very high rating, 100%, which is a very low risk and the best possible score. And FDOT identified no corrective actions during this cycle. That's real good news for Metroplan and our board members that sit on there. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer. All right. Uh, we do have a quick question to our region. So this is a huge thing for us. Now we got to get that to happen on the TDLCB. That's the short version of what you said, because we're making decisions, all of us here, and this is, this is a good day for us. But thank you, thanks for your due diligence. Okay, uh, if there are no further uh, comments or questions on this matter, uh, we're going to move uh, to the next item, and uh, this is um, the presentation by it's Donna Weish. Ah, there she is. Um, again, the manager of our mental health and homeless uh, issues division. Uh, she'll be providing an update on homelessness uh, within our community. Uh, she'll be joined uh, by Ms. Martha R. from our Homeless Services Network. The two of them will be working in tandem. This is a significant issue for uh, not just our community, but all communities, um, especially metropolitan communities in America and, and certainly uh, here within the state of Florida. But uh, the good news is that we have been proactive in uh, addressing these issues. Uh, I remind you that uh, better than a year or so ago, uh, we uh, delved into this issue um, <coughs> uh, with uh, uh, report that was commissioned through the Heart of Florida United Way, and uh, they made some recommendations. Our board took action in the current fiscal year. Uh, we have allocated additional dollars to address this. Ms. Uh, Weish is going to get into to all of that. Still much work to be done. We have been fortunate to have been uh, beneficiaries of uh, significant amounts of federal dollars uh, in the recent um, a couple of years uh, to address homelessness in our community and um, that is because of the great work that our Homeless Services Network has been doing uh, led by Ms. Martha R. Uh, she'll talk about uh, some of the investments uh, that uh, corporate America has uh, been making in this regard as well as uh, the public sector and other uh, local nonprofits who are working with this. Uh, so. Um, Things um, have somewhat deteriorated, but they're not as bad as they could be. Uh, they're not as bad as what I see in some other metropolitan communities around America. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, last month, and uh, in the nation's capital, uh, you know, I saw significant amounts of uh, tent cities and other things there within that community that uh, thankfully we uh, don't have the magnitude of what I see there in that community and we want to keep it that way. We want to be proactive. We want to lean into uh, trying to deal with uh, the mental health related issues that many of our homeless uh, experience uh, because that we, through treatment, uh, get them to be, become more self-reliant in a self-indulgent world. Uh, 
then we can keep them housed, uh, keep them off of our streets, and, and then uh, we have a housing for all uh, task force recommendations and a trust fund that we have established here to kind of, again, lean into creating affordable and attainable housing within our community. And um, I can tell you that uh, of the over 3,000 counties that exist in the United States of America, there are very few of them have a locally controlled housing trust fund like what we do here. Uh, there are few that have the type of proactive initiatives that we have here in dealing with the homelessness. So uh, while um, you know, we can certainly improve there are other opportunities there, I do want to uh, say that uh, to the collective of our community partners, uh, we, we are all um, very aware of the challenges before us. And so that, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Weish and uh, ask you to kind of delve into this presentation. Thank you. Well, well I, I thank you, Mayor, and I was going to say, we're good here. I mean, you always do such a great job um, talking about these social issues. I'm always amazed by that. Um, I don't know if it's serendipitous or if it's irony, but 26 years ago today, I started my career with Orange County. Well, congratulations. <laughs> and here I am. You know, uh, the Chapin administration bought, brought me, and Byron, you'll remember, Jean Bennett brought me here to do homelessness. And here we are 26 years later, much better off than 26 years ago, but still, uh, to your point, Mayor, with much work to do. So thanks for the opportunity, Mayor. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners and Comptroller Diamond. It's, it's a pleasure always to be in front of you and talk about these very difficult, um, but also very important issues. So today, Mayor, you set it up really nicely. We're going to do a primer on homelessness. Uh, I'm gonna do Homelessness 101 and um, kind of just set the tone for getting deeper and deeper into what we do with our federal dollars, our state dollars, the strings that are attached to those. Uh, Martha will go into in depth. I'll talk more, you know, just specific to Orange County, our statistics, some of our gaps that you have had many, many conversations about and um, how we align our funding to try to get the best results. Uh, we're fortunate that we don't have the strings attached like um, the, the lead agency does because our general revenue will allow us to be much more flexible, much more innovative, and do things that the federal government, quite frankly, might not pay for. So we'll, we'll talk about how our homeless uh, system is set up and why it's set up that way, and we as a region, how we decided to set that up. Um, and then, you know, Martha will talk about some, some things that are going on in her world uh, in, with the feds, and we'll talk and finish with some next steps. So defining homelessness, there's um, lots of categories uh, of homelessness. Those literally homeless, which we sometimes call chronically homeless, that are on the streets, that don't have a nighttime residence, that are often in our shelters and our camps. This is no secret to any of you sitting on this dais who those folks are. Those folks who are in imminent risk of homelessness, living on the edge. Um, we know we have a lot of people that are paying a lot of money, you know, just to survive and barely making it. Um, we've always been told you should never pay more than 30% of your income on your rent or your mortgage. There's lots of people paying a lot more than that. Um, category three, uh, federal statutes kind of talk about the unaccompanied youth, that group between uh, 25 years and younger, emancipated from their parents maybe early, or just choosing to leave home. We see a lot of LGBTQ um, youth in this age group, and then, of course, families with children. And the category, the last category in this um, piece right here is just talking about those who are fleeing uh, domestic violence, gender partner violence, and human trafficking. When we get into the McKinsey Vento uh, definition, that is really talking about our school children. And um, any school system across this country is required to count every so often how many school children they have that are homeless. And anything from living in hotels, living doubled up, inadequate housing, like living in rental sheds or cars, and we know it runs the gamut. But that's a very important 
um, statistic that OCPS keeps a close eye on. When we talk about homelessness, it is such a complex issue. I don't know of any social issue that I have worked on in my career that's more difficult than this one because it encompasses everything. Racial disparities, it encompasses mental illness, substance abuse, other disabilities, autism. Um, we have so many things to work on when you look at this issue. Uh, our housing supply, I don't, again, don't need to tell you, you've had multiple conversations on this dais about the, the housing and the need for housing, but these are people that need a different kind of housing and need a diversity of housing. We have people that can't live on the street, um, and we can go all the way back to 60s and 70s and talk about deinstitutionalization. I, I'm old enough to remember that, and um, which has led to an uptick in homelessness in our country, but not having the safety nets, not having robust community mental health that take care of our people. And this is one of the results of that. So many, many issues to balance while you're trying to end homelessness. You look at the st statistics across the states. Um, in 2017, Florida started seeing a decrease in homelessness, while California and New York were both on the rise. Well, I think what we're going to see is a change um, this year for sure. Uh, I think you'll see an uptick in homelessness in Florida. Uh, I know that we're seeing upticks in other parts of the country. But when you compare us with um, counties like us, Hillsborough is almost exactly the, the number of people in, in their county and their point in time count is almost identical to ours. So you can see Miami-Dade, 27 uh, million, I mean 2.7 million people and they get tons of money into their community with the food and beverage tax along with over 20, I think $24 million in HUD money. So they are doing what they can do and still falling short. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the point in time count because Martha's really going to dig into that. But that is the one day in January that we count every homeless individual we can find in camps, in woods, in shelters. We don't count homeless people that are in jail. We don't count homeless people that are in mental health institutions uh, like our, our um, crisis stabilization unit. But we do um, count folks um, in, in camps and in, in the whole Orange County area in the city of Orlando. Our, our count's about 1,500. We, we expect to see an uptick. We don't have the tw 2023 stats yet, but it was done. And you can see we had a dip, obviously, during the pandemic, but we're still ranging around that 1,500. And in the region, you know, we have three counties and three cities. Mar Martha will talk about COC 507. Um, I will tell you that um, about 70, 75% of the homeless are in Orange County for the region. These are our homeless families and our homeless kids in OCPS. We probably will see closer to 6,000 by um, time school ends this year, but that's the latest data. And you can see how people are reporting where, where they're living and over 67, almost 70% of those people are living doubled up. The national model for homelessness and housing is called Housing First. This is built on the, the preface that if you have people who are chronically homeless who have disabilities, how will they ever navigate a system if it's based on having to be clean and sober, based on being free of medical issues, being free of mental health symptomology, not taking psychiatric medications. There are all sorts of fail points for, how, for if someone has to climb a ladder to reach housing. They're never going to make it. Most of them will never make it. 80% of them of the of chronically homeless will never make it because they will fail over and over. So the model that was you know, guided from Sam Sambaris in New York, once he started this model, plucking people off the street that were chronically homeless with serious disabilities, putting them in housing, but not just housing, 
It's that relationship and that supportive environment from a clinician or a case manager or an outreach worker that stays in contact, checks on them. That's what makes all the difference in Housing First. So we have adapted that model here. We use our coordinated entry system to help us guide through that. We want people to be able to get housing as soon as possible to get off the street. Otherwise, people could likely die on the street. Now, I am never one to say one size fits all. I believe in a very diverse structure, and I believe that certain people in this community are doing amazing things and not following this model. Right? I believe that. Um, whatever works. If you can get someone housed and if you can get them clean and sober and, and on their medication, well, God bless you because I think that's wonderful. So I'm never going to say don't do that, just do this. But I will say that's the model we've accepted. That's the model we agree to in this region. <clears throat> and that's the model we support in, in our funding. Housing First keeps people um, less acute. We know that the minute that someone is housed, and if you understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you understand that security and safety and housing and supports in that model is what makes people well. And so we know that the minute you put people in housing, the acuity of their mental health issues, their addiction, all of that gets a little bit better. Now, they may not always be clean and sober, probably not, they may not always take their psychotropic medication and they may, you know, go to jail every once in a while, but that's the nature of the beast. But housing is what makes them better. And if Sam Sambaris said when he first started doing this, that plucking people off the street of New York and putting them in housing that five years later, 85% later, were still in housing, that's a pretty good outcome. There are way many opportunities to get touches in the coordinated entry system. The coordinated entry system is really built around trying to get the most vulnerable in the system as quickly as possible. I get many calls every day and I know you all do too. A lot of people that call us will, will you know, be able to, to get through this thing. They panic, they get in crisis, and they immediately call you. I get that. I don't, I probably do the same thing. But we are really fortunate to have so many providers and so many touch points. But I will tell you, when you have scarce resources, you have to try to figure out who's going to get those resources. And we decided as a community, we were going to base that on vulnerability. People who have the most vulnerability need to be housed first. That was our motto. That's what we believed. And we know that if we don't do something, we're going to lose those folks. So we try to do everything we can at all those touch points to enter people in a system, to get them document ready, to navigate them to the right resource the first time. We, that's our purpose. That's our goal. So that's what coordinated entry is about. Martha will talk a lot more about that in depth. This is a system I believe in. And we have put our money where our mouth is so much that it's created this system for us and our funding system. And it matches and leverages the federal money and the state money that comes in. We believe in our heart of hearts that prevention is the goal. May I talk about the same thing about mental illness. Prevention and early intervention is the goal. So we put a lot of effort and a lot of general revenue, and we had an ARPA agenda item today, put another million into homeless prevention and early intervention, keeping people where they are. Because if we don't keep people where they are, they're coming into homelessness, and that costs more. Homelessness, someone on the street for a long time, costs us about $40,000. If you house them, it costs less than 20. So there's the argument. Um, there was a study done out west, and it, if you've ever heard of it, called Million Dollar Murray. It was one community out west, either Nevada or Arizona, and there was one gentleman, through his homelessness, cost that city a million dollars. They calculated, calculated it, they did a study on it, and it was absolutely amazing. 
the work they did to get there. But problem solving conversations, keeping people in housing, getting them to stay. Sometimes it's even getting them back to where they came from. If they have supports and if they have people on the other side, we make sure of that. This has really been a great program for us. We're the first that started prevention and diversion because we felt it was necessary. Because when people get into homelessness, from the time people get to shelter till the time they get housed right now in rapid rehousing is about 167 days. I don't want families in shelter for 167 days. I don't want anybody in shelter very long. But that's capacity issue because you've got to have a system that flows. Emergency shelter is just that. That's all it should be used for. It shouldn't be used as a transitional housing program. Our, but we do invest in transitional housing when HUD does not. So we decided there were people that needed a little bit longer. And so we have transitional housing program and we work with Helene Bloom and Aspire over at um, Maxwell Terrace. And we get pretty good outcomes from these folks because our central receiving center feeds into this transitional housing program and they're people with substance abuse and mental health disorders. Our rapid rehousing program, we serve about, a, um, I don't know, about a 200 people a year in that. Uh, that is funneled through uh, HSN so we can align that and match that and leverage that with, with the HUD dollars and permanent supportive housing the same. We invest in permanent supportive housing. We believe that long-term housing is and supports, it makes a significant change and significant difference. Well, Mayor spoke to it, tent cities are going up everywhere. Um, this has somewhat to do with advocates who believe there should, there should be the ability for someone to have at least some shelter. Um, but you're gonna see it everywhere you go. If you travel at all to any large urban corridor, you're going to see tent cities. Um, the rise of homelessness in our country, it's, it's there, we're having it. New York City has already done their point in time count and from last year to uh, this year, there's been a 25,000 person increase. That's a lot for New York City. So our community issues, just like everybody else's community issues, tents, camps, panhandling, you're hearing about it, I'm hearing about it, and we're all aware, we see it every day. So there was a report came out in 2022 that only three metros in the entire country in 2021 had rent increases of 30% or higher. Unfortunately, they're all in Florida, Tampa, Miami, and Orlando. Two Orange County reports, both the GAPS analysis on behavioral health and the housing um, report all mentions over 30,000 affordable or attainment units is what we need in our county. Mitchell just had something on the agenda today, the home ARP allocation plan. And you know his reports through housing show that we need 1,100 more emergency transitional and permanent housing beds. These people, I mean 31,000, over 31,000 units for extremely low income and low income. Sometimes we use affordable housing thinking we're talking about housing just in general, but there's also the people that have no income, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about homelessness, especially chronic homelessness. You've, I think Mitchell's briefed to you all about the Home ARP plan. This is a, a great opportunity for us to, to throw more money into affordable units for, for the folks we're talking about here, for tenant-based rental assistance and for supportive services because you've got to have those supportive services. That is key. We were fortunate, and, and Mayor, we appreciate being on the list of Secretary Fudge's um, House America plan. Through that, we were able to accomplish working with 486 households and 331 of those through rapid rehousing and another 155 with new rental vouchers. So those are good outcomes for, for just a, a year and a couple of months. Our housing department is working hard for us and 
bringing on units. Some of those units are already done. Some of them are in process. But you can see that, that they have made way to, to really focus on low income and set asides for, for housing of the people that we're talking about. The, the extremely low income and those uh, 60 and 80% AMI, which is, which is huge. When we talk about our general revenue, we have about $5.9 million invested in homelessness. Um, as I said, we put a lot of emphasis on diversion and, and early intervention and case management. We, we fund some in the drop-in center. Those folks are seeing some up to 100 people a day now. When we started out, it was 30 or 40, and then it was 80, and now it's 100. Transitional housing, which we continue to invest in, and I, I will say as long as I'm here, we should continue to invest in transitional housing. We have an Aspire that does the mental health and substance abuse overlay at that facility. And bridge housing, it's really necessary to move people out of shelter as quickly as you can, especially families. Put them in bridge housing while they're awaiting housing. We'd like to do more of that. Rapid rehousing for families, um, we've got about 1.5 invested in that. We serve, uh, I said 200, it's 120. Um, but permanent supportive housing, we've got 40 units that stay about 99% filled. So that is a, a great opportunity for us with Grand Avenue. And there's supportive services that we continue um, to provide for people in permanent supportive housing. That's about $2 million we have invested there. But we didn't stop on general revenue. We've spent some ARPA money this year and are still working on some of these. But again, putting more money in prevention and diversion, that was on the consent agenda this morning. Our homeless outreach, we're not reaching people that are far out. I know Commissioner Wilson, we've talked about it. Commissioner Gomez Cordero, we've talked about all those people. in Apopka, you know, Commissioner Moore, we just talked about that. Um, we've got to get outreach teams to touch these people. It's a touch point that we're missing. Now there are people out in those areas that are trying to do great work and are doing great work, um, but we have more to do. Um, our mobile shower unit with Clean the World gets all over this county and tries to reach homeless people. They use HMIS when they're talking to people so we get people loaded in the system, which is super important. So these are our components. These are the things we work daily to do. Um, you know, we, I will tell you, we are performing as best we can in this perfect storm we have. You have low wage jobs, you have high rents, no access, very little access to extremely low income housing, and we've missed opportunities probably throughout this community. Uh, with you know, drilling down for more public um, housing support when it's available. So I'm going to turn it over. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Martha R., who's the CEO of the Homeless Services Network, which will do the last of the presentation. Thank you, Donna, and thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate y'all giving us the opportunity to talk about this. I mean, I know, I know this is an important issue to all of you, um, it's an important issue for our community and we appreciate the opportunity to discuss it some. So I want to start with just talking about what it means to be the lead agency for a community. So our community has the ability to apply for federal dollars through what they call the continuum of care, which is basically all the providers in the region or the continuum of care. But HUD only allows one agency to make the application on behalf of that region. And so HSN was identified as that agency. Um, and we've been playing that role for hmm, 20 years now, more than 20 years. In addition to just the federal application, HUD has a lot of other hoops for us to jump through. And so we're also responsible for coordinating the other activities that HUD requires. And that includes the point in time count, the homeless management information system, the coordinated entry system, all of those, um, all of those activities which help support our regional system. So a lot of what we do is to support the system that's providing the direct services. 
So we started because it's a HUD requirement, but what we know is that the HUD requirements work better if we overlay them and match them as much as possible with local priorities. So several years ago, the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness's Leadership Council was established to use the collective impact model to bring attention and try and draw in additional resources to this issue by engaging the uh, public sector, private sector, funders, and nonprofits and faith community. That council then established, uh, adopted, as Donna said, housing first as the model, as the paradigm that the community would move forward with. And we've been embracing that now for about seven or eight years. The work of the council and of the, and of the general uh, partners and uh, providers in the region is recognized by HUD as being important and being successful and being how they think communities move forward the best on this issue. So last year, our application from this area scored higher than more than the highest in the country with more than 400 other lead agencies applying. That's because of the work like what Donna's been talking about that Orange County does and other regional partners are engaged in. That score resulted in us bringing in a record $12 million in, in the continuum of care competitive funding, nationally competitive funding. Those dollars included new projects, including a new project for victims of domestic violence, as well as a new project for victims of human trafficking. So HSN is structured in a way to to maximize how much support we can provide to our community and to the providers in our community. So that means that we engage in things like, as you see here, we are the lead for the homeless management information system. We are the lead for the coordinated entry system that is required by HUD. And we also have a housing operations team that goes out and identifies landlords who are willing to provide housing and work within the system to provide housing to people that are being served by a, in, by a number of agencies um, and then keep those landlords engaged over time. And then the, that system of people also then provides the staffing and the support for the leadership council that we discussed just a minute ago. All right, Donna talked some about the point in time count. What you see here are the regional numbers. There's a drop there in 2021 because we did not do an unsheltered count. So we did not do the count of people out on the streets because that was in the height of COVID and across the country it was agreed that that would not be a safe thing to do. So, the, so that, you know, that number's a little skewed. But this is what you see for the entire region, that's Tri-County region. So one of the things to know about the point in time count is it's a snapshot, right? It's, it's what we count on one day. But we're not the best photographers. No one, no one who does these counts are. And so the picture's a little blurry. It's not 100% accurate. That's because, as Donna said, we can't count people who were in the hospital that night. We can't count people who were in the jail that night. It gets impacted by the weather. It gets impacted by how many volunteers we have and the capacity to go out and identify folks. And it can even be impacted by part of the operational rules are, if, if I approach someone who really appears to be homeless and talk to them and they say they're not, then I don't get to count them, even if everything suggests that they are, right? So it's not a perfect picture, but it's kind of equally blurry every year because we use the same methodology every year. So it's good for, identifying trends. It's good for seeing are things going up or are things going down? Are we maintaining or are we holding tight? So we have seen an increase and we anticipate seeing an increase for the next count, which was just done in late January and we'll have those results for you pretty soon. Just a little more detail here. You see how many people were in shelter and transitional housing versus how many were unsheltered outside and the proportion that are in Orange County and the proportion that are in the other two counties of our region. So one of the things I want you to know is that at the time this, this count was done, 
we were still very heavy with COVID dollars that were helping to pay for, uh, for uh, people in hotels, right? So that we could not uh, have the, for, have non-congregate options so that we didn't have so many people congregated together in the regular shelters. So we were able to add some bed capacity because of those COVID dollars. Those dollars are running out. So we're losing some in 23, others in 24. So the number of beds available for shelter are going to be decreasing most likely over the next couple of years. So you'll see those numbers go down. So the point in time count is, is helpful. It gives us some information, but it doesn't tell us the actual total breadth uh, numbers of people who experience homelessness over the course of a year. So we use the Homeless Management Information System, known as HMIS, to gather that data. We've got more than 400 people at various agencies across the region who are entering data into that system, and that provides us both the ability to track clients and know where people have received services and what's working for them and what's not, as well as to provide aggregate reports which can then inform policies and practices and procedures. One of the things uh, that we use HMIS for is to facilitate the coordinated entry process. So uh, Donna spoke to that a little bit, and I'll just say again, the Central Florida Commission on Homelessness and all of our partners have recognized that we do not have the resources that we wish we had to apply to this issue. We just don't. Um, nobody, nobody thinks we do. Everybody wishes we could do more than we have the capacity to do. So there were painful and strategic conversations about if we don't have the resources we need, then we need to be strategic in how we spend them. And that was part of the Housing First conversation, but it's more than that. The prioritization process says we are going to spend our limited dollars on the people who are least likely to be able to resolve their homelessness without us. We're gonna spend our resources on the folks who cannot get out of homelessness without our help. It's like an emergency room triage, right? So there's some people who come into the emergency room that have to go in for the serious care and others who can be referred out or can go and are able to get their issue taken care of more easily. Coordinated entry and the prioritization is who's most vulnerable, who's most likely to die on the streets, who's going to stay on the streets without our help, who's going to stay in the system longest without our help. And that's who we target our limited resources to. To make that happen, um, folks have to be known to the system. Oh, I'm sorry. Here you see some of the prioritization factors that we use. Uh, the critical needs, how often is somebody uh, in, in various facilities, whether it's jails, psychiatric, hospitals, et cetera, as well as how long uh, have they been on the streets? How long have they been homeless? People who've been homeless a very, very long time have demonstrated that they're having a harder time getting out of homelessness without our help. That's one of the, that's one of the criteria that we use. But to get into that prioritization queue, it's important that we know who people are. We know who, the, who, who is experiencing homelessness in our community. We uh, strive for a no wrong door approach. You see here various options that people have for getting into the system. They, this allows people who, there's an option here for some with, somebody with mobility impairment, somebody who is limited to the bus line, somebody who can't use a bus line somebody for whom English is a second language. There's several options here, and we are um, always trying to increase the number of access points so that we can ensure that people have the ability to be known and then to be determined what they're eligible for and how they're prioritized for that opportunity. So, how do, the community is dependent, obviously, on a variety of funding sources. These are the, some of the ones, not all of these are, are we associated with, but part of our job is to ensure that we're drawing down as many of the dollars as we can, especially the competitive dollars. 
So last year, as I said, our award was for $12 million. And you see there what, what the continuum of care, that HUD continuum of care, competitive dollars, what they can be used for. And one of the things that you'll notice right there is you cannot use them for shelter. It's just, it's not, you just, it's not eligible. It's not allowed. It, they, you, they allow it to be used for other things. It's very limited for transitional housing, pretty much only existing transitional housing, not any new. Very limited for street outreach. So those dollars really focus more towards the permanent housing side of the equation. And that's that large competitive pot. Then there's a formula grant, the emergency solutions grant. The region sees some of that given directly to the counties, some give it directly to some of the cities, and then we also get some from the state. It's not as big a pot, right? It has some different uses. That's the pot that you can use for street outreach. That's the pot that you can use for shelter, but you can't use all of it for that. They still got rules. You can only use some of it for that. Um, and that's one of the pots where it could be used for a lot of different things, but the pot's not necessarily big enough to be able to use, to be used for all of those things well, to fund fully. So that's another part of the balancing act, is you've got resources that can be used for things, but if it's not enough to do it effectively, then they may not, it may be that jurisdictions choose not to use them in that way. The VA provides, uh, we also get competitively three and a half million dollars for veteran services for veterans and their families, and you see how those dollars can be used. And then our housing authorities in the region receive VASH vouchers, which are permanent vouchers, much like the Section 8 vouchers for veterans. Out of that pot, we are currently housing, and with the, well, and with the uh, resources on the next slide as well, we managed to, we, the system has housed more than 3,000 people, more than 3,400 people just in the last 12 months, and we have more than 1,600 people who are in permanent supportive housing. What you see on this next slide are some of the state dollars, not as, uh, not as much of state funding. And then the city of Orlando also puts some dollars into the pot. And then Orange County, as Donna said, Orange County is investing pretty much in every opportunity and does a great job of leveraging and filling gaps and trying to maximize our ability to pull down the maximum number of dollars that we can. That's super important. Those, those competitive dollars have a we get four dollars from them for every one that we can pull in locally. That's a good, that's a good ratio, a four to one investment there. In December, the federal government, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness published their, their new strategic plan called All In. They have a pretty ambitious goal of reducing homelessness by 25% in the next three years. It's our job to make sure we understand the plan and see where we can align local efforts with the federal plan and again to try and maximize how many of those federal dollars we can, we can draw down. You see here the key goals of the plan and when you read those, when you look at that, part of what you're seeing is the federal government understands the complexity that Donna was talking about earlier. This is a hugely complex issue. It's housing, it's mental health, it's criminal justice, it's everything. Everything contributes to this and is aligned in here. So they are identifying what resources they have in various departments that can be used to help speak to and end homelessness for people who are experiencing homelessness. And they identify those resources, even if the pot's not as big as we need it to be to do what needs to be done, but they, they are um, aligning variety of uh, assistance from multiple federal departments through that plan. So a federal plan makes sense because this is a national crisis. This is happening everywhere. So we've, these are just a couple of kind of almost random statistics, but what you can see here is that homelessness is a big issue in rural Oregon and obviously a big issue in very urban Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's worse in, in the warmer client. Um, Anchorage, Alaska ain't that warm, and they're struggling with it too. Mm -hmm. uh, in Detroit, and you know, northern communities, certainly tourist communities like we have, have our own 
uh, struggles with this, but this is happening everywhere. And it's, this is, interestingly, we've got newer research that's coming out that is, this is not going to be a surprise for you guys, but they're saying that the increased numbers are almost exclusively tied to the housing market in the community, particularly the number of very low income units that are available and what the median rent is. And that is the most common predictor. That is the predictor of the percentage of people in your community who will experience homelessness. Who those people are is influenced by what are the other services that are available. And so when you, when, as those numbers increase, as rents go up and the numbers increase, you will see that people with disabilities and very large families are, uh, and veterans are, are more vulnerable to being those people who will then experience homelessness. The, um, the General Accounting Office also put out a report saying, it kind of backs it up in the same way. It says that when your median rent goes up $100, you will see a 9% increase in homelessness. So you will all know how much the rents have gone up in the last couple of years. And so some of what we're seeing is uh, very predictable given our economy and given the housing market. And that's the, that's the common factor. So in many ways, um, there's an interesting newsletter that comes out on homelessness and one of the things that they said very much fits our community, which is that the, the homeless service agencies, the partner agencies around the community, are doing extremely good work in getting people into housing and helping them remain housed. We're, we're doing a great offense job. We're losing on defense because we can't keep people in housing because the housing market is so challenged. And what we're looking at now are more people who are homeless, and many of those people were in housing a year ago, two years ago. But they're not now, and it's not because the people changed, it's because the housing market changed. And that's why they're not in housing. Fortunately, we do have some opportunities coming down the pipeline for us. Um, you've already heard some about the ARPA dollars that are going to be available. We know that they're, uh, mm -hmm. Durham Place, those units are, are exclusively for the homeless population. You've done a wonderful job with your Tenants' Bill of Rights ordinance. That's so important because we've learned that keeping people in their housing will reduce the numbers of people experiencing homelessness. As mentioned before, we have a new, we've been newly awarded $8.4 million for two years to target unaccompanied youth, including parenting youth, who are 18 to 24 years old. That's an unprecedented opportunity for our community. And it's not only beneficial for those youth who are homeless right now, but it's also for those of us who, who've invested in and care about the chronic homeless population. Many of those people who experience chronic homelessness now began their homelessness when they were youth. And so it's not only about helping the youth, but it's also about preventing future chronic homelessness. Uh, the region, we, uh, back in 2019, the region was awarded the largest day one Bezos uh, fund uh, that they made that year. And those are dollars to be used exclusively for families with children. We got about 18 months left on that award. But not only did HSM receive that award, but the next year the coalition received an award and Ability Housing has also received an award in this area. So that's another national player who is seeing good work going on in this county and is investing in those dollars, in this region. And then finally, um, we are working, uh, identifying technical assistance to help us develop a plan on unsheltered homelessness, uh, a regional plan on unsheltered homelessness. So we're pulling, it, we've uh, got out an RFA to identify some state or national technical assistance provider to help us uh, create a plan <clears throat> for how we can move forward most strategically as possible while lever again aligning with the federal plan to bring in those resources. And now, Donna, it's back to you. So I'll finish up um, with just a few next steps. We really are a region of strong uh, communities 
that really need to continue to collaborate. And most of those folks are represented on the commission board and continuing to work with them is, is super important. Uh, we need to encourage full use of HMIS data. I know in every contract we provide in general revenue, it's a requirement. We want to continue to, to make sure people are getting in HMIS because that is the coordinated entry system. That's how you get in and get housed and get serviced. So we want to continue and we track data that way and that's what HUD requires us to do. Um, we have to continue to, to look at other opportunities to, to track people in our jail through our CRC and our mental health providers, our hospitals to make sure we're tracking where folks are in the system and what services they're getting throughout the community. Supporting policies that discourage payment source um, discrimination, making sure that when there's a Section 8 voucher, the landlords take a Section 8 voucher. When we have a HUD voucher, that they'll take a HUD voucher. It's very, very important. Uh, ensuring that our, our housing uh, crisis efforts are targeted like we're doing and continue uh, every opportunity for diversity in housing and use predictive models to, pri pri to, to prioritize and also to know who's coming into the system and how they will. And ma maximizing our public housing vouchers when we have those opportunities. Um, and with that, Mayor, we are finished here with the presentation and Martha and I are happy to take any uh, questions that you might have. Donna, before we go to the questions, can you talk about uh, the presentation that will be done to the Board of County Commission on, I believe it's scheduled uh, for June, June 6th. 6th. Yes. yes, June 6th. Yes, Mayor, we will be coming back to the Board to give you an update on the behavioral mental health gaps analysis work that we did and that you approved us to move forward on in uh, February last year, 22. February 22nd, 22, um, I think was the date. And we're making some progress in getting some of those short-term recommendations done. A long way to go. Have an implementation team that's been chosen to serve. Got some great people that will work with us on those mid and long-term goals. So we'll be giving you an update um, in June on that and things to come. Excited about that. Um, I, w I wanted you to talk briefly about that, primarily because I see um, part of um, the solution, if you will, to reducing homelessness in our com community is making certain that we have a mental health, a substance abuse, or behavioral health disorder treatment component, uh, because I don't have to tell you all, when you walk through uh, downtown Orlando or other areas of our community, uh, you see homeless individuals. And uh, it doesn't take a licensed mental health clinician to recognize that many of them are mentally ill, substance abusers, etc. They have co-occurring issues. And in order to adequately deal with that, uh, uh, if we provide treatment, uh, it really results um, in a cost uh, avoidance um, right. result for our county uh, if, we, if we lead with treatment. Uh, I know that uh, on any given day, uh, Chief Quinones uh, from the Orange County Corrections says that about 40% of the jail population is a diagnosed with some form of mental illness. And over time, uh, we as a county have adopted a public policy where we have not, I'm going to use the term, criminalized homelessness uh, or mental illness as a county. And by uh, having an investment in things like the Central Receiving Center and doing these other things, we have been able to, over time, reduce our jail population. Uh, there was a University of Central Florida study that was done now probably uh, nearly two decades ago that had given a projection that if we did nothing, uh, we would have to continue expanding our jail and spending hundreds of millions of dollars 
uh, to house individuals. And uh, I do see uh, uh, Major Torres uh, there in the back from the Orange County Sheriff's Office. And uh, I can tell you for, from working in this space for a long time that uh, it wasn't a soft on crime uh, strategy. It really was a tough on crime strategy that resulted in rather than realizing the uh, likely more than uh, 5,000 persons who would have been incarcerated in our jail today or more, uh, today we have approximately 2,500 people in our jail. And if you just took and extrapolated that number, if the average daily per diem to house a person in our jail was $100 a day times 2500 that $2,500 savings, that would be $250,000 a day that Orange County has afforded spending to simply warehouse people. And if you multiply that $250,000 a day times 365 days, it's a staggering number. But yet, we have led with investing and providing treatment uh, within our community. Not enough uh, because of the deficit of treatment dollars available in the state of Florida. Uh, our county has been one of the leaders in this regard and other uh, counties uh, from around the country come in and take a look at what we have done over time and uh, Donna manages the, uh, the budget uh, <coughs> associated with uh, mental health services as well here as a county. So I see the two uh, issues being interrelated, uh, and so I want the board to understand that we'll come back and uh, give you an update exactly where we are because we're working with some community partners uh, to help fill the gap. You all remember that uh, we received a, a gap analysis report that said that we had a $49 million annual deficit of uh, services available. And uh, we have talked with our hospital partners. I do see representatives from Advent Health that's in the audience. Uh, we have talked with Advent Orlando Health and others about partnering with us to help fill that gap. I remind our board that uh, this current fiscal year, our board uh, allocated an additional $10 million to fill the $49 million gap. Uh, so. What I'm saying to you is we have a very comprehensive approach to dealing with homelessness as a community. That's not perfect, but every day someone asks me about what are we doing as a county to deal with the perception and in some cases the reality that we have increased homelessness within our community. Well, we're doing a lot. Um, but we still have it because of the enormity of the problem that we have. Uh, we do have to be intentional about working with the Homeless Services Network and the other community partners to try to come up with these long-term strategies. And um, so I do applaud uh, Martha R. You know, she was one of the nominees for uh, yes, Citizen of the Year uh, here in Orange County because of the work that she's doing in, in this respective space. Um, but we're going to lean on our faith community to help us in this regard. Uh, we're going to lean on our corporate community to help us in this regard. Uh, we're going to use the federal or state funds and the local dollars, uh, you know, appropriately to to deal with this, and so I know that this is an issue, commissioners, that every one of you in your district you hear about uh, probably every day, several times a day, uh, from someone who sees um, the, the enormity of the problem. So many of our commissioners have expressed a desire to, um, to speak, and uh, we're going to call on them in the order, at least, I, I think, you know, they pressed the button. Uh, so we have Commissioner Wilson first, Commissioner Gomez Cordero, Commissioner Uribe, Commissioner Scott, Commissioner Moore, and then uh, Commissioner Bonilla. 
Uh, so with that, we'll start with Commissioner Wilson. Um, thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you, Donna and Martha, I, and everybody that was here for this. I see nonprofit partners in the room. I see the Sheriff's Department in the room. I see our hospitals in the room. And I think it really is because it takes all of us to approach this. Um, I had some thoughts about, you know, I mean, we've talked so many times about trying to figure out how to help people in their place, you know, all over the county. And we have this really robust and diverse ecological and, um, and I mean that like in the ecology of where these people are, right? The, um, some of the things that we've come across recently that I just don't even know how to approach. And I think part of it, when I listen to the HIMS, I know that we're constrained by the federal government's um, use of that and about the priorities that come within that framework. Um, is it, you know, if you look at the prioritization for who is getting the help first when we send people to this, it's almost like they have to hit rock bottom. And so to have a conversation with anybody in our community that's struggling to hold even a part-time job, or they're like, well, I haven't been arrested yet, but I gotta, I gotta tell you, I may be dancing the line here because, and I look at this prioritization and I'm like, well, maybe a conviction would help you. And that's just not okay. And so, you know, I think, you know, if there's some input I can get from you all about the way that this prioritization, that it is baked in to the system, but that we've got to figure out how to navigate it because we don't want people to hit bottom. If they, are, if they are doing anything that's not in these priorities, but they're still encountering homelessness, then they're actually probably going to be pretty successful once we get them there. And step, you know, we know this from the research that's done. So then how do we... How do we make sure that we can prioritize the ones that maybe aren't being prioritized by this, you know, larger infrastructure? Commissioner, I'm going to let Martha talk, and talk about vulnerability scales and prioritization because that's in her wheelhouse and she works in that every day. Um, but I will tell you that prevention is, is where we really want to put a lot of effort um, we want to prevent people from becoming homeless and hitting rock bottom, right? Because it's never the place you want to be. You don't want to be in the homeless system because it's tough. Um, we want to prevent. We want people to be able to to be able to manage. And so many people we talk to self-correct. You know, they fall off, and then you know they're able just with a little bit to get right back. And that's where that prevention and early intervention comes in. Just a little bit gets them housed or keeps them housed. And that's where we really want to focus a lot of energy. Um, and so we're going to continue to do that. But I'll let Martha talk more about prioritization. Thank you for raising the question. Um, so a couple things come to mind. One of which is I have shown you a funding chart that is kind of the public dollars. There are a lot of other dollars that are invested in this system that do not, that are operating outside of that, you know, that are serving other populations. Um, and we need, as Donna said, we need everything. We need, we need all of that. Um, the, the, uh, another thing for you to know is that one of the things HSN does is provide training to our partners across the region on best practices and emerging practices. And one of those things is diversion. Because we know that communities, when they implement diversion, can divert about 14, 15 percent of people coming into shelters can keep them from having to enter in that system. So our goal is to have every frontline person trained on how to have a diversion conversation so that anyone who comes into the system starts with that diversion conversation. And sometimes things can get resolved without even a financial contribution, because part of what happens when people are facing homelessness is they panic, they get scared, right? And they're, yeah, they're scared. None of us do our best thinking when we're panicking and scared, right? And so a diversion conversation is oftentimes just somebody sitting down and slowing it down, catch a breath, slow it down a little bit, let's talk this through, and helping people identify what options they have that they just hadn't thought of that can keep them out of that system. So we are, even though those resources that we have don't fund diversion and don't fund prevention, we are still encouraging that across the entire system. The prioritization process is, it's, it's challenging. You know, it is hard. It is hard. It's very hard to say to somebody, 
I know you are extremely miserable. Guess what? You're not as bad off as it does a person, you know? Um, that nobody, nobody hears that well. None of us like that. I mean, I, I, I was telling someone, you know, several years, and let me preface this by saying I'm fine, all right? I'm fine. But I go to this neurologist, and he says to me, I think you may be lucky. I think it might just be that you have a benign brain tumor. Now, I was thinking that's nowhere near lucky, and I didn't. I'm fine, all right? Everything's fine. But what I had to realize is that his, and he swims in the deep end of the ocean, of the swimming pool, right? And so a benign brain tumor for him is kind of in the shallow end because many of the people he's working with have much more severe issues that they're dealing with. Our prioritization process is somewhat like that. We don't want anybody in that swimming pool. It's not fun for anybody to be in that swimming pool, but we recognize that some people are in the shallow end and some people are in the deep end. And the ones in the deep end are going to drown if we don't help them. And we don't have enough money to help everybody. And we don't have access to enough housing units to help everybody. So those two things put constrictions on us. And so it is about prioritizing because as the mayor, as the mayor said, as Donna said, when we don't prioritize those who have those greatest needs, they will cost our system more money in other places. They will cost the system more in jail, they will cost it in the hospitals, and all of these other places. And so it is. it makes economic sense, and it is humane to say we are going to assist those who can't do it without us. Yeah, no, I, I think philosophically, we're on the same page. I think practically, you know, there are cases of, of folks out in my side of town that have kind of floated from hotel to hotel, bunked up with 25, 30 people so they're not getting counted. Then they were in a car, but then they were back in a hotel. Yeah. Unless somebody in you know that scenario victimized them, which is highly likely, and they've been able to identify that, they don't even make this priority list. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, I, just trying to figure out, understanding exactly what you're saying, that there has to be some, there has to be some approach, but we have a very different county than some of the ones that use the same model. And I understand there has to be, when we're getting federal dollars, there has to be a system, like a system that can be applied everywhere. But then on top of it, where we have rural, so I have some rural areas, I know my, my colleagues here also do, that um, you know people who were able to really get absorbed into the forest for a long time, and it's not ideal, but they felt somewhat safe in that now that we're having this you know, broad expanses of areas that are developed, all by the way for luxury, apartments, um, that those people are being pushed out, they've never been counted. And so, you know, because they're, they're hidden, they're hidden behind, you know, they're hidden behind the forest. And, and don't get me wrong, that's where I would go. So I, you know, I just, I, I just want to make sure that when we look at the philosophical reasoning, right, for the priority list, I think we're all on the same page. But then when we've got the room full of the people who really do the lift, that we think about the people that are really missing. I think the other, the other portion of the people that I really worry about are the ones that are potentially being victimized by the um, maybe not all in systems for helping them, right? So, so um, either, you know, housing for, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say halfway house, but no, it's not an accurate description because I think there's some licensure involved there. But there's some predatory practices in housing that don't really go neatly into a category and we don't even know how to start counting those and getting them into some kind of a, a system so they can be actually in healthy and safe housing. So anyway, I know that this could, we could go back and forth. I just want to make sure that we all, while, I, while we are all in the room and while we're going forward talking about it, sort of identify the unique circumstances in the far reaches of our county. And, and please know that there is no one at HSN or on the Central Florida Commission for Homelessness or any of the agencies with which we partner who would not want to be able to serve every single person who experiences homelessness or is on the cusp of it. Every, all of us would, that is our desire, to be able to serve all, all of the population if we just don't have the resources to make that happen. Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Donna and Marta. You know, we have, I think we talk every week 
some something happens that we talk. Okay. So um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we're going to go back to prevention because I know, Donna, that's one of the main things that you brought here, right? Absolutely. And you said prevention in slide number 14, but then we talk about outreach in one of the other side, in right. the slide number 22. Absolutely. So prevention, what exactly are we going to do? I mean, because like, you know, I know my colleagues all are thinking the same thing. When somebody comes to your office, they are ready in the road to be homeless and to, how are we going to prevent? I mean, what exactly we, what is the idea? What is, what are we going to bring out so people can come to our offices to prevent them getting out? One thing, okay. not only because they're going to be, you know, homeless from an apartment, homeless from their own home that they owe, you know, that they pay mortgage, but they cannot pay anymore. Right. And that's more, you know, up here. So right. what it is that, that, you know, we are planning what, what, for prevention? So a multitude of different things, right? Because the, everything you just mentioned, absolutely. People are being evicted. They can't pay their rent. Their mortgage goes up. Their rents go up. And they may lose their housing. What, what we're attempting to do is get that situation assessed pretty quickly. Martha talks about prevention at the hubs. You can have, uh, there's multiple entry points. What we, when we fund prevention, we do it with the Coalition for the Homeless because they control most of the sheltering. So sometimes people need to come into sheltering because they're losing their housing. We're trying to prevent that too. So when we have somebody that you have somebody call your office, you have me, you talk to me about it, we're gonna call them immediately, have someone from the coalition do a full-blown assessment on what's going on with them. Why are they losing their housing? What kind of income do they have? What kind of expenses do they have? They're gonna do a full-blown assessment and they're gonna say, okay, have you maybe done ERAP? Have you tried the emergency rental assistance program? If they said, I've not been able to get help or I haven't, then we'll try to get them to do that first. But we're going to look at every opportunity for them not to come into the homeless system. For instance, we have people that are doubled up from time to time, even living with their own family members, family right? Members, yes. Talk about that. And their family members are done with them. Yes. <laughs> they want them yeah. to go, right? Sure. So what, what we're going to do is try to mediate that situation. It, it, they may still need to go, but do they have to go today? Can they go next week? Can we help, you know, maintain them in that safe, secure environment until we can work with them either to bring them into shelter or to help them maybe with rental assistance? But again, you're looking at income, you're looking at all those things that build into a plan of action to prevent them from being homeless. Those are it's a multitude of things that we do. Hotels, you know, we can pay for hotels with general revenue. Um, so we can do a lot of things to stabilize people. But we've also got to work on sustainability. Mm -hmm. That, that you know, interim plan may not last forever. So we've got to find something that does last forever. We've got to help people, you know, like our ARPA money is going to go to financial planning and supporting invocations and, and jobs and things that people can earn maybe a better living so they can afford some of these rents. But we're, we're going to help them along the way with those kind of things. And Commissioner, uh, item E8 on our agenda today, on the consent agenda, we approved that yeah. million dollars. And mm -hmm. that is what, what Donna just described right. is yeah. what those dollars will be used for. Exactly. Yeah. And we talk about that too. Right. Yeah, but then um, Donna, you know, we sometimes we have a not a correct concept of a homeless person, which most of them, and we talk about it, mm -hmm. they have a job. They are That's people right. that, you know. I know. Yeah. But they can. It's so that means panhandling may be their job. Exactly. So could be. Yes. So. Um, one of the things that we talk as well is the lack of low-income homes or right. apartment, right? Okay, and we saw in one of the, you know, a slides that there are some units that, and I have to say, I mean, not because I'm here, but 
this commission, this board, and the mayor have been working very hard. I mean, Absolutely. they have been money for other stuff, but the money for this stuff, which is so important for all of us, Absolutely. have been there as well. So thank you, mayor. Uh, so anyways, beside that, uh, what it is that we, you know, I mean, somebody talked this morning about more than 7,000 people, you know, living in the street and so. I know about families that live yeah. in the cars, right? Yeah. And we have yeah. talked about this too. Mm -hmm. And I have to say also that it was Friday, I think it was like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I called Mitchell office and they helped me for a family that living under section eight was going to be thrown out that afternoon and that office really take took took mm -hmm. care of it immediately and not because we did anything wrong the family made a decision not a good decision to right. pay something in top you know instead of the rent or whatever and then it was right. in that but you know the office i mean help immediately and the family was able to stay in that home so you see that's prevention and so but another thing that i that's want prevention. everybody that's and all these prevention. residents to yes. to hear me saying is please don't leave it for the last minute if you know i mean because they don't throw you out tomorrow they throw they tell right. you that you're going to be evicted right you know at, at two weeks or three i don't know whatever so don't leave it for the last minute to say, I'm going to be out today and I don't know, I don't have a place to go on a Friday afternoon. I can't tell you how many calls I get at 4 o'clock on Friday exactly. afternoon. Exactly. I, I need help today because I've got to go tomorrow. So I'm we like, want to help. We are here to help, but don't leave it for the last minute because, right. you know, it, is, right. it, it hurts us when a family with kids, Absolutely. you know, have to go to the street. Okay. So, okay. So saying that, in slide 21, um, Donna, you said that um, the rapid rehousing a family, you said how much it was invested in that one point what? Which one is that, Commissioner? That's 21. Slide 21. Rapid rehousing? Uh huh. 1.5. 1.5. 1. 1. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was, that's invested in that one. Okay. That's what I didn't have. Okay. Then my other question, um, and this is for Marta. <laughs> Marta, um, I know you mentioned the, you know, um, HSN, the services um, with domestic violence and human trafficking, and so. Uh, I know you provide more than homeless, you know, homelessness services. I know for different other stuff. What exactly? What is? What exactly? Um, since you are the lead agency, right? You services that you provide, and also, do you? have a process or some kind of a system for other agencies to, you know, help with this issue because I know HSN cannot do it all with all the, you know, issues that we have. So how do, what and how do you, you know, manage all this? Sure. So again, HSN is what, what's called the lead agency and we are involved in bringing the dollars into the community. We then subcontract and partner with different providers, right, to, who are the ones who are providing case management. In most cases, we're, we're the ones paying the ongoing rents when people get into housing to help them sustain the housing. Mm -hmm. Usually those dollars are coming uh, are through us. But, uh, you know, the, I would say 75% of the dollars we get from HUD are for rents, and about 20, 25% are for the services side of the equation. Um, and similarly, with the veterans program, it pays both rent and services. But we have processes by which we, we have open competitions where we say that we have these dollars and if they're agencies that would like to be selected to receive those dollars and they have to, you know, then they can compete in that process. Um, they have to be able to jump through all of the funding, the funders hoops. Um, but, but yeah, so we, we have that process and then we, so we're working with you know, dozens of agencies across the region that are providing the case management, that are doing the street outreach, that are providing those wraparound services uh, and both rapid rehousing, some transitional housing, but rapid rehousing and um, permanent supportive housing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, Marta, thank you. Marta, and you said that um, there in the $12 million that will be, um, you know, you also going to be a you know, providing services for human trafficking. What, what are you going to bring 
yeah. you know, to, to... So those, both the domestic violence and the human trafficking project are rapid rehousing programs. Um, that's how HUD frames them. And so the domestic violence is we're doing a partnership with the three domestic violence agencies, one in each county. They will be providing the services. Again, we'll be paying the rents. Okay. And then similarly, Catholic Charities will be providing the services for the human trafficking victims while we pay the rents. Both of those projects are just now kind of ramping up and starting, getting, will be getting started very soon. Mm, okay. Okay, that sounds good. And then, um, okay, now something that hit me and I just wanna ask you, is I know there was um, COVID money when it came, you know, and, it's, and you said there was unsheltered, um, you know, was not counted. So what happened with these homeless um, that was not counted during that COVID? So, okay, I, I could have been clear. They're still in the HMIS system, mm -hmm. so that they were still getting services. We still had street outreach going out. And, and I got to applaud our street outreach workers because in several communities, people stopped going out, mm -hmm. you know, and, and our, our street outreach teams were very committed and continued to go out across, across the whole region. Um, and so they were still receiving services and still in the HMIS system. They just, we just did not conduct that point in time count because uh, HUD discouraged communities from getting volunteers out there. But you know, this is before vaccines and expo being exposed or exposing homeless people who had a lot of them have health, health vulnerabilities and didn't want us uh, putting them at risk either. So they're still in the system. They were still being, receiving services. We just didn't do that one day count of the unsheltered population. Okay, and then my last question and then I'm done. I know in one of our, well, conversations, uh, I asked you what will be the most important thing that we need because I know, you know, you both have said we need more resources, we need more resources. So what exactly, you know, uh, we can help? Because, I mean, the increase of the rent, so we cannot control that. That's, you know, and, but there are things that we as a board, you know, as the county, as government, we, we can continue doing because, like I said, we, we look this very, you know, into this very, and I know, that, Donna, that you know because you receive a lot of phone calls and there's, everything is, okay, what is going on with mental health? What, you know, and it's, it has been increased and it's not only in adults that doesn't have home, it's in the kids and the students and everything. Okay, so we have a lot of work <laughs> to do, right? So, but what would be the main thing that you would say, you know, we need this to alleviate this? Housing. Help. Yeah. You got it. Number one. No. Yep, that's exactly yeah, and that's the, <laughs> right. Yeah, no. housing that's affordable to, to everyone Luxury. in our communities. And that's, yes. you know, that's the Orange County investment, but that's also making sure that our state invests, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the dollars that have been siphoned away from the Sadowski Fund, they could have funded 177,000 units, you know, and just think what kind of difference that could have made in our state. Uh, it's making sure that the federal government is investing in housing as well. Mm -hmm. So housing is, that's gonna be the number one predictor. Thank you, Marta. And any one of you can answer, just for the residents to, to, who's listening to know, what's the difference between low-income homes and affordable homes? <laughs> well, Hey, Mitchell. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's affordable for whom? You know, I think there are definitions. Mitchell could probably talk to that. When we talk affordable, when we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about low income, you know, extremely low income and no income. That's what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Mayor. You did a good job on that question, Donna, uh, because Mitchell was nodding his head. He was saying kind of <laughs> indirectly, thank God I don't have to get up there and respond to You know, it, Mayor, that's usually how he treats me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. Thanks, Mayor, and uh, congrats on your anniversary, Donna. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Thank okay. You. So um, I have a lot of questions, but I really am going to focus on a couple things. Um, one of the things that really stood out from everything we've heard and from my colleagues asking is that you guys at the um, HMIS intake 
But what we really need is crisis intervention because I have never, and if anybody on this diocese has, I have never gotten a call that said in 120 days I'm gonna be homeless. Has anybody ever gotten that call? Okay, so when they call you, they're desperate. There is no call us six months in advance before you're gonna be homeless. That doesn't exist. Um, and, and we discussed this, at your worst, it took you guys two weeks to return a call from 211. So I'm about to be homeless, I'm in desperate need, and I can't get anyone to return my call. That's huge. And um, we got those calls from us saying no one will call back. And so it worries me that if you, we direct people to call 211 <clears throat> when they're in crisis, you're not really going to help them out of crisis. And so once we identify that you're not there to help them out of crisis, we need to find resources that will help them out of crisis. With all honesty, I have never called you, Martha, because I go to organizations that I know will help in a crisis because there's nothing worse than someone about to lose their housing because they can't make rent. And that's much harder because this process actually almost forces people to become homeless because we don't have crisis intervention because not everyone suffers mental health. Not everyone has had an emergency where they didn't get to work for two weeks or had a car accident not everyone's there. And so I really, I really think that we need to be looking at this at, we need to assess really, I'm not saying change your system, I'm saying add a side arm that can truly help with folks because mental health is a large part of it, but financial financing is another large part. Just like Commissioner Gomez Cordero just said, they decided to pay another bill that was due then pay their rent. So that's a financial decision. That isn't a mental health decision. Um, I greatly contradict your numbers um, because, like Commissioner Wilson said, we know people who are living three, four families in one place. Um, I have a community that lives in U-Hauls. Um, I've given out air mattresses so they don't have to sleep on the wood, so they have air mattresses in their U-Hauls. And I actually have a business location that is code enforcement violating, but I don't want to turn them in because they rent the floor for people to sleep at night and they have a bathroom so they can wash up before their kids go to school. So we're <coughs> severely undercounted, severely. And, um, and we're not even including the undocumented community that is too afraid to even say they're homeless. So I think that if we could look at how we can do this, there are lots of agencies. I have a handful of agencies that when somebody calls me and says I've got a mother with two kids in a car and needs a place that I call. I don't call you guys. I call the agencies that can actually help them because usually it's just that bridge of I get paid next Friday but rent is due today. And <clears throat> I challenge you to find a way that we can do that. I understand the road to housing if you get there, but let's prevent that. Let's truly prevent it when it's a crisis situation. Um, because that road to housing is very long. There's people on that list that were there before I got elected and they're still on that list. But, and that's the way it is. And quite honestly, nobody wants to build affordable housing. I have apartments coming my way, one for 200 and something, one for 400. They are, there is no incentive for them to build affordable multifamily housing. It's called, I mean, we can't force them. So unless there's something that generates that desire, we're going to continue to see luxury housing. And there's plenty of that, plenty of luxury housing. But we have to do that because I also worry about your count number and how you acquire that. And I'm just also curious, when somebody is incarcerated in the jail and they are homeless, so they don't have an address, how are they not counted either? Okay, so there's a couple things there. Um, one is um, that right now, um, Commissioner, when we get the information from 211, those callbacks are happening within 24 hours. Now they are. Now they are, yes. Not in the so, past. W yeah, when, when the rents went um, crazy and right after the, and the moratorium ended, we had significantly increased numbers and um, we had to staff up and uh, 
get better prepared for that. Um, but right now, and part of those callbacks, though, is that problem-solving conversation, you know, to try and help people identify what options they may have. But I can tell you, everybody on that team would be delighted if there were more of these crisis resources that you're talking about, you know, because because well, because that is that is absolutely a need. Um, and again, our you know part of what we want to do is to use the resources we, that we have, and we have to we have to use them in the way that they're uh, prescribed to be used according to the you know the re the rules and regulations for those resources. But as you said, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a helpful another arm out there to help with with other things, with people in other situations. In terms of like counting people who are in jail, that's a federal decision. They say that you cannot count people uh, in the jails um, and until they come out because from their perspective, you don't know for sure that they're gonna be homeless when they come out until they come out. Um, there's, there's always more people uh, who, f fortunately there are more people who think they are going to become homeless than actually become homeless. Things do work out for some folks, and so that's that's just their rationale. It's just not numbers that they allow us to include. All right. So then, how about finding a crisis intervention? Because when I ha when people have gone to you, they come back and say, "I'm on a list. There's no help." They basically said, "There's no help. There's, you're on the list now." That's not helping. I mean, can we or can you guys? Because you do get funding, and you have outreach funding to have an outreach arm that actually does help that crisis intervention. And I'm surprised that you don't know these agencies. You're in the business of it. We, I have just learned over the years finding organizations that I will add some collect private funding to help do their own fundraising to help but have dedicated immediate food, immediate housing. They'll pay for a week while they transition or find family to live with. Why? why aren't we truly being preventative in this effort? And you guys who are the lead agency work with all these resources. True. And so our outreach workers and the people making uh, return phone calls and uh, through the diversion conversations that we, be, that we have and how we train other people to do diversion conversations, those referrals are made to those agencies. Uh, referrals are made to agencies that can assist. Sometimes those agencies still don't have the capacity to serve everybody that could be sent their way. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of services that don't come through our system or that we're not directly funding, that, but we recognize that those agencies are out there and we encourage people to link with those providers and help make those referrals. Okay, so you do work, because I've spoken to some of these agencies. Some say yes, they get referrals from you and some funding. Others say no, they've never gotten anything from you. So I've talked to both. And I'm just saying, why don't you try in this crisis prevention? Because I, I think the prevention key is what I can only focus on. Because us solving homelessness as a whole is a much bigger. But if we can focus and prevent 3% from having to go down that road to you, seems like that's more of a, of a, something that we're able to achieve than going down the road. Because I honestly believe, and Donna, we've had this conversation, once you go homeless, your mental health issues also go up. Because now you're living in survival mode on the street. And, and the biggest thing that hurts me is children experiencing this. This will forever change them. Their innocence is gone when they see and live on the streets and live in a car and have to run into a wall want to use the bathroom and clean up for school. Those are the worst. But if we can truly, you know, you get those calls and somebody says, like her, I couldn't, I had to pay a bill, so I'm short $200 for this month. Just seems much more effective in having someone in your office or having someone in your division that can do that. Because everything else, it's just a layer. And, and when we look at the cost at the end, it's tremendous. But imagine if we could prevent that. If that only costs us $1,000 as opposed to $40,000 down the road or fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. I agree. It would be awesome if we have more prevention resources. And um, when we've had prevention, so we did get some prevention dollars during COVID, and we used those. We funneled those out to agencies, and we had agencies that did that work. We don't have those dollars anymore. But one of the things is that sometimes these uh, other agencies 
can be more effective at prevention without using the federal, the public dollars because of all the hoops and documentation that are required to access those dollars. That can slow down the process. Um, people are not able to provide all the required documents to be able to give them those resources. So I think you're right that there's a need for uh, other resources that are funding other interventions um, in, in addition to the ones that come through this coordinated entry system. I think you got confused. I wasn't asking you guys to fund prevention. I'm asking you to start a crisis division in your intake because when you tell people, okay, calm down, let's talk about this, let's see where you're at, they're usually already beyond talking to the landlord and getting an extension. These are people, most people, just human nature, it is natural to try to figure this out. And when they finally can't, as do they go out, because there, there's not excitement about having to basically say we're going to end up homeless. I'm asking about in your outreach, which I saw outreach funding, actually having someone that can do crisis prevention, that can say, call this agency, they do help, call this agency, call the Salvation Army, speak to their intake, they can at least get you a bed, they now have sleeping bags. You know, there, there are resources out there that may not get you all the way to that level, but could prevent that. And uh, I know an agency that'll help pay one week of hotel, or will help fill that gap on rent. So, and I, if I know them, I know you know them, I don't want to announce it, because then it'll become a, a whirlwind for them, but I'm asking you guys in your outreach, create a crisis prevention part that if it's that call when you assess it, it's that call of I'm going to be short on my, on my mortgage, on my Section 8 payment. There could be help to prevent that whole family from being out on the street. That is part of the outreach staff's job description. That is part of what they do when they identify and talk to people if they, they will refer to those to resources, so that's part of what they do. Is it robust enough? No. Do we have enough no. of it? No. You know, it's something that's done. Could there be more? Absolutely. And I, I agree with you. We need there's 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 much greater demand than what we have the resources to meet right now. I just think that we could accomplish more just in developing someone who can help do that. Um, I also, when it comes to the mental health, this is a long struggling battle. I'm actually. Um, optimistic with some of these private organizations like Advent Health sitting in the audience to offer more options because when you think of our central receiving center not having enough staff so they can't fill the beds and when you think of folks in corrections needing to go for 24 48 hours and sending back to the jail in three hours because we don't have enough staff is not helping it's not helping the mental health issue so if we're able to develop other resources of people and organizations, I think that's a plus because we can't handle it all. But it's it's just, I, with all due respect, you guys are attempting to do something, but I think sometimes we need to kind of look at it from the outside and really try to find what other innovative ways we can do it, like we've seen in other cities where they have been innovative and in trying to do this. Um, I'm always amazed at, you know, Salvation Army and how they change things up and how they offer the, sho the showers and somewhere to sleep for the night, but they're not, it's not fully, you know, and, and you've got drug addiction and you've got all these other factors that fit in it. And I just think that it, it would be worthy to have another community town hall to really hear more of what we're seeing and hearing and those stories of sleeping on the floor of commercial lots just because there's a bathroom and, and those things that we can bring to the table. And I think it's ironic also, o OCPS guidance and individual schools, parent liaisons, don't even get to talk to each other. And that's a huge problem you have because OCPS is gonna give you a number, but the parent liaison who really knows the parents can't share that and they can't talk to each other because of privacy rules. And that is a major issue that you guys may wanna look into. I've had it happen in four of my schools. Yeah, and, and so they, so when I was, so the guidance counselor, the OCPS guidance counselors just basically said, just go to the schools, you'll be much more effective. So just, just ideas. And I think that if we were able to have more conversations, we could kind of bring these things that we're all individually going through to you to kind of see what we can do. But I think real crisis call or considering having 211 have other agencies, like what, where are you at? I know that you need to input them and have them in a system for eventual, 
but my whole point is trying to get to the point where they need to be in the system for eventual housing. Thank you. I appreciate the ideas and I look forward to the conversations. Commissioner Scott. Hi, Donna. Hi, Martha, good morning. Um, so I guess first I'd just say thank you for the work that you have done and I'm sure will continue to do as it relates to working with the homeless and housing insecure population. Um, especially when it comes to mental health, I recall a time where um, we had the warming shelters open, and particularly at Barnett Park, and I, I, I had a new job. I went from commissioner to referee because there were some mental health issues between two ladies that were fighting. But um, as my first question would be, when you speak of uh, youth options and, 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 and housing options for young people who are facing homelessness or housing insecure, um, beyond Covenant House and beyond Zebra Coalition, which I know is more specific to the LGBTQ youth, uh, what other options uh, are you looking at in terms of expanding that footprint? Because it's very small, but the need is larger than the providers that we have. And so have you come up with any ways, and it, whether it's increased funding or looking at other ways to be able to address that? Excellently timed question. Um, since we've been, since we received the uh, Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program Award, we were just notified of it a few months ago. The process involves us to working with youth, with youth experiencing homelessness. It's a youth-led plan. And any who want to be involved in that process to join us will be submitting the plan. Any who want to be involved in that process to join us will be submitting the plan in April. We hope that the federal government will approve the plan quickly. Don't know exactly. They may kick it back to us and make us tweaks and stuff. Don't know. But we're hoping that by this summer we'll be able to start putting out applications for agencies to help provide the services uh, that are identified in that, in that resource with that, with that plan for how we can spend those federal resources. And has there ever been any conversations as it relates to, uh, at least on a, a crisis basis, we're talking about maybe 24, 48 hours, utilizing any county facilities or county properties. Um, Mayor, um, Byron, I hate to kind of put you on the spot, um, but like I know, and this is extreme because be, it requires a significant amount of logistics, so I'm just asking, has it ever been a discussion? I know there are, are vacant facilities that we obviously still pay the utilities on at the jail. Um, again, it's different because you, you have the jail and certain accreditations and, and protocols there, but has there ever been a, a conversation about potentially using those vacant um, buildings in the jail for at least, not long term, but like 24 hours where we have maybe specifically to young people or, or single people? Has it ever been a discussion at all? Yeah, there have been discussions, but remember our correctional facilities uh, built to be correctional <laughs> facilities. And uh, sometimes that means that they do not lend themselves very well to be, be converting <laughs> to be a residential, you know, what, what uh, you kind of create a system in some regards of, of, of in, inequity, I think, as a community. Right. <clears throat> and uh, the question that I think staff has wrestled with is uh, how do we pay for it? One of, the, one of the challenges that, that we have as a community and, uh, is this. If we're the only county in the region providing services, we'll be the, we will become the donor county using Orange County taxpayers' mm -hmm. dollars to solve the issues for every other county because you know what will happen? Yeah. They will send all of their people over here. Mm -hmm. So while we're all passionate about, about these issues, uh, we do have to balance out what we're saying, what we're doing. Now, we do depend on the Homeless Services Network that has a, a tri-county, a regional reach to help us to balance that out. Factually, we live in a state of Florida, in the state of Florida, where the per capita uh, allocations for this space is one of the lowest in the nation. And that's probably strategically for a reason. You know, I can't 
began to come in about the wisdom from the legislature or those <clears throat> who are entrusted to kind of make decisions on behalf of the state. But I do believe that it's intentional. And what I mean by that is that uh, balance this out with the conversation now about immigration. You know, that, um, you know, our state, if you can't come here and be self-reliant and sustain yourself uh, and you're undocumented or you're coming from other places, I don't see a welcoming arm from our state for a reason because they feel like the social service costs to our state will skyrocket significantly. So no matter what we decide, we do have to balance out the services that we offer for our residents of Orange County, our current residents, and uh, try to make certain that we are providing those services and being careful, <laughs> you know, about not doing something that adversely will impact, that will diminish our ability to take care of our residents. Uh, I was at a, a, uh, I've been re uh, recently I was appointed to a national committee uh, by the National Association of Counties. And I heard some of my similarly situated colleagues from around the country. Uh, in certain counties and communities where they are being accused of making it too convenient for people who can work or should be working to just be lazy and live off the system. Uh, while we have persons who are incarcerated in our jail, we have the responsibility for their health, safety, and welfare while they're in our custody and to provide some services to them, hopefully, to cut down on recidivism where we don't want them to come back and forward. Uh, and that's the collective of all of these services that we are providing as a, that we hear when people uh, pay significantly and they see a, a homeless camp, they see someone on the side of the road. Uh, they say, Orange County, your board of county commission, the mayor, your board of county commission is, is making it too easy. Well, I, I have a lot of, a lot of experience okay, in dealing with, with this area over time, and I, what I do know is that a long-term strategy, as I said, when we invest on the front end to keep people housed, when we invest in treating the mental illness, the substance abuse, when we invest in those things, we do cut down on recidivism, and if we, that means we cut down on a person rep repeating a crime over and over and over again, that's smart crime prevention, right? If you can save a life because a person who is mentally ill doesn't go out here with a gun and kill multiple people because they never had their mental illness treated, or in some cases, they were never incarcerated when they should have been incarcerated, uh, <laughs> we have to be careful about what we're doing. That's all I'm saying there. And so I don't have all of the answers uh, to, and the solutions, but we work with these organizations. And I remind you that Mother R and HSN has competed around the country with other communities, and there's a reason why we have gotten the dollars back. It's a reason why they have uh, gotten the awards. So we can be critical, because none of us are perfect. Our system is not perfect. But I tell you what, when we look across the spectrum, we are doing much better here in our community than many other communities are. So I, I you know, <laughs> take the constructive criticism that you're getting here today and see if you can improve, but that doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the bath water that what the strategies that we are using are not working because I know differently. They are working. This is a tough space to work in and they are working. And so, Commissioner, a long way to answer your question, but you gave me the segue in there. No, I appreciate uh, it. So I'm just responding <laughs> to you. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate the, uh, the clarification, Mayor. I figured it might be some challenges. I just wanted to get your perspective on that. And so I do have uh, one additional question and a point. Um, when the, the funds that we received to, from Jeff Bezos' foundation uh, expire, um, do you know if we have an opportunity to, to maybe, maybe receive those funds in the future, or that's kind of wait to be seen? They, they tell us no, <clears throat> um, and you don't get to apply for those dollars. I mean, it's an invitation only. So we would, well, we, you know, we can keep our fingers crossed that we might get another invitation, but they told us not to count on that. And then my last point kind of touches on a bit of what Commissioner Revere is saying in terms of prevention, but more in, in the marketing and education. Um, I'm pretty confident that I'm the only member on this board within the past five years who could have been homeless um, at least three times. But it is only because I've helped people who were experiencing homelessness that I knew of the services that were available uh, through United Way and other organizations. And so I think um, one thing that's paramount to me is that, you know, some people are homeless for one or two reasons um, when it comes to services. They either weren't aware their services were available for them to, to partake in, I'm speaking about residents, or they didn't know how or where to assess those services. And so when we talk about prevention, I, I want you to be intentional on what are we doing in the ways of educating people to know that these services are available because, like I said, have, had not me and Don have worked together on a number of cases over the years and it's only because I helped others that I knew how to help myself. And I just know, had I not had that experience, I likely would have been homeless, you know, on at least three occasions. And that's for no other reason, for the two reasons, life happens. You know, I, it was a car repair, and I think I had another expense that was unexpected. And then the last one was, you know, COVID and, and losing, you know, my job temporarily because, because it was grant funded. But what if I didn't know about those services? I would have been homeless, not for my lack of ability to pay or have a job, but just because of life circumstances. And so as you craft your, your outreach and your prevention strategies, make sure that you know you put an emphasis on educating people of the services that are available to them to help them when they face hard times. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Moore. There aren't too many things to ask left, but, but uh, thank you for the presentation today. Um, do you see in the future um, more funding available to help with the drop-in centers? I know um, Commissioner Wilson probably would like one in the West, and I know I'm still you know, hoping, and I, I spoke to an advocate from the Apopka area, and I know that the, the barrier is that they still haven't found a property, because I think we were willing to provide them the $150,000 a year like we do for the east side. Do you have any words of wisdom about trying to have a drop-in center? Because we clearly see the population of homeless increasing in that area. We can hope. Um, <clears throat> don't, th there's not a designated pot of funds right now that that we're that we are able to apply for that can do that um, but sometimes HUD gets creative and throws something out there and when they do we try and jump on that train but right now I'm not aware of anything coming down the pipe for that from the county's perspective uh, commissioner we we believe that we have um, drop-in centers in good locations right now with Christian Service Center, one in Ocoee, you know, and you know, Scott Ballou doing what he does at Matthews Hope, which is fantastic, um, our east side drop-in center. But we do agree there are key locations that, that could use some drop-in centers. Um, they build relationships, they make things available, they get people into the homeless management information system, but the but we've always pushed for our faith communities. I mean, the, the East Side Drop-In Center, we started talking about that, I mean, years and years ago. And thanks to a, a grant we got, um, our division got from Mitchell, we were able to buy a location, but it took us two years to site that drop-in center. Um, so they're not easy things to, to get the project through, um, but they're helpful in so many ways, and you know, we, we'd love to see more of them, but we're gonna have to use our faith organizations to maybe start that rolling. Apopka's been working on that for a while. I've been out there and worked with them a number of times. I need to get back in touch with them and see if they've made any progress. But, but there are people that are actually working on some of those things. 
But what we see oftentimes, like I said, is the faith-based organizations come up with a plan, try to bring resources together, but oftentimes what they just need is a location. And um, that's what we were able to do until just a couple of years ago, the Samaritan Resource Center, they were doing it on their own. Um, they went after some money from Advent for one of their, their community grants. They got some, some dollars for them to expand some services. You know, we started giving them a little bit of general revenue, but they work on a shoestring budget. I mean, they don't have a lot of money. They get out and, and scrape for that, that money. But we did give them a facility to operate in and, and do a lot of the, the infrastructure on that facility. So if we can make partnerships like that with faith organizations and private organizations, we love those public-private partnerships. So we, we think they're great, and we would do more of them. Okay, it sounds like we need to get them all back, to, back together with you again. I think so. All right, and then my final question, um, I, I think the sheriff uh, representative left, so maybe Mayor Demings, you can handle this. Um, the, the, the issue, what I see with the law enforcement is we just move them from place to place. Are the, are the deputies instructed to tell these folks to call 211 or, you know, what do, do, do the deputies have training-wise to refer um, our homeless population into services? Um, they are trained in um, recognizing, you know, when a person is in crisis and being familiar with the different resources as a community. Um, and, you know, the first responders, they're out there where the rubber meets the road. They're dealing with it every day because when people encounter individuals sometimes who are homeless, um, the one number that they know <laughs> somebody's always going to answer is 911. And they call. Uh, and uh, this is where I think law enforcement officers sometimes realize that they don't want to make homelessness a criminal matter. And there are not enough resources in the community that uh, are readily accessible. And so when they're out there on the streets dealing with these situations, they try to do that their best, the best that they can do to move them along. But, um, but I have to say that, and, you know, having worked in you know, several of these agencies around here and working with law enforcement, I believe they have the right balance in our community and compassion for our community where uh, they want to do more than just criminalize it, arrest them for minor violations of law. We really don't want them doing that. But as a law enforcement officer, they only have so many tools uh, in their, uh, at their disposal. And uh, the biggest tool that they have is uh, to deprive someone of their liberty. And if they use that tool too often, that's a costly response. And so uh, it is the other community, the rest of the community that I think has a better response. Uh, there are, we were talking about drop-in centers. I've had some conversations with some CEOs of some recent drop-in centers that I've visited. And they're reluctant in some regards to accept public funding because they don't want to be responsive to the restrictions that government puts on them. Uh, they, many of them have a religious overtone and uh, they have requirements uh, for the people who uh, take advantage of their services and they have a methodology that they believe works. And sometimes when using that methodology uh, in their opinion that works, uh, they are constrained when they accept government money and so they don't want it. Uh, and yet they do provide a valuable service to, Donna was with me when we had this conversation with one recently. And um, I've been on this journey for the last few weeks visiting some places and I, I'm just here to tell you several don't want government money. Uh, they're not looking to us to solve it. They're out there in the space uh, trying to figure out how to respond to it uh, with a different type of a look. So I encourage them to do it. So the, the short answer is, here is not enough resources for the law enforcement officers to be efficient in making referrals. They, uh, they don't have uh, that kind of throughput to be able to do it. And, and why should it be placed on their shoulders 
and only their shoulders to deal with. No, that's a community problem. Uh, it's not, and to me, uh, many people are going to try to dump, dump this problem purely on government to solve. We cannot solve and adequately respond to this issue just from a governmental perspective. Uh, we will do the best that we can, but because we're the government, we're the elected officials, everyone says, solve our problems. That has not been my style of leadership. It has always been to say, no, community, we're going to work with you to solve our mutual problems. We're going to use government money and funds and processes where we can, uh, but we need all of you all to step up to the plate to help with this problem and not just carry the football by ourselves. I don't want us to do that. Um, so anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. So, uh, That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know you probably said that. I'm not going to ask any more questions. Uh, yeah. All right, Commissioner Bonilla. Um, so I'll say that there was this one email I got, and I will never forget the story. And it was this woman who was a government employee and her rent had gone up and she couldn't afford it so she thought she'd live in her car for a couple of months save up money to be able to you know get into another apartment well those two months ended up being a lot longer um, she ended up living on the floor in a, another government employee's um, home or apartment um, then that person's rent went up and they couldn't afford it so then they all were homeless and she said just living in her car for a long time, you know, just, you know, out in that situation, she, you know, was almost attacked, people trying to break into her car and the things that she saw, you know, she was like, you know, I didn't have mental health issues, but after being homeless, I sure do now. And she could see why a lot of people who have gone homeless have gotten mental, mental health issues, have, you know, substance abuse issues, you know, to try to numb, you know, those feelings and the things that they're going through. Um, eventually, she got out of that. But, you know, there's several things in that story which really hits me and tells the story. That one story tells a story of everything that's going on, you know, in Orange County. Um, you know, the saddest part is, you know, well, this really isn't the saddest part, but being a commissioner, the saddest part, you know, was that she was a government employee. Um, not Orange County, I don't know what, she didn't say which agency she was working with, but, you know, just that she wasn't getting paid enough to afford her rent increase, and neither was the person she was living with, um, and they all ended up homeless. And so that's, like, very impactful. Also, the point where she made that, you know, mental health is illness or issues, you know, and substance abuse could start after you become homeless. It's not due to home, do, it's not, homelessness isn't the source of, um, or that isn't the source of homelessness. Homelessness causes that, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, that was, that story I think is just very impactful and tells a lot. Um, but, you know, over the years, I mean, I've, when COVID first started happening and all the hotels started going, um, going under, you know, I brought up that we should purchase these hotels, make some emergency um, sheltering, and then turn that into, um, later on, affordable housing that, you know, and I brought up the idea, you know, um, and I think I've even submitted in a document, like, five years, you know, because I lived in affordable housing. It took us, like, about five years to really um, be able to get ourselves, you know, we finished school, we and you got better in our careers, we saved up money for a down payment for a house, and we bought a house. You know, that five years is a perfect amount of time to be able to do that. So I could see a lot of people be able to do that, you know, and then at, at the end of those five years, uh, which our affordable housing helped too um, with some of the down payment because they would take like a portion of your rent and give that to you when you move out for a down payment on a house if you're buying your first home. So, you know, that is a program that definitely we could do. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of like kicking them out in five years, like, you got five years here and that's it, you got to go. And then you have someone else who may be starting their lives, needs some assistance, you know, go through the program. Um, and then there's, you know, I also brought up the idea with, um, I believe it was Santa Barbara, it was a city, city said, well, you can't do that unless you have a shelter for them to go to. So they were like, 
she came up with the idea and she approached the, the mayor and she's like, look, you could take the idea, but let's do this. Um, let, we got all these warehouses, let's take a warehouse um, and turn it into a emergency shelter. They interviewed a lot of the homeless, um, figured out like what made them feel safer in a shelter and they designed it in a way that really worked. Um, and then she has some lessons from it too because she was like, you should, they've been through it and they were like, well, one thing we would have done differently is that had like um, a certain shelter for maybe just men and a certain one for like families, you know, sort of thing. And one for like families, you know, sort of thing. So, you know, that was, you know, something else. But there's all these ideas, right, that we all have. We've all brought some ideas. But um, the thing is, what was the, the statistic that you had told me during our meeting um, about the increase of homelessness is related to the increase of rent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that when your median rent goes up hundred dollars, you'll have a nine percent increase in homelessness. Yeah, so that is a measurable um, statistic that we could use. Um, so I'm I'm reading this book, and I gave a copy to Lisa Sneed too, called, called the 4DX, and it's about. Um, it's with the Franklin Covey organization, and they're starting to work with governments, and I forget what it was that one of these governments was working on, but they completely like solved, resolved their issue that they were having. Like They were having such a struggle with it, and with this platform was able to accomplish what they were trying to accomplish. And here's the federal government saying, um, what was this, their goal that they had? Um, they want to, they have calling for an ambitious 25% reduction in the number of people experiencing homelessness over the next three years. Okay, well, we know that homelessness is increased by 9% for every $100 of a rent increase. Well, that's something we know. And in this book, they talk about lag measurements and lead measurements. Um, and the perfect way to ex for me to explain this is with my son. <laughs> you know, so if I tell him at the end of the semester, you know, you need to get A's and B's, well, that's a lag measurement because that whole semester already happened, by then it's too late to do anything about it. But the lead measurements is, okay, every day you need to keep up to date with your assignments. Because if he does that, he'll get better grades. So that's a lead measurement. So we have to find out what that lead measurement is that can bring down the increase in rents. And so, you know, if we know how many units do we actually need for the population uh, with the vacancy rate, that would, you know, bring down rate, you know, um, rent prices, then that correlates to homelessness. Like we need to find something like that so that we have something measurable and specific and something achievable that we can get to this 25% reduction. Because if we keep looking at the lag measurements, we're, we're just spinning our wheels. You know, we need to look at what's actually causing that and affecting that goal so that we can accomplish it. Thanks. Commissioner Wilson, did you yeah, have I'm one? sorry. When you were talking about the faith-based community, I knew who you were talking about, Pastor Scott Volo out there at Matthew's Hope, that when I first came into office, it just blew my mind that he didn't take any government funds. And I, knowing that he had been sort of the, the person that that was the organization I relied on the first couple of times that I got a Saturday morning or a Friday afternoon call at, you know, 6.05 in the responsiveness. But it's a very different methodology and, and to the point of that, you know, the housing readiness versus... Um, housing first, which, you know, so, but I, I love hearing that you got to go out there. I know that I talked to him on Saturday and he said it was a really good discussion in, in the tour. And so, um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that and getting a, a kind of a, a glimpse into another model that, you know, I understand that he doesn't want to do the sort of um, the mold, right, that we have. But if there are other opportunities for us to support that, you know, we sometimes just out of my office will do, you know, supply drives and toy drives with them. And, even that, you know, bringing the awareness to their organization, it, you know, it's very much appreciated um, because they really are such a key player out there taking care of folks. So uh, to our two all-stars over here who've been working in this space for decades, uh, thank you. Um, this was, uh, I think, a great discussion today about the multitude of things we talked about this morning during the board meeting. Uh, we voted on some things today that I think will make a difference in our community and one of those was this uh, $55 million project that uh, the Orlando Housing Finance Authority advanced forward 
uh, called 52 at Park, uh, which where the uh, what used to be called the Parkwood uh, Plaza uh, area uh, on the um, northwest corner of John Young and Colonial Drive uh, is going to be redeveloped. And uh, they have a, a construction period of 36 to uh, 42 months and 300 uh, apartment units uh, designed to be affordable units are going to go in that area uh, to Commissioner Bonilla's point about sometimes can you take existing um, properties and uh, redevelop them uh, to fill the gap for the affordable uh, units. Well, 60% of the units are going to be at uh, the, the uh, 60% uh, of AMI uh, is going to be the target for, for those units. So I think that that is uh, going to help, you know, move the needle a little bit. Uh, but uh, so I'm, I'm highly encouraged when I see those types of projects uh, going forward in our community that, um, you know, it's kind of part of, of the comprehensive uh, strategies that we have. So uh, we'll be dealing with this, uh, commissioners for the balance of all of our time on this commission is <laughs> not going away. And uh, this is my 42nd year of public service. And I want to tell you that for all 42 of those years, we've been dealing with this issue and we'll continue to deal with it. So uh, thank you all. Uh, this concludes the morning portion of our meeting. Uh, we will reconvene at 2 p.m. for the afternoon portion uh, to the listening audience. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see the rest of you back at 2 p.m.
All right, everyone, uh, welcome to the March the 7th afternoon portion of the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting. We're back live at this time. We're going to begin uh, with Mr. Jason Sorensen, our chief planner, who's going to present the February 16th, 2023 Planning and Zoning Commission recommendations. And with that, Mr. Sorensen, you're recognized at this time. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Commissioners. On February 16th, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered six conventional rezoning re uh, requests. One was continued to the March 16th Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, and five were recommended for approval. We have not received any appeals. The action requested is to approve the February 16th Planning and Zoning Commission recommendations. Staff is available for any questions. All right, uh, with that, uh, do we have any questions or comments by members of the board? I hear none, I see none. Uh, is there a motion for approval? So, so moved, Gomez. Second, Bonilla. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda at this time. And uh, this is item A1 regarding the municipal service uh, benefit units and We'll open the public hearing on this item. I'll ask Ms. Ann Dawkins, the MSTU supervisor uh, for special assessments to come forward and frame this item. And with that, Ms. Dawkins, you are recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor Demings, County Commissioners. A1, this request is from a developer to amend the Avalon Town Center, Avalon Town Center phases 2A, 2B, live work units at Uptown Avalon MSBU for retention pond maintenance to include Avalon townhomes. The retention pond maintenance assessment will be $78 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This area is located in District 4. This amending MSBU for retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Uh, this is an administrative item, so there's not an applicant on this. However, I will uh, open it up for any public comments. Ms. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Conkle, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? We have no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, uh, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you, Would you Mayor. like to offer a motion? Yes, motion for approval. Second, Bonilla. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is uh, unanimous. And with that, we're going to move then to the next item, item A2. We'll open the public hearing on this item. And uh, Ms. Dawkins, this is another MSTU. We're going to ask you to frame this item as well. A2. This request is from a developer to establish the Bar Grove Phase 1 MSBU for street lighting and retention pond maintenance, which consists of 119 lots. The street lighting assessment will be $122 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. The retention pond maintenance will be $78 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 2. These establishing MSBUs for street lighting and retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Also, this is an administrative item, so no applicant on it. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, thank you very much. Um, then we'll close the public hearing on this item. We'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second, Scott. All right. We have mm -hmm. a motion and a second by Commissioner Scott. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. This is item A3. We'll open the public hearing on this item and Ms. Dawkins, you're recognized. This request is from a developer to establish the Blue Diamond MSBU for street lighting and retention pond maintenance, which consists of 49 lots. The street lighting assessment will be $153 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. The retention pond maintenance assessment will be $78 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 3. These establishing MSBUs for street lighting and retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Uh, 
another administrative item. Any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Uribe. Would you like to offer a motion? Yeah, motion for approval. Second, Gomez. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. And Ms. Dawkins, you're up again. A4. This request is from a property owner to establish the Campus View MSBU for street lighting consisting of 29 parcels, which is equivalent to 70 lots and will be charged per lot. The street, this street lighting assessment will be $13 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision is located in District 2. This establishing MSBU will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you. Uh, administrative item, any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Uh, yes, move to approve. Second, Scott. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. A motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to item A5. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and Ms. Dawkins, you'll recognize. A5, this request is from a developer to establish the Cooper's Run MSBU for retention pond maintenance, which consists of 20 lots. The retention pond maintenance assessment will be $78 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 2. This establishing MSBU for retention pond maintenance will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right, thank you. Uh, another administrative item. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? I have no speakers, Mayor. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, move to approve. Second, Wilson. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. We'll move to the next item, A6. Ms. Dawkins, you're recognized. A6. This request is from a developer to amend the Dominich Estates and Cooper's Runs MSBU for street lighting, which consists of 20 lots. The street lighting assessment will be $89 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 2. This amending MSBU for street lighting will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another administrative item. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers, Mayor. All right, we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the District Commissioner. Commissioner Moore, would you like to offer a motion? Yes, motion to approve. Second, you read me. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. And Ms. Dawkins, you're recognized. A7. This request is from a developer to amend the Encore at Ovation Area MSBU for street lighting and for retention pond maintenance. This amendment will add 27 lots of Encore at Ovation Phase 4A. The street lighting assessment will be $124 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. The retention pond maintenance assessment will be $78 per lot for operational expenses and administrative fees. This subdivision area is located in District 1. The, I'm sorry. The, these amending MSPUs will be effective November 1st, 2023, if approved today. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. I believe that's the final item for you this, today. Uh, another administrative item. Are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner. Commissioner Wilson, would you like to offer a motion? So moved, Wilson. Second, Second Scott. Right. All right, <laughs> Commissioner Scott, got it. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you, Ms. Dawkins. <laughs> uh, we're going to move to the next item, which is item B8. Um, and we'll open a public hearing on this item. And I'm going to ask Mr. Brett Blackadar, the Deputy Director of Public Works, to come forward to frame this item. I'm over here. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> uh, this is petition to vacate PTV 2204013 from Andrea Burke. Uh, the petitioner requests that Orange County vacate a 30-foot wide by approximately 144-foot 
long portion of a drainage and utility easement containing approximately 4,320 square feet located along the rear property line of her residential property in the Wedgefield community. The property lies north of Racine Street and east of Bancroft Boulevard. The petitioner wishes to vacate in order to obtain building permits for the construction of a workshop. The real estate management, engineering, transportation planning, roads and drainage, and environmental protection divisions have no objection to the request. All utility providers have signed letters of no objection to this request. Approval of this request will have no adverse effect on Orange County. Staff has no objection to this request. Our requested action is approval of PTV 20-04-014, and it is located in District 4. I'm here to answer any questions. All right, thank you, sir. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? I'm present, but I have no comments. Okay, she is present, but uh, she's waving on comments. Um, do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Then we'll close the public hearing at this time. We'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Bonilla. Would you like to offer a motion? Yes, and thank you for letting us know we're not hearing voices. Um, I'd like to approve the requested motion. Second, Scott. I got to put some points on the board yeah, there. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's already ahead of me. All he right. just got here. <laughs> all right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. This is B9. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and Mr. Blackadar will frame this item as well. Thank you, Mayor. This is petition to vacate PTV 20-04-014 from Joseph N. Schumann on behalf of Blue Rock Development, LLC. The petitioner requests that Orange County vacate a portion of a 60-foot opened and improved right-of-way known as Indian Head Trail and a 56-foot wide opened and improved right-of-way known as Waterford Oaks Access Road, containing approximately point uh, eight one acres. The property lies south of State Road 50 and west of Alafaya Trail. The petitioner wishes to vacate in order to add the land to his property for future development of a recently acquired property. The real estate management, engineering, transportation planning, roads and drainage, and environmental protection divisions have no objection to this request. All utility providers have signed letters of no objection to this request. Approval of this request will have no adverse effects on Orange County, and staff has no objections to this request. Our requested action is approval of PTV 20-04-014, subject, uh, you turn to the next slide, subject to the applicant recording an access easement to Orange County over the vacated area for the benefit of the general public. The parcel is located in District 4, and I'm here to answer any questions. All right, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward? Mayor, commissioners, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Hules. Uh, 215 North Eola Drive, Orlando 32801, and we concur with staff recommendation and happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, stand by for a moment. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing. We'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Gomez Cordero. Would you like to offer a motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. A motion for approval. Second, your reading. All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, thank you, sir. We'll move to the next item. This is C10. We'll open the public hearing on this item. Mr. Ted Kozak, our chief planner from the zoning division, is going to come forward to frame this item. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. So the next item is SC2207047. Um, it is an appeal public hearing. The applicant appellant is McGregor Love for Growing Minds School. Again, the case number, the uh, zoning district is RCE. Future land use is low density residential. Now, I'll just uh, want to point out that the uh, future land use in the zoning district are inconsistent. However, the comprehensive plan 8.2.5.1 allows um, for the pro project and a proposal to move forward due to the fact that it is allowed in all zoning districts, either by uh, permitted use or special exception. And that's where we are today. Address is 8841 Palm Lake Drive, Popka. Uh, we'll see in a, in a second the location. North side of Palm Lake Drive, east of south of Popka Vineland Road. Track size is 1.7 acres. This is in District 1, and the commissioner has been briefed. So there are two requests, special exception and a variance in the RCE zoning district. The first off is special exception to allow for an 8,500-square-foot daycare center and private school. Uh, kindergarten with 146 students that's cumulative 
the uh, variance is to allow a south front setback at 10.4 feet in lieu of 35. And, and the red star, that would be the uh, proposed site um, just east of South of Popka Vineland. And the zoning map, um, um, all, all the yellows would indicate residential. The property here is RCE, as I talked about. Um, the aerial map, you'll see uh, a number of slides showing these red dotted lines. Those would be the cumulative of a number of power line easements. So for reference, I'll just show them on all the slides. So this is the property right now. Um, the, the majority of the center is uh, these uh, Duke Energy power line easements, which uh, is readily uh, seen on this aerial because there's no vegetation. Then the, the southeast corner is the prop, part, portion of the property that's not within those easements. So it would be the proposed site plan, the, the, the red dotted lines, uh, there's a number of easements. So going around this site plan, pointing out a few things, as proposed would be that uh, yellow uh, colored, uh, and that's the building, the 8,500 square foot uh, proposed one story building. Um, the playground there in, in the lighter green uh, for reference, pointing out the blue line, that would be your, your typical and your required 35-foot front setback. And then the variance is in that bottom corner with the arrow, that's 10.4. The landscape plan, again, those, these dotted lines just keep continuing on, um, pointing out all the, uh, the landscaping proposed to this point. Um, the, the buffers, I'll talk about it later in a the slide, they all meet the code except to the south, there's a, um, a requested a deviation for five feet with a wall, uh, and, and then we'll talk about the landscape. And so there's some clusters of trees and um, shrubs throughout the property. These would be the proposed elevations. Um, to the top here is that northwest, that's the main entrance facing towards that parking lot. And then scrolling down, if you, you shift your eyes to the bottom, that's the the uh, um, south elevation, Palm Lake. So it, there, it, on the site plan, I pointed out that wall, so there, it, there would be a little bit of blockage. You wouldn't see those, uh, those uh, windows and doors because there would be a six foot high wall there. Some site photographs. This is facing the property from Palm Lake Drive, pretty much under those power lines, facing towards the Duke. And the, the Duke, pro the properties that I indirectly t talked about, the adjacent uses, I'll talk about a little more. But as you can see, there's um, power lines, cell towers. That's on a Duke property. That's a, a Duke substation. Um, and the foreground is a property that's across the street that's vacant. And then to your left, which you'll see in a second, that's a county retention pond. Uh, this would be the cluster of trees that we saw in the aerial, which would be the only part of the site that is not encumbered by easements. And um, uh, right behind there, there's a wall that, that dovetails and tucks into the substation. Now we're on the uh, southwest corner of the property from Palm Lake, looking north, and to your left would be the county retention fence and a pond there. To the north on those other side of the trees is a religious institution. And then uh, um, envision, imagine yourself now on the property facing towards Palm Lake. You can't see it right now. Those trees are, uh, would be where the proposed building the, would be located. And then finally, the county pond is now to your front and the foreground on your left. Um, I, I would be almost standing on South Popka Vineland, and then there's the Duke substation in the distance. So the site is vacant except for what I've talked about. Um, private schools, daycares, they're allowed in all agricultural and single family residential zoning districts with a special exception. Talked about the adjacent uses and um, how they're utilized. The Duke of Energy substation, the county pond to the west, church to the north, those power line easements which I uh, showed on the, the, all those slides. Ingress, egress proposed to Palm Lake Drive to the south. And uh, as proposed, as we talked about, the special exception is for daycare center, private school. The 146 students breaks down into 73 for daycare center, 73 for private school. Those hours, hours of operation are proposed between 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. The building I already talked about, 8,500 square feet, 24 parking spaces as proposed, meeting code. And the setback requirements in, in northeast and west directions meet code, and except for, of course, that variance requested to the south, 10.4. 
Um, the building could be reduced in size to meet setback requirements, there, thereby the variance would go away if that setback was met. Uh, there was a traffic study and detailed operational analysis provided. Transportation planning the county, Orange County, uh, proposed site plan along with the modified conga line as reviewed by county staff as adequate on-site queuing to accommodate the drop-off and pickup of students. And then as stated by transportation planning, the proposed driveway is not expected to have significant queues to obstruct through traffic movements on Palm Lake Drive. Just wanted to briefly get into a little more detail on the landscape plan that we saw a few slides ago. Um, this proposed would require some deviations for landscaping, those clusters and trees and shrubs. Um, the, the landscape code requires continual shrubs, however. The 85-90% the of the site is encumbered by power lines and they're, they're by um, any kind of discussions with, the, with Duke and, and any permissions to plant on the site requires um, their final uh, say so that some of these comments that came back from Duke required cl uh, these uh, clustering. The actual spacing of trees at this time appear to meet the, the uh, spacing requirements, which would be uh, 25 feet between trees and for understories. Um, just getting back to the landscape strip on the south, that's along the, the street uh, and that has a six foot high wall adjacent to Palm Lake Drive. Um, and then the landscape buffers north, east and west, that does meet the width requirements of the code. And at the end of the day, the deviations that per 24.3H, the zoning manager is authorized to grant deviations. And that in the, the cases of, of uh, substantial um, encumbrances or, or, or hardships or, or the like. Um, further discussion with Duke and the applicant will be needed to finalize the landscaping. So there's a built-in flexibility in um, whatever decision is made today. There was a community meeting on December 5th, 2022. It's attended by the applicant, county staff, and 138 persons. Many in attendance spoke out against, and these comments included uh, the inconsistency with the area, traffic impacts and speeding, on-site drop-off and stacking issues, noise and size of operations, negative impacts to property values, visual intrusion of the building and improvements to Palm Lake Drive, uh, possibility of future expansion, hours of operation, and then other things like environmental impacts that may be brought forward today, that, um, the, the impacts to that. So staff recommended approval of the special exception as it is compatible with the surrounding area. The improvements would not be detrimental to intrusion and would meet landscape requirements pursuant to what I've just talked about. Uh, staff recommended denial of the variance request as there are special conditions and circumstances the need is self-created. The request would grant special privilege. There would not be deprivation of rights. And the variance is not the minimum possible as the building size, like I talked about, could be reduced to meet that front setback that we saw. Staff mailed 54 notices to adjacent property owners in a 600-foot radius. Staff received 71 correspondences in favor of the request. None are mapped, meaning they're off map they're for the addresses that were mappable. And staff received 140 correspondences in opposition to this request. 30 of these red dots on, the, on here, the rest are either unaddressed or not able to be mapped on this. Um, and we're aware of the uh, special exception criteria, the six, I'm just going over very briefly, the consistency with the comprehensive plan, use similar and compatible with surrounding area, uh, not a detrimental intrusion, meeting performance standards, a noise, a vibration odor that are characteristic with majority of uses permitted in the zoning district, and then the landscape buffers that we just talked about. And the variance criteria, the six, um, you can see there, and just as a, a reminder, the special conditions not self-created, no special privilege conferred, the deprivation of rights, minimal possible in the purpose and intent. Uh, the BZA concluded that the use is not consistent with the comprehensive plan, not similar and compatible with the development pattern in the surrounding area, and would be a detrimental intrusion. Also, the variance would confer a special privilege, it was not the minimum necessary, and recommend denial of both the special exception and the variance. So the requested action include uh, either deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's request with conditions, 
and um, since the BZA did not move forward as a recommendation of approval, however, uh, for your reference and availability, the, here, the next uh, couple slides are the conditions that could be uh, recommended for approval. The first one, uh, the standard, as well as the second one, the third one, also standard. Number four, pertaining to time to obtain permits. Number five, pertaining to hours of operation. Six, pertaining to the number of children that I talked about, 73 and 73. And then a landscaping in accordance with chapter 24. And as a reminder, again, the request is today is either deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's request with conditions. And I'll take questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kozak. Uh, is the applicant or appellant on this uh, item present? And if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? If we could just have a moment for my presentation to be pulled up. All right. Mayor Demings, Commissioners, good afternoon. McGregor Love, 215 afternoon. North Eola Drive from the Lowndes Law Firm. I'm here on behalf of the Growing Minds Montessori School. Uh, before I get into the, the body of my presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, the owners, the founders of Growing Minds to tell you a little bit about their story in this community. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, respected commissioners, and respected community members. Usman Sari, 8121 Oak Park Road, Orlando, Florida, 32819. I'm the founder owner of Growing Minds Monastery School. Growing Minds was founded in the year 2001 and has been an integral part of the uh, Dr. Phillips community for over 22 years. I have been a Dr. Phillips resident for 35 years, raised my own three beautiful children right here in this community. Like any parent, I always wanted the best education for my children. I started volunteering at my oldest son's school, and I noticed with my extensive experience in child psychology and early childhood education, I noticed that there were gaps that were not being met. There were other few families who felt the same way. They supported me and they helped me create a beautiful Montessori school that, was, that met all the needs of children from birth to six years of age. We started, all this started over two decades ago, right in my backyard with 10 children. Since then, we have established a repetition in this area, and we are recognized as one of the best Montessori schools in Dr. Phillips. Our GMMS families, even our grandparents, they work hand in hand, making each school day very special for our children. And this doesn't stop at school. This continues in the homes of our community. Through the Solid Educational Foundation, our GMMS graduates, they are placed in exceptional programs, such as gifted, honors, AP, into, and they're accepted into Ivy League colleges and universities. Our alumni are sex, successful professionals in various fields. The time from birth to six is the most critical time in human development. Our program caters to the need of this age group. We are currently operating out of two locations. My daughter, Urujan Sari, who grew up in a monastery home and shares the same passion and love, she very successfully created uh, the infant toddler program, and she's running it right now. But our dream is to merge the two locations, to be under one roof. We need a home. We need a home for our GMMS families and our children. And this is where our children have grown. This is what we need at this time. Our mission is, and our goal is to always keep our school small, unique, and beautiful. Over the years, 
we have had great opportunities and we have been approached to expand our school outside of the Dr. Phillips area. But our heart is right here. Our school is here. This is where we belong. This is where our GMMS families have created strong bonds. This is where our children have grown together, forming everlasting friendships. Great schools make great communities. We are a close-knit community of GMMS families. This is what makes us special. This is what makes us unique. We all choose to live here, support each other, and we want the best education for our children. I humbly request for you to please help us and support us to continue with our mission for serving the children and the beautiful families in our community. These children are our future. These children are the citizens of tomorrow. They deserve the best education. Let's join hands together. Let's join hands and together we can watch our beautiful children flourish, blossom, and grow in our care. Thank you. Okay, um, just so you know, in terms of the decorum uh, during the Board of County Commission meeting, we ask that uh, you don't clap, make other noises. Um, it's the only way that we can maintain the decorum. So mm -hmm. that's your first warning. Okay. Arouge right. and sorry. Good afternoon. My address is 8121 Oak Park Road, Orlando, Florida. Hi, my name is Arouj Ansari, and I'm the founder and director of the Infinite Toddler Program at Growing Minds Montessori. I want to thank you all for being here today, whether you're here in opposition or here to support our project. I started this program when my daughter was just three months old, and thanks to word of mouth referrals, we've been growing rapidly since. I was exposed to the Montessori environment at a very young age and got to witness the hard work and dedication my mom put in over the years. It was during this period of my life that I developed a passion for little ones. I was raised in Dr. Phillips, so it means a lot to me to be able to work and provide exceptional child care for all of the neighboring communities. If you're familiar with the area, I went to Chain of Lakes Middle School and then Olympia High School right across the street. Being able to work and give back to our community just miles away from where I grew up is something that's truly special to me. As some of you are aware, many Orange County working families face extraordinary difficulties securing childcare, especially for the infant and toddler age, as only a few licensed providers exist. Many of these families are put on extended wait lists, which makes it very difficult for working families. This is why there's a high demand for growth in our area, specifically for childcare providers. For the past year, our team has been working with professionals within the Orange County area to help us achieve our goal of merging both locations. This would allow us to accommodate more families off of our wait list and better serve our community. We meet all of the criteria for a special exception and hope you're able to see that we've truly gone above and beyond to address any concerns that have been brought to our attention. We have over 750 signatures on our petition that shows the immense amount of support we have within the Dr. Phillips community. I re really hope you'll consider our project not only as an asset to the Dr. Phillips area, but a necessity for working families who struggle to secure childcare. Thank you for your time. For the record again, McGregor Love, I wanted to take some time to have uh, Uzma and Aruj introduce themselves to you just to impress upon you that this is not just another developer. This is not a developer. Uh, this, is their, this is the culmination of their life's work and their future. And they will work here, the hope is, for the rest of their working lives. And I think that's what's inspired them to work to make sure that they're good neighbors, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, they've made an impact on the community. We have around 645 uh, signatures on a petition from District 1 representatives. Um, we have folks in the crowd who support uh, the, the school, uh, and, and I know some of them will want to speak. What I would just ask is that you now raise your hand to show if you are in support of the Growing Minds Montessori School. Thank you. So I will move quickly uh, because of time, but the applicant is asking for a special exception and a variance. As you heard, the BZA result was a split vote, um, four to three approval of a motion to deny. Now, this is a de novo hearing, as you know, so I won't talk too much about the basis for the BZA's decision because you are sitting in their shoes now, evaluating this application fresh from the start. 
The site information is 1.75 acres, around 19% is functionally buildable. That southeast corner you can see there, uh, it's in the urban service area and zoned RCE. The location here, uh, you can see the church to the north, the Duke substation to the east, the pond to the west and vacant to the south. I created this graphic, not, it's not meant to signify anything about zoning specifically, but the red is either vacant or non-residential and the green is residential. So you can see it's there. It's actually the first occupied use if you're heading east on a um, Palm Lake Drive off of a Popka Vineland Road. This is a site plan. I'll just note 11% floor area ratio, so a, a fair, fairly modest intensity for the building. This is a floor plan. And as you know, as uh, Mr. Kozak mentioned, limited institutional uses like this are allowed in residential zoning districts. They're allowed by right under law if, you, if the applicant meets certain criteria. And what the county staff analysis found is that the applicant meets all of the criteria. So that certainly is enough under the law to require approval. But again, uh, uh, Uzma and Arouge are not uh, another developer. They're going to be working here for their careers. They want to be good neighbors. Uh, so they've looked at the concerns they've heard from neighbors and they've done the best they can in, in conjunction with their team to address them. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about some of those concerns. One is that approval is for commercial use that will open the door for more commercial uses. A special exception is not a rezoning. Uh, the county looks at these on a case-by-case -case basis uh, and expansion's not allowed without another approval like a special exception. So approval won't set a precedent for more non-residential development. Another uh, comment we've heard is that a school daycare is incompatible with nearby residential uses. Uh, these are neighborhood service uses that enhance existing neighborhoods. It, they would provide child care for nearby residents. And this is from the community assessment, the Orange County Head Start community assessment, that two out of three uh, children under the age of six potentially need child care. We know that more than 100 District 1 children are on the wait list for growing minds, so it seems like that's accurate uh, for this district. And the proposed school is modest in size and well situated compared to nearby schools. This is Windy Ridge Elementary, sort of sandwiched in the middle of residential subdivisions uh, compared to uh, Growing Mines, which is you know, right there at that intersection and the first occupied use heading east on Palm Lake Drive. And to access Windy Ridge, you need to follow 3,300 feet more or less uh, of roads that go by residential roads and crossroads. By comparison, 350 feet of Palm Lake Drive needs to be used from that, from that arterial road to access the property. Another concern we've had is that Palm Lake Drive is a residential road that can't handle the traffic. We've worked closely with uh, the County Transportation Department to, to look at this and underwent a school-specific operational analysis that was devised in um, February of 2019 by Dr. Hatem Abu Sena. Um, and the applicant, based on that conversation, committed to a few things. A, a conga line that will allow 27 cars to queue. You can kind of see it wrapping around the property. Our analysis doesn't show that there'll be anywhere near 27 cars at any time during the day, but if there were, none of them would be backing up on Palm Lake Drive. A uh, 120-foot westbound right turn lane on Palm Lake Drive, we've committed to that. Something that the county didn't ask for, but is uh, something we're committed to, is, is a staggered pickup and drop-off. So the drop-off window in the morning would be two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, there's a pickup window of three hours in the evening. And then there's also morning dismissals and afternoon arrivals. So it's not as if all 146 children are arriving at the same time. This is just a, a look at that schedule. Uh, cut through traffic on Palm Lake Drive was another um, uh, concern. Our analysis showed that only 14% of visitors will use a portion of Palm Lake Drive abutting those uh, homes. The voluntary proposed condition is that the applicant will enforce a right turn only out of the school during specific school hours. I'll hand it over to a member of our team to go over another concern. Hey, good afternoon, Mayor. <clears throat> good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Travis Kolb Jordanson, 9191 Bay Hill Boulevard. Um, I've been a design and construction professional for about 20 years, give or take. A uh, local resident, West Orange High School grad, went to Lakeview Middle School, live in this adjacent community to the uh, project. I'm here today to talk about uh, power lines and the, the concerns and conjecture around that. 
Um, I'm not going to read what's on the screen. We're quick for time right now. But the biggest thing is there's no true substantial evidence to support any ideas about cancer, tumors, malignant tumors, and just part to back that up. Um, I live in the Bay Hill community. There's tennis courts under these same power lines. There's driving ranges in Alworth. All the homes in the Palm Lake neighborhood on the north side are right next to these same power lines. The short transmission are the ones closer to the school, but still in the Duke Energy easement. The larger ones are the much taller ones. That's the high transmission lines. But again, all you that live in Palm Lake, I hope you're doing well. Um, you live right next to the substation and these power lines. Thank you. And finally, to jump into the variance, we won't go through each criteria, but you can see from the, uh, these are the, uh, the easement that restricts development. Those are the special conditions and circumstances you kind of see from, from the sky. Um, and functionally, there's actually 32 feet of separation between the paved portion of the right-of-way and where our building will be placed because of there's a, there's a large grass area there uh, that actually provides more functional separation. And visually, as you go down Palm Lake Drive, what you'll see will be very similar to um, you know, the residential buildings in Palm Lake Manor on the north and on the south. Uh, we have a, a, a cement wall and... Um, that's that's near the right of way line, but actually further set back from it um, than the residential subdivisions. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Joe Noss. I'm the architect of record on this project. Uh, 9100 Conway Windermere Road, Suite 200 Windermere, Florida 34786. One of the uh, items we heard from the residents is that they want to see a house built on this lot. Uh, we did a quick analysis to show uh, three adjacent homes for sale in the neighborhood. One specifically is in the adjacent Palm Lake HOA. Uh, none of those residential houses can fit on this lot due to the setback set by the Duke easement. I apologize, Mayor, Mayor Demings. Uh, I really wanted to get through without asking for additional time, but if I could request some additional time just to wrap up and then some for um, any response to comments. Um, how much time are you requesting? I only need a, another 30 seconds to wrap up and then any time to uh, just discuss comments that are mentioned during the... Um, okay, I'll give you the 30 seconds. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we're asking for approval of uh, a special exception and variance. And what it would allow, it would allow a school of a modest size uh, for the area. It would allow um, a school that's consistent with, um, you know, it's well-placed, it's well-situated. Uh, and it's well designed to minimize impacts on the surrounding area. Uh, thank you. I'm here to answer questions if you have them. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to, to stand by for a moment. And we're going to open it up for any public comment. But to those of you who are members of the public, um, regardless of uh, whether you are support or oppose, uh, we can try to work through this afternoon as efficiently as we can. If there is an opportunity to kind of aggregate uh, your um, comments, if uh, we'll get the point, you know, in terms of which, uh, which side you're on, but if there is uh, anyone that can be perhaps a spokesperson for the group or in some way, We'll leave that up to you all to figure it out because you can't, can uh, <clears throat> provide some of your time. Uh, each person uh, normally will be given two minutes, but let's say if uh, you waive uh, your right to actually speak today, uh, we will uh, give a portion of your time to a speaker and we will aggregate that time where that speaker will have more than the two minutes. Uh, we'll leave that up to you all, but uh, Mr. Conkle, uh, probably has received some cards uh, from different ones of you to, to speak at this time. Um, so I presume that uh, we have uh, multiple people who, are, who would like to speak. But again, just to work through efficiently this afternoon, if there's a way to do that, we ask that you do that. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Kunkel, how many members of the public do we have who have indicated a I desire to speak? 29 speakers, Mayor, some of which have uh, multiple cards associated with them. So there was three, uh, three speakers that have additional time. So I'll start the uh, calling the names out, and if you can, go over towards the podium after I call your name. And if I have it uh, recorded that you're dedicating some time, I'll call your name and just ask you to raise your hand so I can verify that you're here. So we'll start with David Sykes. 
if you can then head over to the podium, to be followed by Sandra Stallings and is uh, Catherine Adams here? Catherine Adams? Yeah, if, if you're here, if you can just raise your hand so I can verify that you're dedicating your time. Thank you. And the third speaker for the start will be uh, Salman Hadir. And how much total time does uh, Mr. Hadir have? Um, we'll have two minutes for the first speaker and then uh, three minutes for the second speaker. Okay. Uh, so, okay. You, right. You're recognized. Uh, just name and address. To the commission. Record. My name is David C. Sykes the second. Address 5588 Palm Lake Circle, Orlando, Florida 32819. I'm a second generation property owner in Palm Lake Manor on Palm Lake. Property was purchased in 1958 by my father. After his passing in 2015, went to my stepmother through life estate. I obtained the life estate in 2018 and now own that property. Property was bought, uh, bought before I was born. I've been there my whole life. I've seen this, all the changes in this area. Uh, it's over six and a half decades of ownership and being in the area. Our house, I'm going to have to cut some of my comments short. Our house was built in uh, 1985. Many things have gone on there. Growing up, we used this as a day escape in conjunction with the rural country estate zoning. Um, right after the house was built, the road was finally paved. When the house was built, it was all dirt roads. Saw an increase of traffic and a degradation in the lifestyle. Allowing a commercial private school in a planned RCE, single family home neighborhood should not be allowed. This will bring, by their own study in the BZA, 597 car trips a day. How many people want another 597 cars driving past your house? Two examples of safety issues from the video of the BZA meeting. At 29 minute mark, shows traffic stopped and backed up on Apopka Island during peak travel times. 26 minute mark, gives an F rating and mentions the need for a traffic signal for the traffic on Palm Lake Drive. If special exemption is allowed, to one vacant property, what about the vacant property to the south? There are other vacant properties at Daryl Carter and Apopka Vineland and the corner of Apopka Vineland and Conroy Windermere that would be more appropriate. Please do not allow this special exemption to intrude in my neighborhood. It is not what we all live for. I thank you for your time and service. Okay, uh, so uh, Mr. Sykes, I'm going to put you down as opposed. And uh, so just kind of as we move forward, uh, some may be in support, some may be opposed. Uh, so uh, if the next speaker, uh, I'm going to see uh, how, much time, how much time does she have? She'll have three minutes, Mayor. Okay, so she has three minutes. And your name, ma'am, is... My name is Sandra Stallings. Excuse so, me. So, Ms. Stallings, are you um, in support or opposed? I'm opposed, and I live at 8824 Palm Lake Drive, Orlando, Florida. Okay, and so uh, be before she speaks, so uh, how many people here are opposed to this development? Okay. So, because it's, it's, it appears that so many of you are opposed, what, what I'm going to try to attempt to do is <laughs> it's, it's not necessary for all of you to come up and say I'm basically opposed, but if you want to aggregate some of your time uh, to some of the speakers, it's okay that you do that. I, I, am, I am kind of hearing from the back that they're concerned that you're doing a tally and that there's a lot of people that are going to spill over, and I think a lot of them may have young <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, okay. I just want to make sure that... We're, we're, we're not doing a tally. No, no, I know. We, I just want to make sure that they're, uh, they're getting... It's, mm -hmm. it's, I'm just trying to manage the time this afternoon, uh, especially since we have so many children who are here. Uh, those children are going to get restless. And so if we can save, our, save some time, we, we're here from you, I think. Uh, if, uh, conversely, uh, there are going to be perhaps many people here who are in support of. And the same goes if you're in support, uh, if there's a way for you to aggregate your time with uh, a speaker, you know, we'll get the point. 
at the end of the day, uh, whether it's uh, the actual number of people uh, who speak either in support or in opposition uh, is not what the board is going to base its decision upon. It's going to base its decision upon uh, the facts that are going to be presented and whether or not it's consistent with our own uh, administrative regulations and policies and procedures. That's what we're going to base the decision upon. And we could reach that conclusion if one person spoke or two people spoke or what have you. Uh, so I, I'm just uh, in deference to everyone that came here, certainly if you all want us, you, you are uh, committed uh, to saying what you have to say. You certainly, I'm not going to take that right away from you. I'm just trying to work through the time uh, because I do see these mothers and, and parents with small children. It will get pretty burdensome to, to all of them if uh, everyone came up that intends to speak perhaps and doesn't necessarily need to speak. Okay, if that makes sense to all of you. All right, so uh, back to you, ma'am. Okay, I've lived on Palm Lake Drive for 40 years. Um, it, when I purchased the property in 1982, it was zoned with restrictions, which was no commercial use. And I just wanted to show you a picture of the property. It is next to three homes, 8824, 8828 and 8830 Palm Lake Drive. Um, you can see that the noise from the playground will affect the surrounding homes in the area, especially if we're outside. Uh, if I can hear um, the Catholic Church's school children down the street, I certainly can hear a playground, which will be operational, according to the county, seven days a week. This, this property is located in close proximity to Apopka Island Road. There's no access from Apopka Island Road. It's on Palm Lake Drive. Palm Lake Drive is one street in Palm Lake Manor. We only have one street. It goes right straight through our neighborhood. It's Palm Lake Drive around the lake. Uh, it's Palm Lake Circle, and then it turns back into Palm Lake Drive. So all traffic will be going directly through our neighborhood. We have children in the neighborhood that play. We have horses on the street. Um, it will affect us. They're talking about staggered times. Staggered times are only promises. There's no conditions put on county about staggered times. And regardless of staggered times, all vehicles will have to exit onto Palm Lake Drive, a residential road. As you can see from this picture, you only have five cars here. These five cars took three minutes to clear this intersection. We had to go into the median to make a left-hand turn. If you have even a couple cars from a Congo line, you have a major problem at this intersection. You have a parking lot next to a Duke Energy substation. Um, I have lived there 40 years. I know when Duke Energy has to access their property. Um, if you park on the street, those big trucks will not be able to get around them. Also, um, emergency vehicles, if you have parking on the street, there's gonna be real difficulty getting around um, that easement. Here's a picture that was taken, uh, I think it was January this year. It shows Duke Energy's uh, trucks. You can see the entrance to Duke Energy is right in the back wheels of the main truck. There's 8830 across the street. Okay, so as you can see, your time will go very quickly. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for uh, your comments. And thank you. We're going to move to the next speaker. Right, thank you, Mayor. The next speaker is Salman Hadir, to be followed by Ruthie Ryder, and then David uh, Boyer. State your name and address for the record, please. Uh, I'm Sal Hader, H-I-D-E-R, 8649 Crestgate uh, Circle, Orlando, 32819. I will give my time to Attorney Brent Spain. Thank you. 
Okay, so if you're going to give your time to someone, just you don't have to come to the mic and say anything. Just make sure that Mr. Conkle, who is keeping the order, because otherwise if you come and you say anything, that is your time. Okay, so uh, just understand how it will work. Uh, and so. My turn. Uh, and uh, Attorney uh, Spain, is he here? Okay, so he's over. So uh, if Mr. Spain is going to speak because he's representing uh, some clients here today, uh, Mr. Spain, if those who you're representing, if you could uh, try to coordinate with those who you're representing, uh, they don't have to come up and say, I'm going to yield my time to you to speak. Just We just have to make certain that they're present and we'll you know, give you the appropriate amount of time to speak on their behalf. Okay. All right. So now let's go My back name to is you. Ruth Reeder. I live at 5424 Palm Lake Circle. Please don't approve this plan. It's not about a school. It is about a neighborhood. We've lived there since 1975. Our kids grew up. What makes it unique and important is that it's the only RCE area in Dr. Phillips. That environment is what brought us here. We see bobcat, eagles, foxes, all kinds of wildlife. It's a unique and beautiful place. The current owner of this property has no connection to our neighborhood. It was purchased for $20,000 as an investment. And now they want to abandon all codes to develop it. Proposals for an office building, mosque, and now a preschool have been before this board, and each has been denied. Why not sell the property for its intended use? The only similar use, think back to that red area. There's a church, a um, cemetery, and a vacant piece of property. That church is Christ Community Church. It's in Palm Lake Manor, but quite, a different, quite different than this proposal. The entrance and exit is on Apopka Vineland, which is a four-lane road. The church is 5,000 square feet on 5.5 acres and meets all setback requirements. The footprint of the school, of the school is approximately 60% larger than the church. Church membership is approximately 100 and mainly on Saturday and Sunday activities. This current proposal is totally inconsistent with our residential country estate zoning, which requires a minimum of one acre. This site is less than one-fourth of a buildable acre. There's a home right across the street. There's no commercial property, and this is a commercial property. It's a money-making business in our neighborhood or in the surrounding areas. Our homes are, in, are on an alternative pavement road, which means it's narrower and not as strong as your typical road. This plan is totally inconsistent and incompatible with our neighborhood. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. And we'll move to the next speaker, please. David Boyer. Okay, um, so. Mr. Boyer's time is going to Mr. Spain. Next speaker is Christopher Ryder. To be followed by Eddie Stevens and then Janelle Newton. Hi, my name is Chris Reeder and I've lived on Palm Lake Circle for 31 years. Um, my main concern about the whole development is the traffic. Um, they, the traffic study that the uh, developer has submitted says there will be 597 cars per day generated, generated by this development. That's 4,179 cars per week driving past our house, driving past everybody's house. They're saying that, no, the traffic is going to go out to um, a Popka Vineland, but why would you go to a Popka Vineland, drive four miles around and through seven um, traffic lights when you can just cut through our subdivision? The pavement is 22 feet wide. There's a ditch on one side, then four feet of grass, and then a sidewalk where all our kids, 
ride their bicycles, um, walk to school, people jog, people ride horses through there. And the, tr the road is so narrow that every week there's, uh, there's uh, mailboxes that get clipped off because people don't slow down to go through there. If I would, I'm sure this is a wonderful school. I'm sure that they provide a wonderful education, but we don't need that, all that traffic, 16,716 cars per month, additional cars per month driving through our subdivision. Um, I think that this is just a bad plan for this area. There's other, well, right across the street from Bay Hill, you know, they could go to Bay Hill, you know, but, but nobody would even assume that they would go to Bay Hill and build a school. But yet they come into our neighborhood and say, okay, we want to, we want to um, impact your neighborhood. We want to lower your property values. We want to add all this traffic. And it's just, um, it's an inconsistent use, and I'm very opposed to it. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Eddie Stevens. State your name and address for the record, please. You'll have two minutes. My name is Deborah Stevens. I live at 8010 Palm Lake Drive. I've been a resident since 1985. I'm on the top end of Dr. Phillips' and Palm Lake Drive. And it has been stated that traffic will not come through um, from the Dr. Phillips side. I can confirm that when we first moved there, it was only a dirt road. Once they paved it and they put in Palm Lake Elementary School, Turn Lake used that area as a pass through for traffic. Then the county went and blocked off turn late entry and that stopped the traffic from coming through. Um, we have no way of blocking to stop the traffic from the school from coming off of Dr. Phillips going directly to and then creating a line uh, with their backup traffic. So I'm just here to let you know that you can't close off one road, side of the road, to avoid traffic from coming on that end. Thank you for your time. All right. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your comments. Our next speaker. Next speaker is Janelle Newton, to be followed by Betsy Story. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'm Janelle Newton, 1812 Prairie Lake Boulevard, Ocoee, Florida, 34761. And I am here on behalf of Christ Community Church, the governing board and the congregation of the church, which sits be besides this property. Our church feels that a school being built on the lot directly beside ours would be a detrimental intrusion to Christ Community Church, which is private property. It has been our policy and continues to be not to allow any public parking on our property except to accommodate any Christ Community Church events. And it is not our intent to approve, to change our policy. Human nature is to take the path of least resistance, which many people may attempt to do by pulling into the parking lot of our church and walking across the, the lots, which would be a liability issue. Our church property will not be an option for temporary overflow parking uh, for Growing Minds Montessori School. I've spoken with Mrs. Ansari, and she's a lovely person and she truly cares for all her students. However, the location they have chosen lacks any additional parking beyond day-to-day -day childcare dropping off and picking up. I can see the older children being picked up from the Congo line, but the infants, um, as a parent of children that used to go to daycare, I would park and go in and get my infants, so I'm not sure how that's gonna work with a Congo line with um, daycare. Also, in addition, school events such as open houses, graduations, festivals, etc., how are they going to um, accommodate them in the 36 space parking lot? We are curious to know also if Growing Minds has asked for a number of allowable events per year if their school should be built. Parking on either side of Palm Lake Drive near the proposed property would most certainly cause a fail with the traffic. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. 
Hi, my name is Betsy Story. I live at 5585 Palm Lake Circle, and I oppose this. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I don't understand how the county can say that it, it doesn't, that it meets all the criteria in the special exception, because there is no other property in our neighborhood that is commercial, that has children all day long, that has uh, cars, uh, 24 spaces. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it is it is an intrusion into the neighborhood. It is different. It it will be detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and I know that I have met with Mrs. Ansari a couple of times, and I know she said it here. She likes to be a neighbor, which I like to be a neighbor. And I don't think this is very neighborly to bring in something that the neighborhood opposes. So I'd like to know if everybody who lives in a neighborhood is anybody for it. Okay? For the people that are in favor of it, do anybody live in the neighborhood? Okay, ma'am. Uh, yeah. That's well, not part I, of the process. You can't ask the audience well, questions. He, he, you the, can. The attorney did. You, you have to. Speak. Okay, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say is that we, as the neighborhood, we do oppose it. We are not. We do not want this to be brought into our neighborhood. It is an intrusion into where we live, and um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. The next speaker is Nora Nasser. And uh, Terry Fishman, are you here? All right. So, Ms. Nasser, you'll have three minutes to be followed by Kai um, Utoa and Todd Norwood. Nora Nasser, 8234 uh, Via Rosa. Good afternoon. I'm here today as I believe one of the largest misconceptions in this special exception process has been the assumption of traffic our school could generate. As you can see by the following videos, the GMMS car line procedure is entirely different than that of all the schools in the area. Our school has existed in Harmony less than two miles down the road from the proposed location for over 20 years due to the procedure you can see here. The GMMS has perfected through trial and error. It is surrounded by residential homes including South Bay and Bay Hill and has never caused an issue with traffic. Each morning, four staff members are waiting to retrieve the children from their car seats and walk them into the building. We do not have parents park or stand around idly. Cars move in and out of the property within minutes. You can see here how there is about five to eight cars in queue at a time and a conga line and the conga line in our proposed building plans allows for 27, which is more than what is needed. During the working school hours from seven to six, the arrival and dismissals are broken down into staggered windows. These include morning care, AM, PM, and aftercare students. In these windows, you can watch cars swiftly proceed into the parking lot and exit efficiently, as it is with our current enrollment. The additional students that would be enrolled in GMMS with the 146 proposed have been accounted for, and thus we have included ample time as well as space both, both in the conga line, driveway, and the addition of a new turning lane, which was added for this process to continue to run as smoothly as it has done all these years. The county traffic study supports this claim and also stated at the BZA hearing that the road is capable of holding far more cars than what would be generated from our school. As you can clearly see, the entire parking lot is cleared out by the end of the 10 minute window. It is incredibly efficient and has been perfected down to a science over the past 22 years. In comparison, you can see this, which is a common visual we all experience each morning. Palm Lake Elementary, which is also zoned RCE, the car line causing backed up traffic on the main road. This is also the case with Dr. Phillips, Bay Meadows, and Sand Lake Elementary as well. Our school, whose enrollment would be minuscule in comparison, has accounted for all the concerns that were brought up making several accommodations for the surrounding community, including the conga line, turning lane, and a right turn only sign, to ensure that we would not create any overload flow onto the main road or neighboring subdivision. And yet we all accept this minor inconvenience created by these large public schools to our morning routine if it means our children are afforded quality education. These are essential needs of the community. They should not be up for discussion. We support these schools and we advocate for them. So please tell me why then are we not advocating for the early childhood education that comes first? 
the schools that support our and feeders to the same schools. I urge you to approve this special exception to allow for the very reason this exception was created, to help serve our community with essential needs such as wonderful school, growing minds, which is a true All right, institution. Thank you for your comments. You. Uh, we're going to move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Kai Utoa, be followed by Todd Norwood. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kyle Yella, 20084 Black with Fun Place. Um, I was born and raised here in Orlando, Florida, and I'm alumnus of Growing Minds Montessori. Um, since my education at Growing Minds, I've graduated from Virginia Tech with a major in business IT and a minor in uh, Spanish. I currently live in Northern Virginia outside of Washington, D.C., and I work for Deloitte Government and Public Services. However, when I heard the challenges that Growing Minds was facing for their future in Dr. Phillips, I took the day off of work and flew in from Virginia to support my school. Growing, Growing Minds is very close to my heart, and, a wonder, and the wonderful staff here, like Ms. Sari, gave me the solid foundation and caring education that helped me become the person I am today, and is the educational base that was crucial to my success as an adult. My connections to Growing Minds feel like family and have been a central part of my family's life here. My mother was a very involved parent, and my brother also attended and has since become a very successful engineering student. My family is still connected to the community and friends we've made here, and I'm still close to several of my former classmates as we've kept in touch and have grown to become successful individuals thanks to our shared time at Growing Minds. I still remember circle time, where we practiced grace and courtesy, sharing and caring, and how to be compassionate to one another. From a young age, Growing Minds taught us how to be kind and respectful to one another and celebrate the various faiths, ethnicities, and cultural backgrounds of our fellow students. Since its beginning, Growing Minds has been a place that is welcoming of anyone and everyone. This beautiful environment at Growing Minds cultivated the curiosity, ingenuity, and vigilism that helped advance us not only academically, but socially, emotionally, and spiritually. I came here because I feel strongly that the children of our community deserve to be introduced to these core values that Growing Minds offers. It would be a huge disservice for the community to lose this asset. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker, uh, Todd Norwood, to be followed by Rosie uh, Caratini. Am I able to get three minutes? Is it possible? Um, only if someone is. I think we had somebody that donated time our time already. Correct. Okay. And your name, sir? And your name, sir? Paul. Okay. All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Todd Norwood. Uh, my address is 487 Douglas Edward Drive. I am the uh, owner and managing broker of Bespoke Real Estate here in Orlando. We're a residential and commercial real estate brokerage that has had the privilege and honor of helping relocate uh, numerous businesses from resorts to doctor's offices. I've met and served countless families looking to take root in our area with the goal of raising their young families. Without question, the number one determining factor in where people want to move is the quality of the area's education. Bar none, there is no other concern as large or as consistent among the people with and without children. So let's look at growth. Um, Central Florida's population is, is one of the fastest growing in the nation. From 2020 to 22, the four-county region that makes up the MSA grew by 2.4% to reach a population of just over 2.6 million people. That's four times the rate of growth for the entire United States and the second fastest rate amongst the 30 largest cities in America. That translates to 1,100 new residents moving to Central Florida every week. While Florida may have a reputation as the land of snowbirds and pensioners, Orlando's new residents are far from looking to retire. If we look at geographic mobility data from the U.S. Census, we see that 46% of new residents to Orlando who move from outside of the area are aged 24 to 54, and only 12% of them are over 65. Orlando's new residents are also highly educated. 69% of the group over the age of 25 has at least some college education, and 14% have a graduate or professional degree. New faces are moving into the region every day who are young, educated, diverse, and looking to take part in Orlando's expanding community. The quality of a community's schools is central to any family's aspirations. And because this is the true question of how are the area's schools is one that I'm asked almost daily. So how are the area's schools? Well, the education uh, system in Florida pales in comparison to the rest of the country. 
A uh, study by U.S. News and World Report looked at the most and least educated states and compared them on factors such as educational attainment, school quality, and achievement gaps between genders and races. The study found that Florida ranked number 31 in place for education and child care. Florida Department of Education's kindergarten readiness screener in fall of 2020 showed that only 57% of students tested were actually ready for kindergarten. According to uh, U.S. News & World Report, Florida schools ranked 16th in college readiness, 22nd for reading, 34th for math, 26th for its high school graduation rate. We need better schooling options for our children. I'm asking this board to consider the importance of education in the lives of our children and its residents. Give the families and the communities you represent more options. We need it desperately. This parcel of land does not conform to its highest and best use. What it does conform to is the definition of an infill project. It is the opportunity right, to use an otherwise comments. useless piece of land for a major return. All right. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Next, speak next speaker is Rosie Cartini, to be followed by Russ Carlson. And is Beverly Carlson here? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Yes. We'll have two minutes. <clears throat> my name is Rosie Caratini. Let me get my notes. I'm so sorry. Oh. Rosie Caratini. Uh, I reside at 6435 Jackwood Court, Orlando, Florida. Uh, I am a lead teacher and assistant director at GMMS. I have been at GMMS since 2008 and in early childhood education for 24 years. Before working at GMMS, I worked at a prestige preschool. The school was beautiful, huge classrooms, beautiful indoor and outdoor playgrounds, etc. Very impressive, to say the least. What wasn't impressive was their program. Children play all day, become aggressive with each other because of the lack of structure and the lack of a good system. I became discouraged and honestly frustrated at this and went home to plan for a resolution. I came up with a plan that I thought was a great plan, dividing group centers and schedules, using, utilizing empty available rooms, and finally have the proper structure to educate, direct, and teach. Oh, sorry, I lost my... When I went to the director um, with my plan, uh, she literally just looked at me and said, that's a great plan, however, we need the room for new enrollments. My stomach turned and immediately I resigned. I couldn't work for a school where children are not a priority. Sad to say that my prior experiences with other preschools were not much different than the last. Um, everything changed when I met Mrs. Ansari in the beautiful preschool at GMMS, which was a total opposite. I was in awe of the school and how orderly, organized, educational it was and by the beautiful, peaceful environment. I was amazed by the work produced by these preschoolers that were elementary level. I felt like I was home, a place where I can teach and make an impact in the lives of these little ones. I would not be the teacher that I am today if it wasn't for Mrs. Ansari and GMMS. Not only is Montessori education a phenomenal in every way, um, but Mrs. Ansari has built a legacy, not just for her family, but for the families of the community, for the children, and for teachers like myself that really love to teach. Um, so I please ask that you would honor this request. And um, because this is what we do at Growing Minds Montessori School. So my prayer is that you will say yes, yes to GMMS. All right. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Russ Carlson. You'll have three minutes to be followed by Mary Sikora, Mike Ketchum, and then Joseph Sikora. Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Russ Carlson. I reside at 8758 Crestgate Circle, and I'm the president of uh, Palm Lakes Homeowners Association. I met directly with Ms. Ansari and listened to her case. Ms. Ansari speaks with great passion and conviction about the school that she founded, and she has a right to be proud. But she offers no explanation as to why she's attempting to encroach on our residential community to relocate her commercial operation. In the school's petition on change.org, they called our community's objections to their plan unfounded and short-sighted and claimed that the concerns come from a handful of residents who do not represent our community as a whole. But here are the facts. We're not aware of a single member of the faculty or staff of the Montessori School that live in the impacted neighborhood, so they have no standing to present a petition as a community member. Of the 79 families that will be impacted by this project, I'm not aware of anyone who supports it. When asked why they, why they chose to encroach on our community, 
we were told that there's no other property available, which is simply not true. There are 188 for-profit schools like this one within a 25-mile radius, radius of our community, and all have found commercial property to house their operation. None of them are in a neighborhood on land intended for a private residence using a two-lane road for their entrance and exit. The market for commercial property in the Dr. Phillips area is vibrant and full of options, albeit at a higher cost. This, is, this appeal is simply about economics, and this is a classic case of special interest politics. Please don't allow this applicant to reduce their development cost at our community expense. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Mary Sikora, to be followed by Mike Ketchum and followed by Joseph Sikora. My name is Mary Sikora. I live at 8666 Crestgate Circle in the Palm Lake uh, community. As a resident of Palm Lake, I strongly oppose the construction of a school and daycare center at the corner of Palm Lake Drive and Apopka Vineland Roads. These are my reasons. Palm Lake Drive is a residential street with single family homes. We purchased our home there in 2001 because it was a quiet, low traffic neighborhood. Traffic in the area will be adversely affected by placing a non-residential facility on a solely residential street. When this Montessori school was meeting at a church to which I belong, at Salem Lutheran Church, 7900 Apopka Vineland Road, they had special parent events four to five times a year using most of the 140 parking spaces on that property. With the proposed 35-space parking area for the school, overflow parking on our narrow Palm Lake Drive will cause severe problems. Parents will want to see special school activities in the place where the education occurs. The school has proposed a 10.4-foot setback where a 35-foot setback is required. This creates a safety hazard for the children as well as aesthetic concerns in the residential neighborhood. Placing children in a high area under high uh, electrical wires emanating from Duke Energy, whose property is directly next to the proposed school, is not only likely to be harmful to young children, it's developing brains, but opens the county to possible lawsuits. Granting an exception and variance to a current county criteria standards will set a precedent for allowing a non-residential facility to build, be built in other quiet, single-home neighborhoods. My children went to Montessori schools. I think it's a terrific way to educate children, but not in this community. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Mayor Jemmings, uh, Mayor of the members of the Commission. My name is Mike Ketchum. I'm a 22-year resident at 8667 resident at Crestgate Circle, and I currently serve on the Palm Lake Home Voters Association Board of Directors. You know, I've thought about my remarks, and I kind of feel like I'm Yogi Bear up here, because this is deja vu all over again. Because once again, we have another project being attempted on this very same site that is an unwarranted, undesirable, unacceptable and incompatible intrusion into a low density residential neighborhood. This will forever change the character of our neighborhood. It is for those same reasons the other project was resoundingly re rejected by the county mission several years ago. So what is different today that would cause this body to approve this project? I've looked around, the one thing I can see, there's a new attorney and there's a new applicant. Nothing else has changed. The traffic, the congestion, the noise remains the same that would occur from this project. I'm asking you today to do two things. Carefully consider the concerns expressed by the Palm Lake community, and the voices you are hearing today, and will soon hear from our legal counsel. Do not fall prey to the online wishes of those who live far away from Palm Lake and will never experience what we're going to have to experience were this project to be approved. Uphold the precedent that was previously set and the proper judgment that was properly rendered by the county a few years ago as well as the recent BZA recommendation regarding the inappropriate use of this property and reject the requested variance and exception. Please help us today to preserve and protect the integrity of our neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Joseph Sikora, 
to be followed by Stacy Johnson and Ned Timer. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Joseph Sikor. I live at 8666 Crestgate Circle, 32819. I would like to outline a risk that may not have been addressed by either the county or by the applicant of the special exception being discussed. My education background is as a physicist. However, my career path to took me towards becoming an actuary. During my 40 plus years, I've been evaluating risks. The high voltage lines crossing the property produce electromagnetic radiations, like conditions that we're more familiar with. We get sunburn from our skin being exposed to sunlight. We put suntan lotion to provide some protection. When you go to a dentist for x-rays, they're generally required. A leaded vest is generally supplied to the patient. The individual most at risk is the technician who administers the procedures several times a day, all week long. The protection for the technician is to go behind a wall to be protected from the x-rays by the electromagnetic spectrum. Once again, these are just a couple of examples. An EMF meter can be used to measure the strength of the EMF being generated. However, surges occur unexpectedly. Our skulls are provided with limited protection from EMFs. However, the density of skulls increases with age. Younger children are more vulnerable to EMF than adults. At birth, as we all know, there's very much softness exists in the skull that hardens as child ages. The human skull becomes more dense until the child reaches its hard-headed teenage years. Studies have shown EMF radiation has been associated with childhood cancers. Early signs are headaches, nausea. During the last meeting, and was shown today, the area will be occupied for 15 to 20 minutes for drop off. During this time, children are exposed to the radiation from the high radiation above. Our neighborhood children should not be an unknown subject into the side effects on EMFs in their developing brain. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Stacy Johnson. All right, thank you, ma'am. Ned Timer to be followed by Ed Kelly. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Ned Timmer. I live at 8716 Crestgate Circle in uh, Palm Lake, and I'm the previous uh, president of the HOA for Palm Lake. Um, you know, when you take the two locations that they currently have and combine them, you have more than double the, the uh, cars and the students located at one location. That to me spells a whole lot more than the conga line that's going in and out on, on a Popka Vineland when you're on a two lane road. So I, I just want to reinforce that. Uh, besides the negative impact of our residential neighborhood by this uh, proposed project, it, it's incompatible with our, our neighborhood. Uh, the proposed building is also being forced. It's almost like they're making it fit in just a small area, and it, it really doesn't meet the needs of this particular project. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir, for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Ed Kelly. Edward Kelly. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. I live at 5425 Palm Lake Circle. I'm coming on my 20th year living there. I'm a re I've been a, I'm a retired law enforcement officer from the area. I've been patrolling this area for excess of 35 years. I've seen the impact of the growth in the areas. Uh, we had a presentation about Windy Ridge Elementary. I saw what that traffic did to the neighborhoods in that area. We've also saw the videos of, uh, that was presented by somebody showing an empty parking lot, showing the other schools in the area. All that what's different about that is they all have traffic lights in the area. We're talking about Palm Lake Drive, the cars coming out of the proposed site at the school. We see the cars coming out, trying to merge onto, Palm, onto a Popka Island Road. Those speeds in, are in excess of 55, 60 miles an hour. I, I've seen these cars, I've seen the cloak the close collision calls that are on this street. Uh, Palm Lake Circle, which will be a cut through from Dr. Phil's Boulevard to the school, 
to Apopka Island will not handle this traffic. It is a very narrow street. I've seen cars coming around the corners there that have to veer off, come uh, close to coming onto the grass areas, the sidewalk areas. This neighborhood cannot handle this traffic. We know that this is a good school. We don't doubt it, but it, this is not the place. We are not considering the safety of not just the residents in this neighborhood, but the other safety concerns of the other people that live in the Dr. Phillips area, especially when they're trying to cross onto a Popka Island Road from Palm Lake Drive. I ask the, the board to consider not approving this change. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, ne next speaker, please. Next speaker is Brett Spain. And while you're uh, getting to the podium, I have a number of uh, speaker cards, if you can raise your hand when I call your name. David Strong, thank you. Scott Ziegler, thank you. Victor Wozny, thank you. Bill Stallings, thank you. Martin Crossley, okay. Um, Don Crossley, but you're dedicating your time? No. Okay. Um, Kendra Fox. Yes, I'm, I'm verifying the folks who are here. Uh, Alex McCulloch. Thank you. Thank you. And David Boy, uh, Boyer. All right, thank you. Um, you'll have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Commissioners. Before I start, um, a couple of housekeeping matters. One, my name is Brent Spain, Theriac in Spain, 1809 Edgewater Drive, Orlando, Florida. I've introduced into the record a copy of my PowerPoint presentation. I also would like to introduce into the record a copy of my letter dated March 3rd to Commissioner Nicole Wilson, which the board was copied on. That included a copy of our BZA presentation as well as the legal uh, and planning analysis that we submitted to the BZA. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, this afternoon, and right at the outset, I want to emphasize, we're not here today about whether this is a wonderful school or not. I don't think anybody's disputing that. What is in dispute and what the BZA found was that the proposal doesn't meet the county's criteria. And it's not that it has to meet just one of them, it has to meet all of them. And as you see on the slide on the overhead, Mr. Love and his client have the burden to demonstrate that. The burden's not on me. In fact, it never shifts to me until his client meets that burden. And the same thing with a variance. If I enter into a voluntary agreement, i.e. an easement, or I buy property with knowledge that there are site limitations that limit the buildable area, that's a self-created hardship, and I've provided some case law for that. So you all are familiar with the aerial, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but something staff didn't indicate, as you can see, there are actual several houses to the southeast of the site. The property immediately to the south is vacant. Inevitably, if this matter is approved, those folks will come right back in line here. They tried several years back and were unsuccessful, but they also will seek a non-residential use. This is the site plan, and as you can see, we're essentially sandwiching everything, everything possible right in that southeast corner of the site because the applicant just wants to. Uh, you have the blue line, which is the setback, so you can see that they're asking for two additional classrooms, the emergency exit out of those classrooms, and a playground to be sandwiched into the front yard setback. That's a 70% reduction. We're not talking 35 feet to 33 feet. We're talking 35 feet down to 10.4 feet. That's a front setback. The building also is turned on its backside, so you have the rear of a commercial activity facing the street, when the county's comp plan requires the exact opposite. So the special exception criteria, I'm not going to walk through these. The three I want to emphasize are the ones in green. Consistency with the comp plan, similar and compatible with the surrounding area and the pattern of development, and not act as a detrimental intrusion. All three of which the BZA found were not met. And again, I only need to demonstrate today that they failed to meet one of these six criteria. I submit they don't meet any of them. So plan consistency. 
you all are familiar with it, the fundamental consideration in all zoning decisions is compatibility. We've listed three comprehensive plan policies. I want to emphasize two of them. FLU 1.4.3, the location of commercial development shall be concentrated at major intersections. This is not a major intersection. They do not have access out onto Apopka Vineland Road. They have access onto Palm Lake Drive. And then FLU 1.4.4, 4 .4, quote, the disruption of residential areas by poorly located and designed commercial activities shall be avoided. This is not met. Historically, the county staff treats a daycare center and a pre-kindergarten, kindergarten school as a commercial activity. The suggestion not otherwise is not consistent with this board and county staff's prior decisions. And then there's FLU 1.4.6. Our planning analysis went through all nine criteria. The submittal doesn't meet eight of the nine criteria to change a residential use into a non-residential use. Compatibility and the detrimental intrusion, neither of which are met. If you go to the first bullet point, this is more intense than any of the surrounding low density single family residential uses. It's 8,500 square feet smushed into the little tiny southeast corner of the site. Now, the applicant has said we have a floor area ratio of 0.11, which seems low. When you compare it to the church just to the north, the church has a floor area ratio of 0.02. It's substantially more intense. You have hours of operation of 7 to 6 p.m. That's 11 plus hours a day, including teacher activity on the site not including any of the extracurricular activities. The building size alone, when I looked at the six closest residential homes to this project, this building is 40% greater in size. And I included the non-livable area in those homes, the garage, the covered patio, and everything. So the suggestion that this is just like a single family house, one, none of which design in a triangle, that's just not true. Lastly, you heard from the residents, they're not a single non-residential commercial activity on Palm Lake Drive. In fact, this board, and my firm was involved in it years ago when the proposed church uh, went on this exact same site, and it reduced from 13,000 to 9,000 square feet. It actually has less PM peak hour traffic than this proposed school. This board unanimously denied that use, in part because there were no non-residential uses on Palm Lake Drive, and it would cut, create cut through traffic and be an intrusion. And that turns us to the traffic impact. These are not my numbers. I'm not up here making these up. They're right out of the applicant's own study. 597 new trips on the Palm Lake Drive, a local road that has no striping, no shoulder, et cetera. You have 115 a.m. peak hour trips. You have 118 p.m. peak hour trips. The mosque that you all denied unanimously, once it was reduced in size, it had 98 p.m. peak hour trips. In the third bullet point, quoting the applicant's own traffic study, it shows that that westbound turn lane is going to operate a level of service F with this school bill. It's going to fail. And the applicant in the final bullet, They've acknowledged they have a school with 146 kids. They've acknowledged none of the kids at their school are from the Palm Lake community. And this lot is a platted lot in Palm Lake Manor. They're going to be drawing in 146 students from outside the neighborhood. Their own traffic study shows 14% of the trips, and this is their, their speculation on that, is going to cut through to Dr. Phillips Boulevard. I submit that once people try to go out on a Popka Vineland, that number is going to jump from 14% to a much higher number. So what does Palm Lake Drive look like? This is what it looks like. It's a residential street. In fact, it's probably from the last hearing, it's a substandard street. They paved over dirt. There was testimony at the last hearing they can't put speed bumps on it to slow people down because it's an emergency access way to cut through. And on the picture on the right, the car that car is right where the site is for the school, where those trees are on the right. The cut through traffic. I was here last month before you all and cut through traffic and this one, there's a precedent here because this board again unanimously denied a project because of cut through traffic. But on the image, you can see exactly how the people will cut through. From the school, 
they'll head out, they'll go around Palm Lake Circle, and they'll go out to Dr. Phillips Boulevard. And again, not only with the mosque, which it was cut through traffic, was a significant concern and had less PM peak hour trips than this project, but you had three BZA members specifically comment that the cut through traffic and the traffic onto Palm Lake Drive is per se the definition of a detrimental intrusion and that there's no way this won't have an adverse effect on this established neighborhood. So again, their own data shows that there's gonna be cut through traffic. It's not, I'm not here guessing. They're acknowledging there's gonna be cut through traffic. So this is just a tie back into the mosque, the religious use, you'll see that also tried to come in as a little triangle. Ironically, they actually met the front setback requirement. They weren't asking for that variance. And on the right, you'll see they proposed to limit it to 9,000 square feet. They also proposed what the applicant is trying to do today at this late hour. We'll, we'll put a sign right in, right out only. Everybody's gonna follow the sign. They're gonna go to Apopka Vineland. And this board, again, and the BZA back then, unanimously denied that, even with the limit, limited size down to 9,000 square feet. And you'll see some quotes from the transcript from that hearing, those are verbatim, because our firm was involved in that case. Lastly, this was discussed in my planning analysis, but these are prior denials. I'm not here today asking you to do something that's way out in left field, that's inconsistent with what the county's done historically. All of these are proposed daycares and pre-Ks, including a Montessori pre-K, the Wondermere preschool that our firm was involved in and opposing, and all these projects were denied because of the detrimental intrusion and because of unloading traffic onto a local residential road. So I respectfully ask you not to deny the rezoning, but the special exception, but actually uphold what your BZA did. And they found that it didn't meet those first three criteria of the special exception. And again, I only need to show it doesn't meet one. And then on the variance, much like your staff's already indicated, that's a clear-cut textbook example of a self-created hardship. There's actually no reason for that legally. So I appreciate your time. I ask you to uphold your BZA's denial. All right, thank you, Mr. Spain. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Candice Williams, to be followed by Freddie Stevenson, to be followed by Barbara Stevenson. Um, the next speaker then would be Bruce Perry. Okay. Next speaker, uh, Todd Norwood. Is this the same Todd Norwood spoke already? Yeah. And then the last speaker is Beverly Carlson. Hi. Um, Beverly Carlson, 8758 Crestgate Circle, Orlando, Florida, 32819 www.cancer.gov, exposure from power lines. A pooled analysis of nine studies reported a two-fold increase in risk of childhood leukemia among children with exposures of 0.4 units or higher. A meta-analysis of 15 studies observed a 1.7-fold increase in childhood leukemia among children with exposures of 0.3 units or higher. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, okay, I think uh, if I understood, there was a group trying to aggregate some comments together. Um, that was the last of the speaker cards, Mayor. The group in the back was wanting to give their time to um, um, Attorney Brett Spain. Okay, so. So I have no more speaker cards. Okay. And uh, in that, Attorney Spain has already spoken. I think we understand you know, his position. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to go back to the applicant, uh, the appellant, uh, for any rebuttal comments. And how much time does he have? He had expired his time, Mayor. Okay. So I'm going to give you 
two minutes. Thank you, Mayor. To wrap up. If I could just have a moment to get to that portion of my presentation. Again, for the record, McGregor Love 250 North Yellow Drive. Uh, I just want to remind this board, and I know this, this board knows what the standards for a special exception is, which is that in the case of a special exception where the applicant has otherwise complied with those conditions set forth in the code, the burden is upon the zoning authority that, to demonstrate by competent substantial evidence as a special exception is adverse to public interest. A special exception is a permitted use to which the applicant is entitled unless the zoning authority demonstrates according to the standards that such use would be adversely uh, would adversely affect the public interest. The professional staff report which recommends approval of the special exception meets that so now the burden shifts to uh, to show countervailingly that it doesn't meet it. And let's talk about a little bit what, what we've heard. We've heard a lot of generalized opposition um, and this, bo this board of course knows, this commission knows that um, that is not competent substantial evidence. Um, we've heard a uh, discussion about precedent. We've heard a lot about precedent and, and Mr. Spain mentioned what was done in the past. The reason that the, the county expends so many resources evaluating these on a case-by-case -case basis is precisely because you're not bound by precedent. Each one's different, each one's unique. We can't look at a, uh, uh, an interested party summary of what this or another board did uh, as, as, as um, uh, you know, actual competent substantial evidence. So I'll show you these not to suggest that this establishes any precedent, but to, to sort of uh, dispel the idea that there are, um, that this never happens. This is Lady Bird Academy just down the road and this is the Learning Center. Uh, which is, you can see the location of the subject property and then just to the southeast where that is. Uh, finally, we, we, we heard about um, the uh, EMFs uh, and what impact they may have on, on children. I'll introduce to the record the World Health Organization's uh, study on that, which says that there's no uh, connection. Um, and finally, I will say that we, uh, to clarify, we do have students within Palm Lake who are attending the Montessori School presently. Okay, uh, thank you Mr. Love for your comments. With uh, the rebuttal comments, uh, we're going to close the public hearing at this time and we'll open it up for any further questions or comments by members of the board. Uh, and I do note uh, Commissioner Scott, uh, uh, any comments on this one? Not necessarily a comment, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to, if we can bring back up uh, uh, the graphic number 20, or page number 20 for, the, yeah, that. Um, I wanted staff to kind of clarify, when they did these, uh, the dots, uh, these are all dots in opposition, and this is based on the, the notifications that were sent out via U.S. mail, correct? Am I correct? Correct. So dots would it be indicate actual, uh, actual comment letters, emails that they gave their address. So there are a number of other correspondences received in opposition. At the end of the day, you know, matter, and I'm only one vote on a, you know, a panel, but, but that you know, you're seeing a compassionate board of people who really want to hear the issues. Um, some of them I heard today, I don't know if I would necessarily pin on the, on the backs of this applicant, and, and those are things I want to continue to dialogue with you about. Um, other of them, I think, I'm, I'm wanting to walk down the line here and find out what the applicant has to say or if staff can clarify some things for us and maybe hopefully we can get to something that is um, agreeable to all. I, I will say as a person who raised all three of my children here and only have one left in public school, I literally moved to my neighborhood so I could walk mine to school. And, um, you know, I, so I, the intrusion part of it, I know it, it, you know, looking at sound and noise and the construction and I think, you know, what part of the intrusion can we look at that may provide some comfort if that is the case, if it's not the use as much as the intrusion of bringing a new structure there. And, and so let's, if we can walk down sort of the, um, some of the things that we talked about, the staggered hours of operation. And I think this was done so that there wouldn't be a queue on the outside. If you could explain a little bit more about what the purpose of that was. Sure, and, and it's something that's not, uh, wasn't devised to, you know, necessarily specifically to respond to this uh, site because it's really something that Growing Minds has done for years. It's something that they've found works for their parents. I mean, it's in their interest, of course, to have the drop-off and pick-up be uh, smooth and quick and efficient. 
Uh, and you saw the, you know, the video that was showed uh, that kind of demonstrated how that works. Um, but it, the pickup and drop off will have, and if you go, if you look at the table which we provided, which we're, we're committed to um, having that attached as a condition of approval, the table not only provides the specific windows, but it provides the number of, of parents that can arrive during those times. Uh, so unlike a, uh, a typical drop-off that kind of occurs in two large chunks, you have two hours and 10 minutes in the morning from 7 a.m. to 9, 10 a.m. Then you have the drop, the, the pickup window is three hours in the afternoon. And then in the middle, you also have um, an afternoon dismissal. And then you have an, uh, an afternoon um, arrival as well. So the students, rather than coming at one time, will come kind of throughout the day. And, and that's not even reflected in our traffic study. Uh, that's not something that uh, the analysis really considered. And it wasn't considered in the uh, county's transportation analysis of our project. But we know that in practice, because of their experience with it, that it will actually practically result in a much smoother operation throughout the day. OK, so um, you know, knowing that, I'm kind of just tucking it away in the back of my head that that would need to be articulated in the condition approval if that's you know, the way that we ended up going. Um, the next one was the, um, the setback. I think that the idea of having that 35-foot buffer, which is inherently part of the variance, and, and I believe this is why staff recommended denial on the variance part of it. Um, I'm assuming that has something to do with the enrollment. And, and is there a, you know, is there some wiggle room on bringing down that enrollment a little bit so that we can get that setback situated in a way that provides more buffer? Right. And, and, it, and it is, it's actually a function of, it's one of the things that they taught me pretty early on in the process about what was kind of uh, necessitating the size. It's a, it's a requirement for minimum classroom size imposed by the Department of Children and Families. And when I was looking at this, I went and looked at several other um, uh, approved daycare centers and kindergartens, and I kind of ran a simple calculation to determine kind of what they were doing just to make sure that we were on track. And I calculated kind of the, the uh, square per footage per student. And I think the um, one of the ones I showed the uh, not the learning center, but the the other um, approval uh, that was in the neighborhood was around 68 square feet per per child. This is ours is right around 58 square feet. Uh, so it's it's really a function of the minimum classroom size. But after after the uh, the board of zoning adjustment, we did go back and we looked at this and and tried to figure out what is the bare minimum that would allow the merger of these two programs the acceptance of some of the waitlisted children. And, and while not ideal, the, the applicant feels that a setback of, of 13 feet instead of 10 could be acceptable, still meet the minimum requirements. Uh, it will be inconvenient for some of the classrooms, but that could work um, if, if the uh, commission is inclined to uh, ask for a uh, reduction in our variance request in, in the degree of it. Okay, thank you so much for kind of, you know, walking me through some of those things. I know that you've worked really closely with staff, and I, I want to also make sure I disclose here, because this has been a, an issue of very high importance to so many people, that, you know, this is a quasi-judicial meeting. I've met with everybody, I think. <laughs> I've managed to, like, have parents come up to me in the grocery store. Um, we've had, you know, some uh, resident meetings that were out in the district with people on both sides, so I just want to make sure that that's been um, disclosed. Um, and then I, a couple questions for staff. One of them was that, you know, a lot of the concerns we're hearing are about the unimproved road that's in there, right? That it's not a, you know, that there is no center line, there's not um, curbs. Is there some, you know, part of the county responsibility to this neighborhood that really wouldn't fall on somebody that was trying to make use of a parcel um, in order to provide a more safe thoroughfare? And part two of that would be, can we do something about the cut through period? Well, the, I think County Transportation, if they could comment on that. Um, if not, I mean, the, the cut through, I would defer maybe to the, 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 the applicant's consultant on what, what they found. But um, the, just for, for layman's for us, that the, the closest route of travel would be out to the west. So um, 
any, anyone making a, a route going east, it would be a circular manner that may not be convenient. But um, I, I cannot comment on the, the improvements of the of, of the street and any curbing can, at this I time. I can comment on the, the I oversee the traffic engineering division, and we certainly can as part of the process. I did look at the distribution shows 14 percent of the distribution going to the east, so that's about maybe 80 trips per day. Um, that would, you know, that show going to east. Now, some of those people they're projecting live in those areas that would be using the school, so that's not all cut through traffic. But as, as part of this process, we certainly could, could do a traffic calming study. Um, and then uh, as far as the road, I have not studied the road in much detail, but it, it would be required, if that's their main road accessing, they would have to look at that during final engineering to make sure that that road they're accessing met county standard. Um, so and so sidewalks or any other improvements would be required as part of that you know, final engineering process. Okay. Com um, Commissioner, I believe someone stated that the uh, road was constructed in the late 80s, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, I was with the county in the late 80s, and I vaguely remember uh, this project. Um, I would have to go back and look at the plans. I, I have a hard time believing that this, I don't believe this was a, uh, just paving over a dirt road, but it was creating a standard typical subdivision road, residential road, which would be able to handle normal uh, road traffic. Um, so while we have a captive audience of staff, would it be possible, <laughs> no matter what happens here, for us to regroup with some of no. these residents about their safety concerns and the cut through there? Because I, I, that, that concerns me no matter what happens, and I just want to make sure that as a separate, as a se separate issue. Um, and do. then... Um, I think that was pretty much it as far as like understanding the county's history of, of that usage and, and I don't there was no other questions from okay you know I, I know this has been a really difficult uh, process. Uh, Commissioner Uribe has oh, uh, indicated a desire to speak. Um, if I could ask staff so I have seen I mean we, we've heard by comments about the Duke wires and then residents have shown me their Duke why, and I'm going to ask staff on this, their Duke acknowledgement of not to be under any wires, to be cautious. Have we ever gotten any clarity from Duke? Because although it's not under the power line, I'm assuming power lines just don't go directly. The, the playground would literally be right up to the area. So do we have any kind of data, conclusion, or anything from Duke? Have we ever reached out or, or know that? Because it seems there should be, if they're telling you not to be under it, and this is going to be right next to it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, staff has been forwarded and, and been a third party to the cor correspondence between the applicant and Duke because uh, Duke has uh, provided a lot of comments and um, to the point of being able to have a almost approval, but there's no approval until they, they're, they try to be apolitical. They're not going to say anything. And, finalize until such time. So as a private easement holder, um, county staff is encouraged um, all, all deliberation and, and, and solving issues, but at this point, the, the final decision uh, for improvements or what is allowed, um, uh, obviously there are no improvements allowed and there's a, a certain setback from the power lines, but um, uh, I, as county staff has been at least uh, third party reading the correspondence and, and understanding what has been said. Great. And then I just have a couple follow-up. So the BZA denied this and staff denied it, correct? So this uh, is being appealed by the applicant the originally. Staff recommended approval of special exception at the BZA and denial of the variance and the BZA recommend denial of both. So BZA d denied both. And can you tell me if there's been references of two other times? Because I hear upholding the decision, upholding the past decision. Could you tell me what the past denials were for on the same? There, there was a prior 2014 application for a religious institution that was discussed quite a bit today. And mm -hmm. uh, Were there I, any other ones besides that one? On this property, just that one. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Moore. I just want to tell you when I was on the school board, we wouldn't build a school with a parking lot under a power line. And so it wasn't about anything that they provided today. This just was the policy. They didn't yeah. do it. So that's my concern is those power lines. Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, I just, I, 
I think I want to hear from the applicant on what they've heard from the energy company on this because like I've dealt with them and they've told right. me what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do. So I would be surprised if they didn't at least give you that information. They did and, and I can provide some clarity on that because if you look at the timeline for um, when we submitted our application back in April of last year and when we actually got to the Board of Zoning Adjustment at the beginning of this year, um, the bulk of that time was spent redesigning the site plan and layout in order to satisfy Duke. Um, and so every aspect of this, the retention, which is permeable paved drain, um, exactly where everything's placed, was designed and redesigned to get what Duke calls a conditional no objection, which is we see your site plan, it now satisfies all of our standards, and I can assure you there are many of them, uh, and we don't object. Now, because it's not a fully engineered site plan, Duke will never say, okay, you can develop. When we fully engineer, we will, we will get that approval. Uh, but we didn't want to proceed until we knew it was feasible at Duke, which was a, a question we had at the outset. But we were able to reach a point where it became feasible, and we expect to have final approval of our engineered plan. Thank you. The answer is because I, I know I've had a, the same similar experience with them. Yes. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So based on what you just shared as it relates to Duke, you're saying um, they have no objections, but it is a probability that if something, if you do get moved forward, that they may impose some additional stipulations on the design? We don't anticipate necessarily that they'll impose additional stipulations. Uh, if, if they do, we're not aware of what those would be. Uh, but they don't have any objection to the basic layout. Once we get into the details, and this is delving into requiring a, a degree different than my own. Understood. Um, so I, I will tread carefully here. And we do have um, you know, a team here that could probably speak to it more because they were kind of leading the charge on those discussions. Uh, but they were fairly detailed in getting down to where we could get their conditional no objection. So we, we anticipate being able to push forward and, and get approval um, at, you know, at, the next, at the next stage. I'm satisfied with that answer. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, you ready for me? <laughs> All right. Hang in there, staff and, and commission, because I have a, a two-part motion because this was both a variance and a special exception. Um, so you know, based on the testimony here today, the evidence that we were presented, and, um, and reading very carefully the staff report, I, you know, I've read everything that I had in front of me again and again. Um, I, I am making a motion to deny the variance requested um, consistent with staff's recommendations because the request doesn't meet five of the six criteria. It is self-imposed, and, and it really, when I think about the idea of the intrusion, it really is at the crux of that. Um, second, based on the testimony and evidence today, including the staff report, um, I do make a motion to approve the special exception because the request does meet the criteria for special exception um, under our comprehensive plan with the number of students. Um, I would like to say that with an update knowing that there has to be um, some specific adaption to the conditions of approval, um, including obviously the things that were just discussed in terms of the um, staggered pickup times, hours of operation. I think those were both things that were updated based on feedback we got from the public. Um, so let me walk through that. But that's my, that is my motion, motion, two motion, two part motion, right? Single motion, Joel? No. Mayor, I'd ask the county attorney to. Uh, 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 ask the county attorney for point of order. Uh, if you understood the motion. <laughs> yeah, it's a two-part two motion, and this is how uh, the, uh, Commissioner Wilson uh, proposes to, to deal with both requests. Okay. One yes so is one that as, two as, motions as one, or one It's a two-part motion, motion because... It's, it's one motion that comp is comprised of two, two parts. Two parts. Okay. It'll be one motion. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Second, Bonilla. There's a second by Commissioner Bonilla. Uh, so, uh, so well, what is that? Yeah, can we have a point of Okay, so let me let me back up. So the motion to deny the the most the part of it that is being denied is the variance, which is the setback, right? So so taking it from 30 feet away from the where it was supposed to finish, the variance was going to bring it all the way up to 10, and that's why I talked about trying to get back some of that setback, mm -hmm. because the intrusion part of it seems to really be to some extent 
the idea that it's pushing into a neighborhood, okay? So I wanted to deny the variance, but approve the special exception because based on the criteria in this particular um, use, that they do meet the, the standards for the criteria for special exception. Okay. okay. And we have a motion okay. and a second on the floor. So, uh, in Aaron readiness uh, with the so motion. There. Could we door. have the conditions of approval as the staff had recommended on, on the request, Ted, so the board can see what we're looking at? Yeah, and I only wanted to say, so, and that's with the assumption that they'll come back later with whatever it, they need to do in order to. I feel like in. Solomon up here, right? Like, <laughs> you know, and I, I just want to try to make sure that, you know, looking, stepping right through the criteria for an exception, stepping right through the criteria for the variance, this is the, the outcome. And they'll have to work out how to make it happen later. Uh, that would have to be. Uh, Ted, can you so, uh, so the, the, go through these again? So the, let's go over what was recommended prior to BZA, and then we can go over any changes. So number one is pertaining to the development in accordance of site plan, landscape plan, and elevations, and dated November 18th, except as modified to meet the front setback. So because staff recommended denial of the variance, that was except as modified to meet that front setback, so it was already envisioned. Number two is standard Florida statute, and uh, three, deviation of code standards. Uh, four, it's the, the obtain within three years of final action. The hours of operation is five. Number children, six. Number seven, landscaping, and presumably con a new condition eight pertaining to stagger drop-off times. And then, if you could, um, just for my benefit, and I think for the benefit of the uh, public, basically, in, in a nutshell, just say, so if, if uh, Commissioner's motion um, passes as she describes, can you articulate what would be the next steps? I think that's where the confusion, what happens next? Well, the, the applicant per condition one would be forced to meet the front setback of 35, so... Uh, if presumably this this was approved at the time of permitting now the building that triangle would now have to get smaller shoved away from Palm Lake Drive to meet 35 so thank you okay yeah I mean I, and my feeling is that we have we have you know to follow these things that are in our comprehensive plan and walk through them and especially when they are you know Okay. To I'm going to call the vote. Uh, Commissioner right. Wilson, how do you vote? Oh, um, aye. Commissioner Moore? No. Commissioner Uribe? No. Uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero? I still don't understand. <laughs> Is this project going to be approved, yes or no? Yes. Yes? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. But, but, but with the special, okay. With but with a denial of the variance, which That's was the setback, setback, which may end up, which may okay. end up requiring additional, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what that means to their enrollment. It may need to drop. But I think, you know, when I look at the, the criteria and we follow the comprehensive plan and, and the variance criteria, this is the outcome. Okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. I vote no. All right. Four, three. Four, three. Motion. Motion passes. Right. So I can't do math. motion passes <laughs> four to three. And uh, we're going to move to the next item. All right, uh, I'm going to ask that you all uh, quietly, we are still in session, so we're still in session, we're still in session, so we ask that you leave the park quietly, okay, all right, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda, if uh, you all can get prepared for the next item, uh, this time we're going to move to item D11. And uh, this will include the item uh, pulled from this morning's consent agenda, uh, J4. And so we're going to ask uh, Mr. Joe Conkle, our public works director, 
uh, to frame this item. And with that, we're going to open a public hearing. And Mr. Conkel, you'll recognize at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing D11 is the Diocese of Orlando PD land use plan. The subject property is 59.71 gross acres in size and is generally located north of New Independence Parkway and east of Avalon Road, County Road 545 in the Horizon West Town Center Village. The request is to rezone the 59 acres from A1 to PD to construct 184 single family detached dwelling units. This is also related to consent agenda item J4, case RAG 22-10-049, which is the associated road and APF agreement for the property. The property is designated urban residential district on the Horizon West land use map within Village I and is currently zoned A2, in A, A1, sorry, A1. Um, and then the aerial shows the surrounding areas developed with uh, single family residential to the south. And then here is the PD land use plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Diocese of Orlando plan development, land use plan, PDLUP, subject to the conditions listed under the, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation in the staff report. I also approve the associated adequate public facilities and road network mitigation agreement. The mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in district one and staff is available for questions. Is the applicant on this item present? If so, please come forward. Good afternoon, Scott Gentry with Kelly Collins and Gentry, 1700 North Orange Avenue. Um, I appreciate the staff's help on this project and uh, we, we ask that you vote for it. And I do have a 45-minute presentation. Just kidding. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. Are there members of the public public hearing? And we do uh, have comments at this time before uh, we go to the district commissioner. Questions or comments? Commissioner Uribe. Good afternoon. I had a question. Do you know if this is a um, affordable or attainable housing, or is this a market retail neighborhood that's being built? I, I don't believe so. Just which one? <laughs> Pardon me? Is it market, market, market rate? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go to the district commissioner for a potential motion. Commissioner Wilson. I had a couple comments first. I want to really thank the applicant, the applicant team for talking to us early and often because this is really, it's not in the rural settlement, but it's close enough that we knew it was going to be sensitive. And for looking at a, a kind of a, a graduation of density away from the rural settlement, I think that kind of conscientiousness towards the public shows goodwill and and as you can see by the lack of, <laughs> of because we talked even last night you know some of the folks in the rural settlement and I said you know it, it, this is the same as what we talked about months and months ago um, and I appreciate you going out there and looking at the trees that are on site and protecting what's available um, with that I'll make a motion for approval second your reading we have a motion on a second all in favor say aye. aye opposed no motion passes and it is unanimous we'll move forward to the next item on our agenda for this afternoon, item E12. Thank you, Mr. Gentry. We'll open up the public hearing regarding E12, and we'll ask Ms. Blanche Hardy, the assistant uh, project manager, to come forward to frame this item from our transportation uh, planning division. And with that, Ms. Hardy, you're recognized at this time. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. We're here for the public hearing for the Chulieta Road C or 419 RCA study. We were previously with you for a work session about a month ago. We'll do an overview, uh, discuss existing conditions, recommended improvements, public engagement, and a summary and recommendations, starting with the overview. Uh, the purpose of the study is to identify preferred improvements to document project need and balance the needs of all users as listed, and including all modes of transportation. Uh, the studies begin with data collection, uh, we analyze existing conditions and develop a per preferred alternative. That preferred alternative is presented to the public. Uh, we had two community meetings on this project, and uh, then uh, we are informed by the public and develop a recommended improvement, and then we have brought that recommended improvement forward to both the local planning agency and the Board of County Commissioners in work sessions and a, a public hearing with the local planning agency who recommended approval. Uh, the project is located in northeast Orange County. 
Um, it is, uh, was part of the uh, NeoCATS study as shown in the orange shading. It is just east of the Picket Overlay and the uh, Grow and Sustany, uh, proposed Sustany subdivisions. And it, ex the road extends into Seminole County and is a major route between State Road 50 and State Road 46, both of which important routes to the East Coast and Interstate 95. Uh, overview of the study uh, begins at SR50 and extends to Lake Pickett Road. It's roughly 1.9 mile. The corridor is primarily occupied by residential developments with commercial activity uh, concentrated near State Road 50. There are a few um, undeveloped parcels within the exact corridor. However, a development uh, it con it continues to occur in this area and in Seminole County. And there are, this was part of the uh, long range transportation plan. There are two schools within the segment, Corner Lake Middle School and Columbia Elementary. I'd like to point out that uh, the East River Falcon Way Road to the south of Chuliota is the location of East River High School as well. And this is, uh, was part of Invest in Our Homes for Life and the project is fully funded at current dollars. I'll go over the existing conditions on the roadway. Um, it's a two-lane road with flush paved shoulders. Uh, open ditch drainage. Right now there are no stormwater ponds serving the road or treating the stormwater runoff. Uh, sidewalks are only intermittently present. And the existing right-of-way varies from 100 to 130 feet. Um, significant right-of-way was acquired as part of development. And so most of the right-of-way for the project is available at this time. In addition to the subdivisions shown, uh, Corner Lakes Garden is a 47-unit um, proposal at the southwest corner of Pickett and Chuliota Road is currently in uh, subdivision mm -hmm. review. And the parcel just north of the gas station at the northeast corner of Chuliota Road and SR50 also has development plans. These are the turning counts. The traffic volumes are currently 1,500 to 15,400 vehicles per day. And segments of Chuliota Road are projected to operate at a level service S or below county standards in the design year 2048. This is the southern part of the corridor. And we've just done it in two, so you can actually read it. And this is the northern part of the corridor, uh, same exact information. The, uh, we performed pedestrian and bicycle counts. I point out again that 60, uh, which is circled, that's a very large number. Existing and uh, pedestrian counts were taken. And the heaviest uh, counts were between SR50 and Cypress Lake Glen Boulevard. Um, those counts were recorded midday, and this intersection serves both the public commercial plaza, East River High School, and the, including the Magnet First Responder School at East River High School, retail and fast food businesses along the corridor. And I will mention we have uh, worked extensively with Florida Department of Transportation, who now plan to do interim pedestrian improvements as part of their State Road 50 widening that will occur before the widening portion of the project and should be concurrent or pre uh, this project. We did five years uh, of crash history on this project from 2016 to 2020. There were 113 total crashes, 36 injuries, no fatalities, one pedestrian crash, and three bicycle crashes. Uh, here's uh, maps of the crash history. 61 of the crashes, or 54%, occurred at the intersection of Chuliota Road and State Road 50. Uh, which has represented the, the highest concentration of class, uh, crashes in the corridor. Uh, as I mentioned, the county is coordinating with FDOT to make this a safer uh, intersection for pedestrians at this time. The predominant crashes um, in the next were 24 crashes at the intersection of Chulietta Road and Cypress Lakes Glen Boulevard, School View Way. This is more than a dot. This is a segment of road. These are 500 feet apart. They're very close to each other, and these crashes occur between the two. Most of them were failure to yield or keep a proper lane, which indicates left-hand turns or 
people trying to get around congestion. Uh, and there were three crashes at uh, Chiliota Road and Corner Lake Drive. Moving north, there were two crashes at Chiliota Road and Lake Gillen Boulevard, Longboat Lane, and then 13 crashes at Lake Pickett Road and Chiliota Road. We did an environmental assessment of the, uh, the corridor and wetland impacts are expected to be minimal. A riparian habitat protection zone impacts are expected to be minimal. Habitat to support a variety of species was identified. Uh, if species are seen, they are recorded. However, as part of the study, we identify habitat. Specific species counts done at the appropriate time for years for that exact species will be done during design. Uh, no impact or potential of high medium risk were identified for contaminated sites and no uh, cultural resources or historic structures or areas were identified within the corridor. We'll move on to the recommended improvements. Uh, this is the context classification. These are Florida Department of Transportation classifications and for this corridor the context classification is C3C suburban commercial and C3R suburban residential. Um, I will add a little bit to the explanation of that. C3R is mostly residential. It's used within large blocks and disconnected or sparse roadway networks as we see with the existing subdivisions on the east and west side of this road. And the C3C commercial, uh, suburban commercial is mostly non-residential uses with large building footprints, large parking lots within large blocks, and disconnected or sparse roadway networks. These are usually one-story buildings up to four stories office, we don't have that, but it can be. And these are detached buildings with large or greater than 75 foot setbacks on all sides, no fronting uses as we would expect in complete streets, and partly mostly in the front. This is exactly the type of development we have with the Publix Plaza at the intersection of State Road 50 and Chiliota Road, and across the street with the uh, commercial developments including retail and restaurant on the south side of State Road 50. Uh, we use the context classification to, divine, to de define design controls such as speed, access management, and traffic characteristics. And this, these context classifications have two event benefits. They allow for a 35 to 45 mile an hour design speed. Our design speeds are 45 and 40, which is lower than the existing speed. We understand that speed is an issue and we're lowering the speed limits. And those are design speeds that will not be posted speeds. Posted speeds can be lower than the design speed. And this allows for the creation of project specific transition zones between those two speed limits. Here are the strategies that we use to achieve the operating speeds. And included in the study are horizontal curves, street trees in the medians, curb and gutter, uh, 11 foot travel lanes, which is lane narrowing, all of these Improvements which are proposed will reduce speed. During design, we look at median island crossings. And then once the pedestrian and bicycle f facilities are built and they are not present at this time, we then track their use and can uh, propose additional improvements ranging from speed feedback signs to rapid flashing beacons and other mid-block crossing amenities. In 2048, or the design year, here are the proposed increases in traffic, and remember it was 11, 5, and 15, 4. So between SR50 and Cypress Lake Gun Boulevard, we go up to 23,500 trips, and then the rest of the segments follow, and the least being 17,500 trips, which is a, a notable increase from what is current conditions. Um, these uh, numbers are used to, to justify the four laning of this road. So that also includes, this is our traffic forecast, um, without widening, segments are projected to reach a level of service F by the design year. The NEOCAT study, uh, which we mentioned earlier, was performed here, and the NEOCAT study found that this segment was currently at capacity in today's year. Um, the FDOT quality of service, a level of service handbook was just updated, and so this is a, a new update that we're presenting to you. 
um, for the segment SR50 to Cypress Lakes Glen Boulevard, the level of service E, which is the county standard now in C3C, and that's the C3C segment, is 19,530 ADT. So this indicates that that segment will be in failure without improvement. Uh, according to the Orange County Concurrency Management, Concurrency Management System, no additional capacity is available within the study segment at this time, and all the developments that are coming forward are being uh, asked to contribute their proportionate fair share for additional improvements. And these are, the map on the right shows you the current and the projected traffic counts for each of the segments. Oh, there we go. Uh, just to go over the Chuliota study, or the uh, Neocats study as it relates to this segment of road. Uh, the first map to your left shows that Neocats segments are currently near or over capacity. The map in the middle is the Neocats intersections at existing conditions, and you can see the red dots indicate that uh, we are at a level of service F. And uh, the map at the right shows, and, and we have several intersections that are failing, the map at the right shows what will happen in 2045, which was the design year for Neocats if the improvements are not done in this region. And as you can see, uh, both the SR50 and the Lake Pickett Road intersections fail. Additionally, ICE, or Intersection Control and Evaluation, was done as part of the Neocats study and both the uh, SR50 Chiliota Road and the Lake Pickett Chiliota Road intersections were included in that ICE evaluation. Moving on to future traffic conditions with the improvements, and as we can see in this map, uh, SR50 still continues to be somewhat of a problem. It is a state road. It is being widened. But we can see that Lake Pickett Road does improve to a, an acceptable level of service standard for the county, as do many of the other approaches to Chiliota Road. Um, no uh, roundabouts were proposed in the NEOCAT study for the two Chuliota segment intersections evaluated. As part of this study, which again is a design year a little bit later than the NEOCAT study, we asked the consultant to do a delay differential between traditional intersections and roundabouts. And the calculated de delay differential for the intersection of Lake Pickett Road and Chiliota Road shows that the roundabout would fail in the design year. However, it did not, the delay did not show that for Chiliota Road to Cypress Lakes Glen Boulevard. However, there are other considerations on this particular intersection. And roundabout was not recommended uh, due to school traffic and accommodation. We'll get into uh, that discussion in the next slide and approach speeds. For the ICE evaluation, the standard approach speed is 30 miles an hour, and as I mentioned, the uh, speeds, design speeds here are 40 and 45. And additional considerations, as I mentioned, the developments that exist on this road did already provide their right-of-way as part of their development plans, and we try to honor that uh, gift to the county, or it's not a gift, they do it for impact fees, but we try to honor that. And we did have some comments from the existing homeowners about cutting down additional trees and a lot of environmental concerns on this project. So, and the roundabouts would acquire right away in excess of what is there existing. A bit more conversation about the schools. Some of this information is just now available. As I mentioned, the Florida Department of Transportation is improving State Road 50. The first map on your left is the Corner Lake Middle School zone. All of that yellow area is the area that this middle school dispatches buses to address. It's quite a large area. The star is Corner Lakes Middle School. The red line is the segment of Chiliota Road in the study. As we move to the center drawing, these are improvements proposed by the Florida Department of Transportation. I'll draw your attention to the bottom left corner. There's a very large regional bus dispatch center there. Uh, if you can maybe see a little bit underneath the uh, shading, I tried to make it a little visible. Those are parked buses, and that uh, extends well beyond the bottom of the map. The Florida Department of Transportation will be building an access road to State Road 50. 
the traffic signal on State Road 50 that connects to this bus uh, service road will be signalized as currently a full median opening. And as you look, there's a segment that travels north. So follow your eye. This is 50, it is diagonal. Those two signals that are on 50 are the two signals that are in the center diagram. As you can see, that extension is uh, Corner School Drive. And corner, uh, you can see where the Corner Lake Middle School is. And that uh, when we have coordinated extensively with Orange County Public Schools and their primary comment currently is that their buses must be able to make reasonable left-hand turns on Chuliota Road. And if you look at the yellow on the map and you look at the intersection at the end of that extension that will occur once the uh, bus uh, dispatch center is uh, made more accessible and those trips are moved off of the high school and uh, Falcon Way to this road, you can understand the importance of their request. So this is the typical section that we uh, propose to improve this road. It will have four 11 foot wide travel lanes, two in each direction with a 22 foot raised median, both crafted to slow speeds on this road. Multimodal accommodations consisting of a six foot wide sidewalk on the west side and a 10 to 14 foot wide path on the east side of Chiliota Road. That 14 foot wide path is the East Florida Trail. We are uh, facilitating the right of way for that trail. It has always been part of this project. That trail will turn east off of Chuliota Road and proceed down into the Fort Christmas area. We will carry the 10 foot sidewalk south until we transition to the west side of the road with that 10 foot multipurpose path at that point to serve the Corner Lake Middle School and the public's plaza and the commercial developments along SR50. Um, multimodal accommodation, there will be on the opposite side, before and after the transition, a six foot sidewalk. Um, we will install a closed drainage system with stormwater treatment ponds. That will be an environmental plus for this area. It will attenuate the room, uh, stormwater runoff and will allow that water to be discharged appropriately in a, the condition needed to support the many uh, conservation areas along this corridor. And a nominal 120 foot right away is required and it can be accommodated almost completely within the existing right away. Well, we also propose median trees and lighting for the entire corridor. Uh, here are some access management changes that will occur. We will, uh, there are currently two full accesses for the public's plaza. We will be closing the southern access and that will be a right in, right out. That's to facilitate the widening. As you can see, we are adding several lanes. Um, one of the interesting facts about this intersection is it's a 50-50 almost intersection. Half of the traffic goes east to the greater Orlando area and half of the traffic goes west to the Space Coast, which is also a major employment center for Central Florida. Uh, we are adding several lanes. We will retain the north entrance to the public's plaza with a full median opening to facilitate their delivery trucks and for uh, customers who want to make a left-hand turn into that plaza. Here is a proposed change to Cypress Lake Gun Boulevard. Uh, this, uh, we're, we're doing that to um, consolidate traffic. Right now we have uh, this uh, road to the left, it's uncontrolled. Uh, in order to make this more functioning, particularly with the improvements uh, that will be done by DOT and the bus and school traffic that's anticipated, we can bring everything to a signalized intersection. This allows us to eliminate that road, which has been a source of some complaints, it carries a lot of school traffic, it's uncontrolled. We'll, uh, 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 this will allow us also to do a rather long um, left-hand turn lane into the uh, school road, and uh, which is needed. It will improve access to the school. It will, we will now have two signalized intersections, so rather than have totally uncontrolled access, we have no signal on 50. We have no signal that controls the school now. Both entrances to the school will be controlled by full signals. And it will improve operations along Chuliota Road. 
Uh, we are recommending two uh, pond sites. We looked at several sites. If you can note all the water there, we have a very high water table here. It's a challenge uh, to find pond sites. So we have a large pond site uh, in the middle of the project that uh, was uh, a church property that had come in for development and we have met with them. And then we have another pond site at the northeast corner of Chiliota Road and Lake Pickett is a private property owner and we have met with them. We have two uh, floodplain compensation ponds. Most of the southern part of this are the uh, east, but the bottom of this picture, a lot of it is in floodplain wherever you don't see buildings. And one very small, it's hard to see in the southern area where that uh, diagonal or uh, line is. Uh, that's a um, utility easement. And the other one is in the middle of the southeast property, just south of Lake Pickett and Chiliota Road intersection. So as I mentioned, there was very little uh, right away uh, needed because it had already been acquired during development review. And so the cost of the project is roughly $45.6 million, as shown in the yellow column. We did do public engagement on this project. We received calls and emails. Uh, we did the, the LPA and uh, BCC work sessions. We have a website. We sent out flyers. Um, we did publish uh, meetings in the newspaper. And we had several small group meetings on this area. So here's a list of some of the small groups meeting. This project began in August 2021. So we've met with the HOA, uh, we've met with commissioners, we had an LPA hearing, we now have a, we had a BCC work session, an LPA work session. Um, we met with DOT a number of times, both in person and in, uh, uh, digitally. Uh, Cross Life Church is the owner of the pond property. We've had several meetings with them and their representatives. Um, let me just move into this other one. I don't want to just read them all to you. Um, we had a, a Corner Lakes Garden Community Meeting. That's the new development that's coming in at the southwest corner. We met with them and provided comments and discussed uh, potential right-of-way acquisition with them. Uh, and we have uh, met with, as I mentioned, the property owner for the pond site on the northeast corner of Chiliota Road. And we had trail coordinated meetings, Orange County Public Schools, again, a number of times. So there are 20 some meetings there that we had. Here's the schedule for the project. We're here today in March. As I mentioned, we had uh, community meetings in September and December. And here's our summary. Uh, the project is consistent with a comprehensive plan. Here's the goals, policies, and objectives that apply. Chulota Road is a developing collector roadway, ultimately intended to connect State Road 50 and East Colonial Drive to Lake Pickett Road and Seminole County to the north. The RCA considered existing and future conditions and engineering criteria to anticipate future conditions and recommend a preferred alternative, which addresses access management for all modes. Chuliota Road is being designed as a four-lane urban roadway and will carry a significant volume of traffic in the future, including regional traffic. There's a new uh, continuous pedestrian bicycle facilities are proposed and will be of great benefit to this community. Uh, the county has engaged the public through a variety of means. Here is an anticipated schedule should the project uh, receive approval of the Board of County Commissioners. We anticipate uh, if the funding remains consistent that we would uh, be uh, finishing up construction in 2029-2030. And we request that the board find the Chuliota Road conceptual analysis study consistent with the comprehensive plan and approve the study and, in, to an, and give us approval to initiate design and right away acquisition for construction of this project. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you very much. So it's pretty comprehensive. Um, this is another administrative item today, no applicant uh, per se. However, I will open it up for public comment at this time. Uh, Mr. Conker, do we have any members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor, I have one speaker card, Tannen Teston. Please state your name and address for the record. You'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. I'm Tannen Teston. I'm 2249 Osprey Wood Circle. I'm a resident of Cypress Lakes community. I'm not opposed to the plan at all. I actually 
encourage um, well thought out growth. I've got three kids that are still in school and uh, the elementary, the middle school, and the high school. So to see additional sidewalks and street lights and uh, well planned, thought out, I appreciate it and, and I know we'll use it. So I'm not opposed to it at all and I understand that growth is happening and we've got to be proactive with it. Um, the only thing I, I am concerned with that I didn't see up there and I hopefully I'm bringing it up at the right time, I don't know if it's preemptive or not, but uh, the row of trees that go along 419 on the east side that are a growth that's been there for 20 years, building that buffer between the road and the residents that are there in Cypress Lakes, I can't imagine them being able to widen the road and add all these wonderful things that they're adding without taking down some of that growth, which um, not only provides that buffer of peace and quiet, but it kind of uh, lets the road, then it buffers out the noise. So I don't know if that's something that's been in consideration for the county or whoever's developing this project to replace those trees with something similar that grows fast, that grows high, that grows dense, so that we can keep the peace that those neighbors have had for the last 20 years. Okay, uh, Ms. Testa, which, which area did you say you lived in? Cypress Lakes. Okay, you do live in Cypress Lakes, okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, are there any other speakers? No other speakers, Mayor. Okay. Uh, then we'll close the public hearing, and this time we'll go to the District Commissioner, Commissioner Bonilla, for a potential motion. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, so, I have just a map for you here just to show the area, because I know it's kind of hard from the presentation to really, sorry to get pass on the clerk, thank you, to really show the area so you could get a good view of it. So I live or lived off of Chulieta Road at Corner Lake Estates and was on the HOA board there. I lived there from 2004 to 2013. I had to drive on Chulieta Road to leave my home. Like I had to because I was on that road. Um, I moved east of Chulieta Road in 2013 to now and I have to cross Chulieta Road in order to leave my home and then I drive down Lake Pickett Road to 50. So you can see the arrows here um, on the top right is where I live now. And I drive down Lake Pickett Road to leave my house. Um, however, to get back home, I always take, I go down 50 east, and then I go up Chulia Road, and Chuliota Road. And the reason why I do that is because the intersection at Lake Pickett and Percival is too dangerous. Um, but I'm happy to say we do have an RCA coming on that as well. Um, there are three schools, which are marked here in a yellow circle, uh, where children access Chulieta Road. There's an elementary school near the intersection of Cypress Lake North, that top yellow one in, uh, there on the right, a middle school in the middle there, and that's by School View Way, and a high school at the south dead end of Chulieta. My children have attended all three of these schools. Um, my youngest one is now at the high school. And I will say they have had to cross 50 there, and they are very scared to cross that, and so are many people who cross that. Um, I, since, as you can see, I go by there every single day, I see people there crossing, and then all of a sudden they start running because like the time is going out. Um, and I've seen multiple, multiple times where people almost get hit from someone turning onto 50 while they're trying to cross either on a bike or walking. Um, so I've driven this road almost every day for the last 20 years. I've helped turtles cross the road, both gopher tortoises and the snapping turtles. And I've stopped and waited for sandhill cranes to pass. I've watched cyclists, pedestrians, and other cars almost hit quite frequently. And I have seen several crosses appear on 50 and Chuliota intersection over the years, representing those who were hit and killed. Um, safety of all drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists are my highest priority. The crash data demonstrates many issues with the current state of the road. However, it doesn't represent all the almost accidents. And because of the schools along the road, there are over 100 pedestrians and cyclists crossing the roads daily, um, considered a large amount. New RCA scopes of work, um, I have a copy of the university one and the Lake Pickett ones, 
are inc now including the, in the Intersection Central Evaluation, which is ICE for short. However, this RCA, this Chuliota RCA, was submitted in 2021 and didn't include their evaluation for the safest intersection types, which there are many of different options, um, or ICE analysis, or SPICE analysis, which goes even, to, even deeper into the safety evaluation of the intersection. And I just wanted to read the report real quick of the NEOCATS that was mentioned that had ICE. Um, and it says, it is to be noted that a full ICE analysis was not conducted for this planning study, but provided a high-level screening analysis using CAPX at select intersections based on 2045 no-build alternative analysis for res results. So this NEOCATS did not provide an ICE analysis on all the intersections on Chuliota Road. Um, <clears throat> so um, through this RCA process, three HOAs were not engaged, and they are the ones with the right-of-way for the intersections. Only eight residents attended the community meetings. So I look forward to working with the staff to get the evaluations and analysis with engagement of the HOAs and community through additional community meetings over the next six months. My motion is to continue to July 25th to allow six months for the ICE and SPICE, not SPICE girls, <laughs> analysis with justifications and supporting documentation and community and HOA engagement, which I will personally be very involved with making sure that we get the community out because I was unfortunately disappointed that we didn't get that engagement from the community. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All right, uh, we, Commissioner Moore. I guess the question was for staff. Um, I'm just, a, I know we all want our roads quicker, so, so, um, and maybe it's for Commissioner Benny, I don't understand why we wouldn't have had a su sufficient uh, public engagement. Weren't the people notified, and, and how did that work? And then, Commissioner Benny, did you do anything to, to help you know, promote it on your Facebook page? Did you attend those meetings? I mean, because there's a lot of times something real important. I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and do my own communication to try to enhance what staff does. Yeah, I was, you know, there were newsletters that went out that were mailed, and I thought that would be enough, and it, unfortunately it wasn't. So, you know, I thought that's like the best way to reach people. It's going to their homes, but I should have known better because I threw out most of the mail I get. Um, so I'm... I'm looking at looking all, at all different ways that we could reach out. I'm even willing to knock on doors, call people, email, um, whatever I can, because we need a good amount of people to really have a good, you know, a good, re a good study. You need the community involvement, and you need a certain percentage of that community to have an effective study. And so why do you think it'll be different given six more months? Because I'll be involved in, like I said, knocking on doors and stuff like that. I'll make, and the H, so I did get... Um, you know, I thought the HOAs were being, you know, contacted through this process. Um, none of them were, none of them had been talked to before this was all completed. Um, and I actually have a message from one of the Corner Lake Estates HOA, and he, he's, I'm not going to read his message because he's very upset. Um, and he wants to, he wants to have this continuance and he wants to be more engaged, especially since it's affecting that community the most, they're cutting right through their community with this. And it's like, if you're cutting through their community, you really definitely have to talk to them. Well, come by my office, I'll show you my, my books on how I find my HOA people. I'll show you how I do that. Um, so to staff, so what would this do, this del delay, what that would do to the process? Well, first off, let me say that the HOAs were informed. They were informed of every community meeting. Um, we did talk to the HOA that did reach out back to us. Um, the, right now, we have already talked about right away, we have a property owner who is a single family person. He bought this house in retirement to build a home for he and his wife. Um, he, time is of the essence to him. He's retiring. And uh, we have met with the right away people. We've talked to real estate. So it delays the acquisition of the proposed pawn sites. Um, anytime we delay the acquisition of proposed pawn sites, that could open up uh, problems. Other than that, um, is there a way 
for her to have another meeting with, with some of these residents that could still impact the design. Just to answer your question directly, Commissioner, so if, if it's just a matter of additional outreach, we can certainly do that. Uh, if it's, again, simply going out, speaking to the community, having more outreach with uh, HOAs or anybody else, uh, you know, we can do that in the space of the next couple of months and then come back with, you know, generally the, the same recommendation. Um, if, if the only request is to have that engagement, we'll be more than happy to do that. So, yeah, that was part of my concern as well is, is six months too long? Is six months just right? If uh, Could we look at a shorter period of time if that's what we're looking for is a community engagement? That just seems like a long period of time to me. Well, I'll say that's a great question because I looked at the the FDOT and their scope of work for an ICE evaluation, and they also have uh, a list out of all the tasks that are needed for that and the amount of hours that's supposed to be required for that. And it really shouldn't take too long. The thing is that I'm concerned about um, not giving six months is that staff had said they would have to go back out into the procurement process in order to get that analysis done. So, sorry, so. Mayor, sorry. So I was only answering the question regarding going out for additional engagement. If, there, if, there, if the question then is, should we go through a full ICE evaluation and other intersection assessments, that's gonna require a change order to our current, current contract. That is a much longer time frame. So what will have to take place is negotiate a change order to the contract, go through procurement, and then start the project all over again. So six months is, is what I would estimate is the, is the minimum time frame for us to accomplish all that because we will have to go back to procurement and and that change order will have to come back to this board of county commissioners for your approval and, and with is there saying a cost starting to that all over again we already part of that ice is collecting all the data which is the majority of the time and the data had already been collected it just has to go through the analysis process so again what's the cost to that that's something we'd have to negotiate, but it, but it's more than just simply looking at ice because if we are talking about, for example, a roundabout, that is going to require additional right away. So that will have to be evaluated. That'll have to be costed out. The approaches to the roundabout will have to be different from the approaches to the intersections that we are recommending. So it's much more than just looking at um, you know ice evaluations for roundabouts or anything else. So. so it, it does affect the the lane configuration of what we are proposing now. So that, that will have to be addressed as well. In terms of cost, Mayor, uh, that's a negotiation that we'll have to go through, figure out how many additional hours are required, and the level of expertise from the consultant and uh, the subconsultant to um, go through this evaluation. So I, I can't give you an honest number as as to what that cost might be. The cost thus far has been approximately six hundred thousand dollars. But safety is our top priority. Vision Zero. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, did you have a question? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of issues that I'm I'm trying to sort out. So I think one, the the community involvement issue. I, you know, I like the responses. Like, oh, look, if we could still do that. But I think the bigger concern would be that if they had safety concerns that were not inherently evaluated in this evaluation process, then what? Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe that would be my question. Well, that's the thing. Like the, the ICE and SPICE analysis looks at several different types of intersections and the safety of them. And Before we get there, yeah. though, let's say, okay, let's just put that kind of to the side for a second. Let's just say, you know, we try to make sure that we're getting the input, right, before we get to additional analysis. Would there be opportunity um, at this stage of the design to incorporate potentially additional, even just feedback, knowing that these, these are residents that are living every day with some of these struggles? Because I think, you know, I mean, it, it, That's a I would like to know where the tipping point is, because we've gone out before to the community and then done an approval really quickly afterwards. I'm like, I don't know if they were even able to really incorporate any of these things. And then 
we kind of find down the road that there's a retrofit for some of the safety issues that were that were brought up and I just want to make sure that if there's a tipping point in this that would make the ideal situation to engage the public where is that and, and how do we make sure that we know where that is to flag for all of us yeah, I mean, they showed the process of this, which was that they have like a preliminary design and they, they put all their designs together in their study. Then they go to the community and based on that feedback, they go back through the design process again and try to implement changes and stuff and then they bring it to the board. The thing is that whole public engagement part, um, we didn't really get that. So a lot of the, the landowners who could give land for the ponds they were communicated with and they were talked with. But as far as the community meeting, there was only eight people that signed up. Um, the HOAs, you know, maybe they got the mailers or their property management company didn't tell them that, hey, this is what's going on, we need your engagement. Um, you know, that unfortunately, we did, just didn't get the public engagement that we should have had to have that going back around again, back to the design and you know, going through the analysis again. Although, Commissioner, I would add, just for the record, there were uh, at least, what, two fully noticed community meetings for the project? Yes. It may not have been well attended, but there were, th th those attempts were made. And, and they were sent not only to the HOAs, but the entire neighborhood. So th this was a pretty extensive notification that we did throughout the area. Yeah, there were over 2,000. And like I said, it's just, it didn't work. You know, we need to do other things in order to get people out there, which I'm willing to do. Huh? No. So what, what uh, if ultimately the, the motion is to continue this, you know, I guess the question I have is, what's the time period? It's, it's six months. Given what Commissioner Bonilla is saying, does that give you the time to address the issues? Do, from a staff perspective, do you feel like you already have the answers to these questions or, or what? That's, that's what I'm asking. So, so Mayor, uh, we, we've gone through uh, our analysis, our study. We feel that we have provided the board with our best recommendation in regards to how this road should be improved. Now, if then the question is that the board desires more information and go through a series of other analyses specifically related to intersection configurations and specifically to look at roundabouts or jug handles or other um, intersection designs that we don't feel are appropriate for this corridor, but if that's the board's direction, that's what we will do. My time frame of six, of six, mile, six months is just to get through the procurement process. So then there'll be additional time to go through and do the additional analysis. So that, that's six months plus, it might, might be nine months. Like this is just my estimation based on how long it takes us to get through negotiations and to get through the procurement process. Mayor, if I may, um, just in terms of the timeline, and, and I know that the term continuance was, was tossed out, um, it would be more appropriate just to cancel the hearing, give staff the time to do the appropriate analysis and you know follow consistent with board direction, have those community meetings, and then just bring it back when it's ready. We'd re-advertise the hearing at that point. Okay, uh, Commissioner Scott, I see you. you uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just as, uh, and John, if you could you know kind of elaborate if I say this wrong. So from my notes, um, you said that we could still move this project forward uh, and request an additional study as part of the final design, but it would add you know, a few months, about approximately three months, and a, potentially an additional cost to the project based on our meeting prior to this board meeting, the briefing. I, I think some of the discussion, uh, perhaps I think two different issues. Um, one, and I know Mr. Nastasi spoke to sort of the additional community outreach and engagement, and certainly that can happen in the context of the design study itself. And I know Commissioner Wilson, we're working on Reams Road and you know, sort of facilitating some additional community outreach during the design phase. And there can be some adjustments to the corridor and some intersection you know, geometries and configurations as part of that final design. Even the introduction of some safety enhancements into the corridor and other types of amenities, those are all details that sort of come out of the final design phase. I think where there may be some concerns about the overall um, scope and recommendations of the project to the extent that you uh, start to introduce uh, major changes, additional right-of-way um, that may be needed, such as with roundabouts, et cetera, that's where I think there may be some reservations or hesitancy to 
uh, request approval today and then have something that comes out of design be completely different. Because um, ultimately, we are going to have to go to right of way, especially with the introduction of uh, potentially int potential introduction of roundabouts that may have a different physical footprint than some of the intersections that were identified and ultimately recommended by staff. So, again, I think it depends upon the, the scope creep in the design phase and whether or not that there should be a recommendation uh, of that preferred alternative from this board. Understood. I'm happy with that answer. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I think they already answered your question, right, Commissioner Wilson? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Bonilla, is the motion then to, to, to cancel and we'll allow staff to do some due diligence here and at some point they'll bring it back? Second, Scott. Oh, okay. oh, I already made a motion at a time for the table to continue to join okay. the 25th. I hadn't called for the motion. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna <laughs> but, there's, but there's already a motion. <laughs> I know you all were talking, but I hadn't actually called uh, for the motion. There's, a, there's already a, a motion, though, and so I'm curious of what, if you could repeat what you mean by can, canceling. So a, a continuance um, would, would obviously continue it to date certain, so we would have to take up the hearing on July 25th. Uh, for reconsideration. And so I think what Mr. Stasi indicated is there's no way for us to be able to complete the additional uh, procurement uh, amendments to the contract, updates to the analysis, the public outreach by July 25th. So again, because of the uncertainty of the length of time, mm -hmm. it would be staff's recommendation, if that's the board direction, to um, cancel the hearing today, uh, which would then allow staff whatever time it takes to, to, to and obviously we'll work, staff would work closely with your office regarding that outreach, and then we would just simply advertise for a new public hearing when it's ready to be brought forward. Okay. Yeah, the thing is I put July 25th because that was the last date on our calendar that we had in a BCC meeting, so I couldn't put it any further out than that. Um, so do I make a motion for the cancel, or do we just cancel? Mayor, we could... If, um the seconder of the motion is okay. We could have the motion withdrawn, and then uh, you make another motion to they cancel, another, make another to motion cancel, cancel the, the hearing, and that it will be re-advertised uh, for a future date whenever we get through with all that exercise. Okay. Um, do you agree? I withdraw my second. Okay. So I withdraw the motion, and I make another motion to cancel the public hearing. I second. Okay. That. Now we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. A motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. Uh, this is item F13. We'll open the public hearing on this item. Uh, Lucas Boyce is going to be uh, presenting this item. Yes, sir. Mr. Boyce. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, commissioners and mayor. Thank you for the time you've set aside this afternoon for us to facilitate a public hearing on towing fees. While I will serve as the spokesperson, this entire process has really been a collaborative effort that includes Alan Marshall, Scott Chevenel, um, Jason Reynolds, Janika Johnson with the county administrator's office, Elise Vieira with the county administrator's office, and multiple people from Scott Scraven's team who've assisted us with their data collection for the information that we're going to provide for you today. This is an overview of how we'll spend our time this afternoon. As a general approach, we're going to begin with the end in mind and frame this public hearing in terms of the desired outcome. We will briefly review relevant items with respect to the two and a half year journey of discovery and research to just refresh your memory. We'll then walk you through our deep dive analysis of the industry's request on a 3% uh, request to add a 3% processing and finance fees to credit card and debit card transactions. We'll review the new fees that you devised recommendation on the matter for your consideration. 
So to begin, the purpose today is to consider amending Chapter 35, Article 2 of the Orange County Code related to trespass towing, non-consensual towing, and vehicle mobilization. We will provide the opportunity for you to address towing industry cost increases, while also providing an opportunity for you to continue your mandate to maintain public safety, protect the health, the safety, and the well-being of our residents from predatory towing practices and protect the rights of private property owners when those rights are violated. In terms of our background, the county's ordinance, Chapter 35, which governs towing fees, was established in 1998 and has had four revisions over the course of time. In 2001, rates were updated for both trespass and non-consensual tows. In 2005, a rate increase was requested by the industry, but that need was not substantiated at that time. In 2008, a comprehensive review and revisions to certain non-consensual tow rates were adopted. The last updates were adopted on Tuesday, September 9th, 2014. They included small adjustments to the rates for non-consensual tows and when the wrecker has to wait more than 30 minutes at the scene. It's been nine years since the ordinance has been reviewed and updated. And as a reminder, the industry originally reached out to county administration in July of 2021. The industry's reason for a request to update their fees is because of the operational increases in costs that have skyrocketed dramatically over the course of the last nine years. We've provided detailed information on each expense in previous work sessions, so I'll just briefly go through them for you here today. An increased cost in specialty insurance premiums. There's only a few companies across the state that provide insurance to towing companies, increased cost of, of actual capital intensity. A $50,000 truck in 2014 now cost $110,000 in 2023. An increased cost because the state has mandated that for third party certified mailings to notice lien holders that they have to use a third party to do this, and that's an increase in cost. With the advancements in technology, new methods and equipment are now required to tow newer vehicles. The increased cost for training to ensure the workforce is appropriately um, enabled and trained to be able to provide the towing services that our residents and consumers need. And as we've all experienced an increase in fuel costs, especially over the last few years with rising inflation, the industry reports an increase in fuel costs over the course of the nine years previous as well. <coughs> Our journey of discovery and research uh, began 19 months ago, and I'll just walk you briefly through our, our last two work sessions and what we um, provided for you. The first one was on September 27th, 19, or 2022. We did a background on the latest revisions and walked you through the timeline of history. We did a benchmark analysis of private property trespass tows throughout the municipalities in peer counties and across jurisdictions throughout the state. We did that same analysis for you on non-consensual trespass tows. And Kurt Peterson with the Office of Management and Budget provided a consumer price index analysis to tell us what the fee would be today if we went back to 2014 and applied that calculation. We provide analysis and evaluation of the increasing costs and expenses that towing industry representatives presented to us. And then at our second work session held on January 24th, 2023, we reviewed the specific provisions in the ordinance that help protect consumers to provide greater understanding. We did a deep dive into the actual market, the towing industry, and provided data and information from a national, state, and local perspective. We reviewed and did again our benchmarking and comparison analysis by county, municipality, and throughout the jurisdictions to update those. The toy industry had a new proposal that we evaluated for you, provided analysis, and then provided recommendations for your consideration. The recommendations for consideration that you adopted on January 24th, 2022, are what I'm gonna go over now. And just real simply, for classes A through D, the next four slides represent the changes that you had consensus over on January 24th of this year. The form, format for all is the same. We have the current rate on the left and the updated rate that was a consensus of you all on January 24th. We did this for class A. 
We did this for class B. We did the same for class C and also the same for class D. We also, you decided on January 24th to accept the industry's proposal to add a $40 fee for the use of dollies for class A non-consensual toes only. You also accepted the proposal from the industry on administrative fees with the caveat of a $5 increase instead of a $10 increase at that time. The only outstanding issue from our last work session was the industry's proposal to add a 3% finance or processing fee to any tow that needs one that uses a credit or debit card transaction. To start our research, we put together a chart that lists the current fees for notable merchants that towing companies throughout Orange County use. They range from between one to three and three and a half percent. Then we charted the processing fees for notable banks and ATMs across the county. Uh, according to our industry representatives, uh, at one of our last conversations, they indicated that towing companies across the county begin to promote cash transactions and have actually begun installing ATMs in their stores for consumers to use those, um, the, use the ATMs to pay in cash. So when consumers go to retrieve their vehicle and they go to a tow company that has an ATM, they can generally expect to pay about $2.50 on the final bill. In terms of benchmarking whether other entities utilize processing fees, we reached out to constitutional officers, Orange County department heads, and municipalities throughout the county. Of the six constitutional officers that we reached out to, 50% do not charge a fee and 50% do. Of those that do, it's the tax collector's office, the sheriff's office with the caveat that it's actually a flat fee of $1.75 because of the, for the, for only for public records requests and then the Orange County Clerk's Office at $3.50 for their transactions. In terms of the departments that make up Orange County government, none of the 11 departments benchmark charge a processing or finance fee. Of the 13 municipalities throughout the county, we were able to connect with 11 to gather data. Of the 11 municipalities that we connected with, 54% do not collect fees and 45% do. As for your question regarding the transaction rate between cards and cash for towing companies across Orange County, we reached out to 196 companies and got a response rate of 30% or 59 companies that participated in our research gathering and data collection. Of the companies that responded, 58% of them reported most of their transactions in the last year uh, were either cash or check. 42% of those companies that responded reported that most of their transactions last year were either debit or credit cards. So given the results of our extensive research and, and data and fact finding, uh, that Orange County, and, and, and the, the fact that most Orange County towing companies' transactions are already either in cash or they're promoting cash through ATMs, we're rescinding our, um, our recommendation on the 3% finance and processing fee. Our new recommendation for you to consider today is to apply a flat fee. Why? Applying a flat fee rate, we believe towing transactions would, be, would better protect consumers from excessive bottom line costs to retrieve their vehicle. We asked the industry reps if they'd be amenable to this compromise and they indicated that they would. They proposed to apply a flat rate of $5 on all fees and transactions up to $500, and 2% on any transaction using a debit or credit card over $500. Staff recommends for your consideration today for a flat fee of just $2 on all transactions up to $500, and 0% on anything over $500. Now, what you see on the screen before you now are just some examples from classes A through D on what consumers would expect the total bill to be at different intervals utilizing our revised staff recommendation. We've also included scenarios utilizing the industry's proposal so you can see the difference in cost savings for consumers. 
In conclusion, we note that for this final slide for consideration the requested action. Thank you for the opportunity to facilitate this public hearing. And with that, we conclude our presentation and await your direction and final steps. Thank you very much for your time. All right, Lucas, uh, why did you go from the $5 to the $2? Well, since they were already utilizing ATM and promoting that, um, and we did a quick analysis, and $5 actually is 3% on some of these um, um, final bills and our different intervals and different scenarios that we ran. So we decided to not go half, but to go to two while we give them some relief because we know that merchants are in effect charging them for all the different batches of transactions that they run through their system. Um, but to, in order to protect consumers and to also provide balance, um, we decided to go with a $2 fee. And then as it relates to over $500, most of your $500 transactions are gonna be class D. Those are huge record trucks or huge buses. There's not a lot of those types of transactions that take place across the county. So we felt comfortable not adding another fee to someone who's already paying a lot of money if, they have to, if they're in that situation. Uh, so we went ahead and recommended a zero uh, fee for anything over $500. Okay, Commissioner Wilson. I just had a quick question um, about the ATMs that was set up. Uh, so obviously that is to encourage the cash transaction, which creates all kinds of, you know, potential abuse in my head, not because I think that the entity itself is, but because I think sometimes everyone's had people that work for them and you're not sure what they're doing when you've got your back turned in. Um, what is the um, disclosure to within, the, and, and we may have already talked about this, so I apologize, yeah. but um, within the ordinance the disclosure to anybody that may be at the business itself as they go to check out, that they know that this is the fees that are locked in. Yeah, when you call the company um, to get your car, they have to give you at that point exactly what it would be, and they have to provide a line item receipt of every little charge. So if it's a base fee of 135 and there's it's three dollars a mile and it's five miles, that's fifteen dollars. If it's over 48 hours, it's twenty five dollars a day, so that's another fee. So they have to line item those and tell you what those are, and then you go pick up that, so that you so know before you to... go what the rate will be that you pay. But that, does, I guess, but that doesn't include merchant fees because in the ordinance right now, all of these types of fees are prohibited. Okay, and why, I think it didn't really okay. get to my question also. Commissioner, which was, I'm sorry. just I'm real sorry. quick, you know, process-wise, I did forget to, I gotta open the public hearing <laughs> part of, so we were kind of jettisoning to, to the thing in here. All right, so we do have to open the public comment period at this time. Do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, yes, Mayor, I have uh, eight names on the speaker cards. Uh, first up is Garrett uh, Paquette, to be followed by Ken Neeland, and then uh, Dennis Johnson. You'll have two minutes each. Please state your name and address for the record, please. I would say good afternoon, but it's almost good evening. Um, my name is uh, Garrett Paquette, uh, 12811 West Colonial Drive, Winter Garden, Florida. Uh, have been a member of the towing community. I'm the second generation. My son is the third. We've been in this county for uh, 53 years operating our business. Um, I have to say that, you know, going from our rate increase in 2014 um, to what is proposed in uh, September, uh, we'll see a 51% increase in the cost of just minimum wage. Uh, so taking that in consideration, imagine what it costs for us to hire operators. Uh, in, for, from 2014 to 2022, I have seen a 93.83% increase in my property taxes which makes me your customer. And that means in that amount of time, you have raised my rate 93%. And understanding the meeting today, I get it. I understand completely. And God bless you people. That's all I can say. Um, cost, cost of trucks in the same time period has gone up 85.99%. Uh, so the only thing I have to say about the, you know, the proposed transaction fee, we don't have an ATM machine in our office. And per county ordinance, we're required to take two, two forms of payment, and, and that is required by ordinance. Um, the proposed rate increase, honestly, it's not enough. 
I mean, for us to remain profitable in this county as, as everything increases, uh, fuel, insurance, employees, we have to take away from something and increase uh, is pennies, really, if you take into consideration how much it, is co it costs us to run our business on a day-to-day -day basis. And I just wish that you would reconsider the rates and, um, you know, probably what we need is we need a substantial rate increase because you've seen the contracts for building roads come up and how much it's costing them to actually build the roads and what it costs the county. And I think that we are, we are due the same respect. And uh, that's really all I have to say. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Good evening. My name is uh, Ken Nealon, 5601 uh, Orange Blossom Trail, Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm here today also to, to uh, recommend that you guys reconsider the rate increase, uh, looking at uh, multiple things. Um, as Garrett had said, the, the rate of equipment has gone up. What, what cost us $80,000 in 2019 will cost us upwards of 125000 this year. Uh, insurance goes up by 22% every year, whether you have claims or not. Uh, fuel is at an all-time high. Uh, so as long as, as well as recommending that we, we reevaluate what the rate increase would be, uh, you know, 15% from where we're currently at now, adding a CPI index increase at 3% annually for the, to protect the industry moving forward would be uh, crucial. But to be specific in regards to the credit card fees, uh, you know, a lot of uh, banking establishments will charge you 250, uh, but that's just on one end of it. The ATM provider is going to charge you whatever fee they charge. A lot of private ones can charge up to six dollars per per transaction. So that amount would go from 250 to 850 per transaction, um, and then three percent really just protects the the industry from while well, we're taking those and we're battling people that are. Um, you know, refusing or, or saying that they, they didn't authorize the charges and we're disputing charges and we're going back and forth. It just protects us in the future. Um, but most importantly, taking a, another look at what the rate and, and what comparable rates in areas around us are charging. Uh, you know, Orange County is, is one of the lower counties in the area and uh, there's a reason for, for, for why certain companies are struggling to stay in business today. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments, and uh, next speaker, please. After uh, Mr. Johnson, we'll have Clarence Riley to be followed by Adam Ayed. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Dennis Johnson, Johnson's Record Service, uh, 580 Wilmer Avenue, Orlando, Florida. Floridian, born and raised right here in Orlando. Grew up, my father started our business in 1967. We're in West Orange County. Second generation, we're still there today. Mom and dad's still kicking, God bless. Um, we're really struggling. I mean, last time we've been in here was 2014. You've got to understand, that's been a long time. Since then, we got hit in 2017. There is a great article that Insurance um, Journal put out uh, about the insurance companies, and they actually seen an increase of 100 to 150% in one year. That's 2017. We got hit at about 2 or 130% that year, Okay. So keep going. We struggle through that. We keep going. COVID hits. Central Florida economics got killed. We've never seen that for several months. We went from doing an 80 to 100 calls a day to doing 8 to 12 in a 12-hour period. And that lasted for about three or four weeks and slowly climbed back. So after we start getting that back going, we have the 2021 inflation. Understand everything. Just like the gentleman before me said, we're seeing 100% increases since 2014. The increase that was proposed up here is not enough. You have to understand. The increase is really going to go to help cover insurance, but it's also going to help pay higher wages for our employees. New 2022 poll out of law enforcement officers, firefighters, EMS, and roadway workers Towing is the number one deadliest job in the United States. Back in, I can find data from 2019, it was the second deadliest job. Understand the rates you put today will affect the workers that are out there working the deadliest job in the United States on our roadways. 
please take that in consideration. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Clarence Riley. Good evening, ma'ams and sirs. Um, <clears throat> my name is Clarence Riley. I run a small towing company um, here in Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm starchly, completely against any increases. The bottom line is, it's always time, it's always, the time is always right to do right. And no, I'm not smart enough to think of that. But someone's a lot smarter with a, use a lot of eloquent terms than me. It's not the time to raise, because the bottom line is, who's going to get hit? The poor, the weak, the voiceless, the unconnected, Johnson Records and all the other big ones. They're the ones who are getting hit. It's easy for you to sit there with a, a, a American Express black and you're like, hey, just raise it up. Who's getting hit? Towing, as a retired state correction officer, one of the things, and let's tell Disney this, you can come to Orange County, get out of prison for molesting kids, go buy a tow truck, don't even get to buy one, and go and ride around, and yeah, you know, I can get all the kids. Well, well let's regulate. Let's, let's straighten the, uh, the industry up first before we start saying, let's put money and help a evil empire flourish. Towing is one of the most unregulated industries in America. Who, who get hit? It's not you all. It's the poor, the weak, the voiceless. It ain't got nothing to do with fairness. There's people on this board look just like me. They have always moved the, the goalposts. Black African Americans have always been included since Jim Crow and towing. You can't dispute that. Who get hit? An uh, industry that's been, is predicated on corruption and power and racism and greed and exclusion. If you feel good about saying, hey, let's watch it flourish, go ahead. But we're here for not just our personal interest, my money. Guess what? I, I filled up this morning, it was 50 cents cheaper for the gas. <laughs> okay. Oh, All right, thank you, Mr. Riley. Okay, so, and that's my point. I um, start against any increases on anything. All right, we got your point. Thank you. Mayor, just for point of clarification, I, does he own a tow business, or I, I didn't hear that first part of his introduction? Sir? He's, <laughs> he said he has a small tow business. You have a tow business, and you're against the increase. Just Yes, I'm, I'm, yeah, very much, 100%, 120% against. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Adam Ayat with AAT at Orlando. Uh, we operate at a 9712 Recycle Center Road, Orlando, Florida. Uh, zip code 32824. We uh, actually not opposed to any changes concerning our industry. Uh, I think we need the, like Mr. C. Riley said, we need to pay a little bit more attention to where we are uh, changing here. I'd like to pedal back, and I would like to distinguish between non-consensual towing and the trespass towing. Here's why. From a constituent uh, standpoint, the trespass towing, or private property towing, I would say, uh, does not have the same image as we do on the non-consensual towing. Here's why. I'm gonna call it also the police towers. Police towers, when they go up to an assignment, they have to be available 24 hours a day. They have to have a certain uh, equipment and personnel available to actually respond to that police arrest or that accident. This is the turnpike bid. This is the scope of services. This is what we require to have on us and what we require to provide in order for us to be able to operate, whether the Florida turnpike or any of the Florida roads. So, as opposed to non trespass tow, get a tow truck, get basic insurance, and start working. You set your own hours. As a police tower, I have to be available 24 7. I have to have benefits for my employee. As far as actually providing a retention plan for my employees, that's besides the cost of workman's comp insurance and everything else that uh, we spoke about. 
the nature of the response, it's different. So both line of business that require the same equipment. I would like for you to look at it from that perspective. They both use tow trucks. The specification or the, the uh, specification of the duties are completely different. The equipment itself or the equipment requirement is different between both of us. Thank you very I, much. I just, I just wanted to clarify. Yes, sir. Are you in favor of the recommended? I'm in favor to any change that would benefit our industry. However, I think we need to separate both of them. I don't think they should go together in the same rate increase because uh, it's cost driven from my perspective and constituent driven from your perspective. So separate out which part of it? Separate the rate increase or separate them completely. Separate the rate increase to the consensual versus the trespass stone. I can okay. They're, they're so, already articulated by the types of tow. I mean, it, it's each tow by category, so consensual rates. Not it's all in the last presentation, if I'm not mistaken, right? It's it, so. It's, so can you clarify? In so in a police tow, for instance, nine times out of ten, it's reimbursable by the insurance company or paid for by the insurance company. I'm not concerned about a credit card fee. It, it is a charge that you know obviously it needs to be passed on to somebody. Yeah, Commissioner Wilson, this was actually your uh, concern last week or last month when we actually, uh, yes. So uh, the uh, $10 or $11, that is too little too late, really. I mean, it, it doesn't really cover anything for us. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. In today's world, if I have a Tesla in my uh, place of business that was picked up as a result of an accident, I have to dedicate a certain space for it. I have to cover it in order for it not to catch fire. It takes 16,000 gallons to actually uh, put the fire on that Tesla. And it happened to us, Mr. Garrett, I, I've seen it on the internet, I, we haven't spoke about it, but I've seen it on the internet. Versus a regular vehicle that take, only takes 600 gallons of water to actually put it down. So I have, to tarp, I have to buy a blanket for it, and I have to put it in a separate place. So that, I mean, we incorporate that into our cost. So. Uh, besides, when we go out, I can show you the, uh, the bid, the turnpike bid. It requires us to do cleanup, remove and clear all incident scene vehicles, cargo, debris, non-hazard vehicle fluids from all affected travel lanes. Why would you give me the same rate as the gentleman that picked up a vehicle from a parking lot and take it to his impound yard, and now all he has to do is just collect the charges? I go out there, I'm available 24-7, Provide the insurance, work when it comes for my employees, which I have, I have to have them uh, background checked. We train our guys. We work uh, very closely to the, to the fire department, with the fire department and police departments, each and every one. We probably provide similar training, not the same training, similar training. We pay for our equipment, which, we, which is as expensive as store truck, I mean uh, fire trucks. In today's world, a regular piece of equipment they used to cost five hundred dollars, five hundred thousand, back in sixteen. Today is a million dollars. Okay, so actual numbers. I, I'm gonna. <laughs> okay, yeah, you answered the question I had. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have any other members of yes, the public? Yes, Mayor. Our last three heard? speakers are Brian Taylor, Jennifer Taylor, and Shem Clark. Good evening, Commissioners and Mayor. I appreciate you taking the time to hear uh, the towing industry's uh, issues and trying to correct some Just give pricing. us your name and address, though, for the record. Yes, sir. My name is Brian Taylor at 6366 All-American Boulevard, um, and I am speaking in favor of the motion. Um, basically, I keep it pretty short. I know everyone wanting to get home, do other matters. Along the short is our cost of doing business has gone up dramatically. Since 2014, direct costs of doing business have gone up nearly 75%. Mainly that is in insurance. We are in a very bad area to insure trucks. We're in one of the worst areas in the country to insure a commercial motor vehicle. <clears throat> this is due to the expansion of, of our area and the uh, multifamily and additional cars that we see day to day in our community. The additional traffic creates additional 
delays and concerns. The bottom story, bottom line here is, is we really do need some help. Every other uh, financial partner that I have in the towing industry, we go to them and ask for a rate increase based on showing them the cost of doing business has gone up. We're before here, before you guys here today to ask for the same. That's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. The next speaker. Shem Clark. Please state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Shem Clark, uh, 1611 North Forsyth Road, Orlando, Florida. I'm an employee of Tri-County Towing. I agree with the rate increase, um, and the specific reasons why is that we do mostly police tows. A lot of things that we're doing in these tows, we need the equipment, we need the supplies to clean the road, to keep better employees, which has helped us over the years in the 10 years I've been working there. It is very, very critical to our company that these increases happen. Thank you. That's it. Have a good evening. All right. Uh, when you say you support the rate increase, are you saying what was proposed? Yes. For the, for the reasons why, if it would be higher, yes, but if that's what you guys are proposing that we can have, <laughs> then I appreciate it, you know. I'm sorry. So. Uh. All right. Uh, all right. I just wanted to clarify yes, what sir. you were saying. Thank you very much. No problem, sir. Thank all right. You. Next speaker, please. There are no other speakers, Mayor. All right. Now that uh, we did get through the public comment period, if there's no further public comment, uh, then I'm going to close the public hearing at this time. And uh, we do have questions. I think the questions primarily for staff. So, Mr. Boyce, uh, you know, stand by for questions and. Uh, we'll start. Commissioner Wilson, I think you have started down the path of asking a question. <laughs> I did. I didn't want to get lost in the shuffle, so I appreciate the information. I think what I was thinking about was something actually to also protect the businesses. I know what you're saying is they have to identify the rates that are to be expected. I got that part. But I was thinking, and, and especially with these updates, and I, and I would be really actually um, knowing that there seems to be some continued dialogue about this, and it's been this big, long stretch, is, you know, maybe we do make it sort of a, an annual revisit at least for um, an update from somebody in staff to, sure. to give us knowing that this has been a very different year for for expenses that um, was one of our proposals last year was to add a yearly review where there would be a cpi adjusted rate well that, automatically that, a and cpi that was, adjusted rate is very different okay. than having some data and so you know one of those things is a little more predictable for consumers um, the other one isn't because they're also riding the wave so um, I, you know, I, I would be comfortable with doing the, the review of, of the data and looking at what those cost points are and how, you know, the, in the revenue streams and doing an analysis. I think that's a, you know, that's a, a lift for us because we need to see what, what the outcome is. But the part that I was going to ask about with the detailed about the ordinance um, is because I do think it's easier to, to work in cash for a lot of businesses. So I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, discouraging that is the intent. But if there's something that you're able to post at your business that shows what the rates are, that we say, you know, we, you know, we publish that, or it's got the Orange County seal on it and it goes up, it provides actually a modicum, I think, of security for everybody. And so I know, I was going to say, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, it's up to the mayor, but I want to, I just want to, you know, find out if there's a way to be able to, whatever we do, lay it out and have, um, you know, that as part of the disclosures anywhere you go, right? So just a, just, just a post to disclosure, not anything super fancy. Okay. Uh, we hear you. Uh, at some point, obviously, <laughs> we are going to have to revisit this. Just the only question is how soon, you know, and the goal is to, uh, you know, these uh, hearings take up a significant amount of staff time and uh, industry time and, and board time. So if we could figure out a way to try to reduce that but create equity for these uh, industry uh, leaders, we would try to do that. So uh, we hear what you're saying. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. Um, Lucas, great yes, job always. You are uh, very good at being patient and going through this. I want to take a moment. Um, it's great to put a face to a name in the trucks and the side of the trucks that we see all around town. So congratulations for you guys surviving um, this economic challenge we've been through with COVID. Um, I do have point of clarity and one of the gentlemen spoke 
when it's non-consensual, right? We, we, you, Lucas, you and I really dove into this because we were, we were kind of under the assumption that when there's an accident, you guys hear a call that police has gone out or so forth. Um, I, we both agreed that before we even called our insurance companies, you guys were there to offer a tow. So my question goes a step further that says, let's just say you guys tow me, but I am insured. Okay, so I have car insurance that covers my towing. Do I still pay this fee or does it go to my insurance coverage that would take care of it? And I've already seen the yes. Okay, so you don't have to answer, Lucas. Um, you know, when we first heard about this, um, here we are making decisions and we don't live your life or live your business, okay? And when I have reflected on this from 2014, what we have seen inflation happen. You guys are not exempted from inflation. And I look at the numbers and the percentage, which are single digits, of what we're talking about increases, I actually think it's more reasonable now that we've heard. And, and I think one of the biggest weights that you guys carry is insurance. Um, insurance um, coming from a business owner and construction can really strangle you because if you can't afford that liability and that bonding, you're out of business, right? And there's, and it's one of those things you have to prove it first and come with it later. And, um, and I'm understanding and I actually want to commend you for doing your due diligence. Um, the first time we talked about this, I don't feel that there were real industry hands-on folks here. It was more an industry that represents you. And it's harder. You know, you, you guys pay dues and all that, and I understand that. But hearing your stories, you guys all have families. And I always say when you're a business owner, it's not just you and your employees. It's your employee spouses, your employee's children. That weight you carry on your back. And at the end of the day, you're in business to make a profit. And we shouldn't strike that down. Um, I do know the insurance industry has also become challenging because they make it really tough for you guys to, to make money. But um, I've worked on cases when I worked at the federal government where we've seen many of you all pass doing your job for drivers not paying attention. So it is a liability on you guys too where you put your life out. So in hindsight now as we've taken it all in, I actually feel that these are reasonable. I appreciate the flat fee because as one owner said, you are usually dealing with folks that when they go out, they're not hoping, they're not expecting to get towed. And when you get towed and you're going out, um, but I also think that if you park where it says don't park, um, we'll tow you is also part of self-responsibility. So I'm really torn between this, but if I felt this was going 300% higher or even staying in tune with what you guys, your overhead has gone, I would be, but I feel that actually these are quite reasonable at the end of the day um, because, you know, if I, own a, if I own a property and you're on my property and I call a tow company, it's my right, my property right. So um, I was a little concerned on the non-consensual part. Now that that's been cleared up, it makes me feel better. But on the part where you are making a decision to park erroneously or leave your car, and by the way, when I was younger, I did that, you know, no judgment. But um, it's, a, it's a heavy haul to fill, you know. Um, but I would like, I do appreciate that flat rate because you guys know that things can get out of, you know, you go out one night, you don't even know you got towed until you're leaving the club or wherever establishment you've been. Um, and so then you're like, oh, no, where's my car? The last thing I'm thinking is look at the barcode on the side to find out where my car is. You're calling the police. You're trying to figure out what's happening. There's a lot that goes on. Um, so one last question is normally when you have tow zones, is there a, like a, a mileage limitation? Because you know, the last thing I want to hear is I got towed on Sand Lake road and the tow truck, you know, where storage is in Sanford. So yes, you guys please. drove from Sanford, from Sand Lake to Sanford, yeah. which would be 40 something miles times three. I'm, you know, yes, ma'am. So any population of 500,000 uh, or over. It's a 15 mile radius. You can't tow outside of that. Um, if, uh, sorry, 10 miles. 10 miles. Sorry, for 500,000 and below, it's 15. Yeah. Okay. All right. But appreciate you guys all coming out. Yeah. And I appreciate you guys coming out here and sitting through our other stuff so that you'll see the value in us too. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Commissioner Bonilla.
Uh, thank you. I actually even forgot I pressed my button because this was so long ago. <laughs> um, so I actually have a question on the signs, and this is, you know, hopefully you can answer this. So if I'm going to a restaurant, because now, you know, we're trying to do less parking spots, they're labeled, okay, this parking spot's for this restaurant, this parking, there's like three maybe for this one restaurant, and then the next three spots are for the next door restaurant to that restaurant, and saying that these three parking spots are now for that restaurant. And, you know, so I always try to park in the right spot, because underneath it says you could be towed. Um, and that's in our ordinance, all that language and how tall the letters are, it's all prescribed in, in the each, ordinance. Yeah, in each spot, there's the restaurant and underneath the you will be towed. But how do they know what restaurant you're in? Well, when you're towed and you knew where you were towed, you look at that sign and it has to have the name of the towing service and their number so you know who to call. Yeah, but what if I am, I am in the restaurant that I'm parked for, am I, how do they know that I'm in that restaurant? Like, how do they sure. decide to tow? Like, does the well, restaurant call? The restaurant has or? to call okay. um, the tow company. They watch people and go in and then go grab their cars. They have to be initiated by the property owner. It's all documented, and the tow truck company comes out and takes the car, all the information, and then within 30 minutes of them getting back to the tow yard, they have to report that tow to the um, local law enforcement and the sheriff's office. So they, they can always call the, the number or go to the... Um, QR code and know who called or who towed their company, but if those is you don't have to actually pay for the car if there's or to, you can get your car, put up a bond in court, and it will be settled by court. And put so you can still get your court? car. Mm -hmm, it's in our. It's yep. That means you have to deposit cash into the court. Yeah, you you set a bond with the court. You can get your car, so it's not staying there while you work this out, and it goes to court, and the judge decides and. Um, of course, if, if it was if you're proven to be wrong and it, you were in the wrong, it goes there. And if it wasn't, well, you already got your car and you get your money back. Wow, that's a lot of work to. It's have all in our ordinance. Yep. Our, that's, wow, that's a lot of work to. It's have all in our ordinance. Yep. Our, that's what that consumer protection does. What that consumer it. protection does. Yeah, so, it's not yeah. much consumer protection because <laughs> you still have to put out the money and then you have to go to court and it takes you away from your job and. Sure, it's but crazy. you get your car and you don't have to wait for that whole process to go through to get your vehicle. Yeah, you could get to work, but then you can't go to work because you have to go to court instead. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lucas and uh, company, thank you guys for the work you've done on this. Um, I, I just, I was good with the, the changes that were presented in the last I was good with the, the changes that were presented in the last county commission meeting with the exception last county commission meeting with the exception of the credit card percentage. I wanted it to be a flat fee, but I don't think that we have to do a number of studies to know that across the board we've had increases in almost every area of business, just like we have in our personal lives. Um, to Commissioner Wilson's point, um, I think we do need to look at what the frequency would be and what the method methodology would be in terms of how we evaluate their fees because it is it's a fashionable statement to say that they have increased costs. How do we support that but also balance the needs of our consumers from undue expenses or being taken advantage of? One thing, um, expenses are being taken advantage of. One thing um, I would share with the industry and uh, kind of comment on one thing that you shared is uh, going forward, articulate the nuances. I don't think any of us were aware of the special conditions as it relates to storing Teslas, but I'll just say probably not specifically, just. EV cars, because we know there are going to be more of those that you're going to have to tow, and you're going to have to make accommodations to your respective businesses and how you tow those cars as we continue to adopt uh, cars that, you know, have that model. Uh, the second thing is uh, when it comes to fraud, um, a lot of Meth a lot of payments are moving to cashless and things like that, and we don't know what it will be in the next five or ten years, so it's something that they're going to have to deal with, but also there's fraud. Um, one of the drivers, I can't remember who mentioned it, about dealing with issues. So if I, if my car gets towed, and let's just say I don't have a bank account, but I have Cash App, and maybe I'm not the most um, honest person, I'll call my bank or whatever, and I'll dispute the charge, and nine times out of ten, if it's below a certain amount, the bank will pay me back my money um, with, with little to nothing in terms of discussion, and then now it's the burden on the business, any business, to go back and forth with the bank and it's rock, paper, scissors as to whether or not they're going to incur that cost. 
And so knowing that we are moving uh, away from cash, knowing that there are going to be more automated systems of payment, I think that, you know, um, I think the industry standard is one. Um, for no other reason than we may have to come back here again. And so when we make these decisions, I want us to make decisions based on what today's you know, standards are, obviously, but also with, in the back of our minds, knowing that this may change and we want to make sure that we are, are being respectful of our time, industry's time, and our staff's time. And so basically what I'm saying is I want to make sure that we get it right the first time so that we don't have to continue to revisit this issue. Sure. But um, I do appreciate you and the industry and the work that you guys have put into this. Um, and so just thank you for your time and your work. Thank you. Just to add a little bit to what you said, um, talking with the towing industry reps and that scenario of not the towing company being um, on doing shady things, but the actual consumer, they didn't like the tow, da 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 da, da and right? So they dispute it with the credit card company, okay? And so if that happens enough to a towing company, they can actually be blacklisted from that specific card being used with that merchant, which hurts them because in our ordinance, they have to accept every single type of method of payment. So that's something that, you know. Thank you, Louis. All right, I think we've gone through. Uh... Mayor, um, just as you may come back to a potential um, action or motion, I just want to clarify that the advertised ordinance does not include any of the dis uh, potential amendments regarding a credit card processing fee. So ultimately, if that's something that the board's interested in adding, um, I know as Scott Shevnall with the county attorney's office has some potential language that the board may want to consider. I know that was a, a sort of the one remaining issue from the prior work session. So um, just again, the advertised ordinance, uh, it says no credit card pr uh, processing fees. So if the if board's interested in adding it, we'd have to propose an amendment here this, this evening. I think what what Mr. Boyce has recommended was this flat fee, right? We're not talking about a credit card. Correct, but um, just to be clear, 3556 uh, uh, paragraph O parentheses 1 uh, says there shall be no fees added as a credit card processing fee. Even the $2 flat rate that Mr. Boyce was recommending would require an amendment to that particular section of the ordinance. Okay. But you say he has the language to articulate what it would be if we did add it, right? Yeah, so we're talking about what we're talking about is 35-56, and it's paren O, and it's in a different section than the other amendments that have already been approved. So we have to take a look at that. And I would propose that uh, starting online, the language that uh, Mr. Weiss is talking about starts on page 700, or line 700, rather, page 17. I'm sorry, let me back up one. 699, it says, no additional charges may be required if payment is made using a credit or debit card. The recommendation would be we would line that out uh, and then go on to say and underline this. This would be the addition. If payment is made with a debit or a credit card, a fee, and I would recommend this language, a fee not otherwise prohibited by Florida law, and I say that because at one point surcharges uh, were illegal. There's still a, a law on the books in Florida that says surcharges are illegal, uh, but however, that was overturned with a case out of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal in Atlanta back in 2015, so now surcharges are, you know, you're able to put a surcharge on there. So I would have, if payment is made with a debit or credit card, a fee not otherwise prohibited by law may be charged for the use of such card. In no event shall the fee exceed, and this is the part that we could just use a flat fee, exceed $2 uh, and leave it at that. Now, I don't know if we want to divide it up with the 500 you know, $500 tow or not, or just leave it at a flat $2 fee, which seems to be the, the path of least resistance if folks are comfortable with the $2 fee. Well, um, from the, based on the testimony from the industry, whether it's $2 or $5 is uh, almost insignificant to them. And we could well, also go with a percentage right as well. So. <laughs> so we could also use a percentage as well. It could be a flat fee, it could be a percentage. I, I, that just gets too complicated. I think we need to move forward with this and then establish a, a regroup on some data collection so that we aren't letting this go for another however many years. I don't want them to continue to go without something because we want to try to, so, <laughs> to retool this again. So perhaps we just leave it as is with no fees. Since $2 is like nickel and diming people. I mean, it's $2. You know. We need to set up a time to make sure so we're... Okay, so that's that's the easiest. Okay, then let's just go with no fee based on the feedback that we're getting. That's that's not 
the issue that they are trying to get after. Uh, we're going to have to gather some additional data to get to where they want to be. Now, when we started out, Mr. Boyce, uh, with previous presentations, uh, you had a chart uh, with suggested uh, or requested yeah. changes yeah. by the industry yeah. versus what we ultimately came up with. And my recall was that was not we weren't far off. So I don't I don't believe that we need to go back and revisit yeah. that. So we came we very close to what the industry in many of these cases, what the industry was recommending and uh, we tweaked it, we modified it. So I don't feel that today we need to go back over no. that. Uh, the only thing we need to get comfortable with is whether or not we want to entertain the flat fee. What we're saying to this industry is that uh, we won't let it be nine years you know, before we will come back and make some adjustments uh, to what the fees may be. Uh, and that, that was a long period of time. Uh, no one on this board was here nine years ago, so, but, uh, but we're here today. And so uh, perhaps what, if we can get some board consensus around when do we want to bring it back, it's taken a while to get us to this point, so I don't feel that we need to bring it back in 2023 or 2024, but maybe so I have at a some point. The industry reps that. came and they said they were, were going to come back earlier, but because of the pandemic, they didn't. And there, what I heard from Mr. Bob was that this is something that should probably be reviewed every four or five years. Um, and they were trying to do that, but um, in the, you know, economic indicators were as they were, and then we hit with COVID. Yeah, so. I understand. Yeah. So my question was going to be, if we say we're going to come back, let's say in a year and a half or something, some distance or range like that, will that include them already pulling all the data first and then coming back at that time with the data, or is that? We'd have to pull new data. So Okay, I mean, so that's going to be, all yeah, that work so would be done beforehand. Okay. I don't know. As a recommendation, why don't we just say 2025? And, and we did that analysis of other counties across the the um, state that are doing and updating their fees and about we said last time there were about five of them with few in process right now so when we come back to you we'll have to do that benchmark over again and you'll see the wave of new increases across the state type start to take place as counties like ours in Hillsborough and Miami Dade has updated theirs their last update was 2003 so they had a 43 percent CPI adjustment that they had to um, calculate as a part of their all right, so when when do you all want to bring it back Mayor, I concur with your recommendation of uh, 2025. Yeah, All right, me too. 2025, can, um, that we will, we will strike the language reference, the flat fee, and bring it back in 2025. So just for housekeeping, 20, 21 and 22 are the pages that, the, uh, that show the ordinance with the uh, changes, and that's being approved by the board today. And those should be in your packet. Those are exactly what you received in your packet. And that okay. reflects what Lucas just Is there a motion? So moves Bonilla and that sorry, we... Hall, let's just get clarification. There is no years. flat fee in there, correct? Right. There's no fee for okay, the that's credit card. I'm just looking no. at the counter turning. Mm -hmm. all, you're all I just want to make sure we're not making a motion yeah, or the, something that's getting... Okay. Um, the only thing the board would be uh, approving are the amendments that are set forth on pages 21 and 22. The increase which is, uh, right. which is in, okay. what, what's in your packet. Okay. And, the, and the packet didn't have any changes on page 17 okay. to the, that's to the uh, fee. Right. Okay. So, right. Yeah. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Well, and okay. just to make clear on the motion, the motion is to approve the requested action with us coming back in 2025. No. Right? No, no. no, so leave out when we're coming back? It doesn't have to be in the it doesn't need to be in. It doesn't the need to be in Washington. Okay. That, that can, if, you know, that's kind of what we're saying here. The consensus around the fact that we'll bring it back in 2025. That'll be in the record. Okay. Okay. So I'll take out that. So okay. just I move. I just to want to make sure the clerk is clear. <laughs> you're, you're all clear on what we what we're saying. Okay. He's nodding. All right. So <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Uh, the motion passes and it is unanimous. Mayor. All right. Who's asking? Oh, yes. Can you state the maker and the seconder, please? Okay. 
the motion uh, was, <laughs> actually I heard two people, but we're gonna give it to Commissioner Bonilla and. Uh, and the second one is Myra. Sorry, Commissioner Uribe. <laughs> Commissioner Uribe. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, we got it. All right, so let's move to the next item. <laughs> Thank you all for your presence today. We're gonna go to item F14. Uh, we're gonna open the public hearing. Uh, we're going to have Ms. Myrna uh, Bark come forward, uh, the project manager from our transportation planning division. Uh, she will be framing this next item. And with that, you are recognized. Yes, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Today we're going to talk about the Orange County Code Chapter 30 update. Background, ordinance updates, summary, and action requested. That's the presentation outline. Okay. Some background. Concurrency is a growth management tool intended to ensure infrastructure is available to support new development. Concurrency first adopted into state law in 1985 with Growth Management Act, Florida Statute 163.3180. Numerous revisions over time. Where, con where concurrency evolved and concurrency exception areas and uh, a concurrency uh, multimodal area was created in downtown Orlando. Major changes in 2011 as part of the Florida Community Planning Act where concurrency, the state law requires us to keep it but then we have to follow steps. One of the steps, a few of the steps is you cannot deny project on a failing roadway and also you have to give impact fee credit dollar per dollar for every prop share agreement we do with the developer. We removed also financial visibility requirements, several optional components, detailed requirements for transportation concurrency. Concurrency in Orange County in Chapter 30, we have potable water, solid waste, wastewater, parks and recreation, stormwater, roads, transportation, mass transit, public schools, and areas are established in the comprehensive plan, a comprehensive plan, evaluation methodology differs by type. Concurrency in Orange County comes in many flavors, available, encumbered, reserved, and vested. Infrastructure capacity evaluated at various stages of development. Capacity information letter at the beginning stage of the project, capacity evaluation at the comp plan, rezoning, subdivision, capacity encumbrance letter at plat, capacity reservation certificate at permit, generally required no later than building permit. Code defines concurrency administration, fees, and key terms such as vested rights and de minimis impacts. During the June 2021 BCC work session, Transportation Planning Incorporated the provided feedback into the ordinance, removing the AMA, adding intersection improvements, multimodal improvements, change of area influence based on the size of the development. Ordinance updates, general updates, definition, statutory reference, and process to comply with the latest state requirements, change reference to level of service standard to those in capital improvement elements of the comprehensive plan, delete concept of waiting list, simplifies reservation provision to a standard three year period. Schools clarifies that residential subdivision planted before 2008 are now exempt from school concurrency without application for vested rights clarifies the minimus impact to be consistent with the comp plan and the ILA as any residential development that generates less than one student, updates statutory reference, proportionate share impact fee credit, language, and concurrency evaluation process. Transportation removes the concept of the alternative mobility area, transportation concurrency exception area, refines traffic study methodology to include intersection improvements, specific transportation and anal analysis methodology stamp, updates how capacity reservation fees are calculated and when fees are due for certified affordable housing projects, 
defines de minimis new development or redevelopment on a parcel which does not exceed a total PM peak of five peak hour trip shall be exempt for the requirements of concurrency. Also on the transportation updates definition of proportionate share contribution to provide flexibility to provide for construction of intersection improvements incorporates statutory prohibition for the denial of a development permit because of a transportation concurrency deficiency adds that CEL extension shall not be granted if the capacity encumber affects a deficient road segment minor updates to procedure for proportionate chair agreements and the county's roadway agreement committee change after LPA public hearing January 19 2023 with struck line 1076 to 1079 in summary concurrency attempts to ensure infrastructure availability concurrent with the impacts of new development amendments to chapter 30 include cleanups and those required for consistency with the state law major changes related to transportation concurrency methodology and proportionate share ordinance reviewed and work session with DAB and LPA in 2022 LPA recommended approval of the proposed ordinance action requested make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan approval of the amended ordinance related to concurrency in Orange County Florida amending chapter 30 planning and development of the Orange County Code amending division 3 concurrency exemptions and vested rights of article 11 comprehensive plan and vested rights amending division one generally division two level of service standards division three concurrency evaluation division four capacity information letters division five capacity encumbered letters division six capacity reservation certificates division seven concurrency administration and division eight concurrency appeal mitigation process of article 12 concurrency management and providing an effective date as amended and allow staff to correct any non-substantial grammatical or scrivener errors that complete my presentation and now if you have any question I'll be more than happy to answer and we have some staff from our legal uh, division and uh, my boss I hear you. so <laughs> you'll stay in by Myrna. Well, I'm gonna open it up for sure. uh, public comment uh, a correction yeah public comment at this time so do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard there are no uh, speakers for this item mayor okay all right then we're going to close the public hearing and we'll go to any questions or comments by members of the board at this time commissioner uribe hi i just have a point of clarity i saw that here on on um one of them when you say removes the concept of the alternative mobility area had not we already removed that from back in, in may yeah, we removed it in the comp plan, but this is removed. I mean, we did not remove it from the comp plan yet. Okay. And um, I, have, I have one more question, but I'm trying to make sure how I frame it. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm done here. I may come back. I may not. You're done. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Moore. I just want to say I'm very happy that we included intersections in there because how many times have we wanted to fund... A, a parcel of road that was, you know, three miles away or something, and, and we really had a, a intersection that needed improvement. So yes, I'm really happy you worked to add that to the language. Now yes, I know my one question. This has actually come up recently <laughs> with Public Works. Sorry, it was, it's it's on top of hers. Now, when it comes to a road that we split with another district, yes. You know, so we've done. You guys have done the due diligence of the study, and now we have come to the conclusion that. You guys recommend speed bumps but we share that road so basically I'm on the east he's on the west how how is that handled when it comes to that because we're starting to you know see that like specifically Commissioner Scott and myself we have a very dense area that we literally split roads and, and Brett I've talked to you about this where sure. the east side of the street you know needs something and the west side needs something and, and now I've come up to a problem where the previous commissioner didn't want to pay for the speed bump, so now I'm being asked to pay for it, and I'm like, we should split it. You know, like, how are we handling these things, especially in the highly dense area? I haven't talked to you yet, so. <laughs> uh, commissioner, if I would just clarify that um, the concurrency changes and what what really is is it related to speed well, bumps and more. No, it wasn't. It absolutely isn't. It was about the traffic study 
when you're assessing it and we have that issue come up. That's ex ex what she was just talking about is how we're assessing the study areas and then how is how are we handling that when it comes to district boundaries. That was just an, an add-on to that. The, for, at least as far as the traffic studies go, the district boundaries are largely irrelevant. Correct. It becomes a little more complicated when you get into municipal uh, boundaries. Right. But at least as far as district boundaries, it, it's completely dependent. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? If not, a uh, motion for approval. You will see that request an action. So moved more. Second, Uribe. We have a motion and a, a seconder. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. A motion passes and it is unanimous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to I, item uh, G15 uh, A and B at this time. And we'll open the public hearing on this item. Mr. Sorensen uh, is going to frame this item. And the next, and the next. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Commissioners. Um, this next case will be an adoption public hearing for a small-scale future land use map amendment. This project is located in District 2. The address is 8082 Gilliam Road. The request is to go from Rural Settlement 1 to 5 to Rural Settlement 1 to 2 for a portion, 3.5-acre portion of the subject property for one additional home. Again, we're located in District 2. This is an aerial of the subject property showing it south of Gilliam Road and east of West Orange Trail. Uh, we're only here talking about a 3.5 acre portion of the subject property. What you see here in this map are the green parcels. Um, those indicate parcels that are 3.5 acres or less. Um, and this is according to the property appraiser database. So the uh, request would be consistent with other properties in the immediate vicinity. Again, the current future land use is rural settlement one to five. And for the eastern portion of the site, it would change to RS one to two. And the zoning is A1 and that would remain unchanged. 61 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 800 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received zero responses in favor and resp five responses in opposition, citing concerns for the addition of another home, noise, and traffic. A community meeting was held on November 30th with eight residents in attendance who expressed concerns for precedent setting for smaller lots in the area, increased noise, lighting, and traffic. At the local planning agency hearing, there were two speakers who spoke in favor of the request and none spoke in opposition. The local planning agency is recommending that the board make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and adopt the request of rural settlement one to two future land use and approve the associated small scale ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. All right. Um, is the applicant on this item present? If so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? My name is Erica Diaz. I own the property located at 8082 Gilliam Road, and I just want to say thank you. Um, my purpose is to build a new home and beautify the area. I know that a lot of the houses on that area are older, so my plan is just to make it look beautiful. All right. Uh, thank you very much. If you will stand by just for a moment. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? The only speaker card I have is Ms. Erica Diaz, so no other speakers. Okay. So with that, then uh, we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Moore, for a potential motion. Yes, uh, Jason, I just had a question. The one concern that I heard from the folks is kind of a, this coat creep argument. Um, is there any language or a condition here that would just um, perhaps add some language that there will be no more lot splits on either of those two properties? Yeah, so for the subject parcel, um, the, the lot one uh, would be five acres, so that, that would only allow for one home because it would still have the uh, one to five designation. Um, so the new parcel would be 3.5 acres, and it would have the designation of RS1 to 2. So they would need four acres if there was any potential further lot splits. So at 3.5 acres, 
all they could get is one home with no further lot splits permissible. So it's unnecessary is what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Um, I really haven't heard from the residents a whole lot, and George Wiggins, um, who is Mr. Rural Settlement, <laughs> he, he voted for it. So with that, I'm going to make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Gomez. Yeah. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Moore, second by Commissioner Gomez-Scudero. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, thank you, uh, ma'am, for your presence today. Thank you. All right. We're going to move then to the next item, H16 A and B. Uh, Mr. Sorensen is going to frame this item as well. We'll open the public hearing at this time. Mayor, uh, before I start, item H16 and I17, these are uh, requests uh, for properties that are adjacent to each other. The applicant um, has asked if we could open uh, these requests together. There was one community meeting for both requests. Um, so with, uh, if we could open items uh, I H16 and I17 together and have one public hearing for both items. All right, that sounds good to me. All right, I'll go through uh, each item uh, separately though um, for the purpose of explaining the request. Uh, the first request here is um, a request to change the future land use designation from commercial to growth center plan development medium high density residential on a property that has 9.96 net acres for proposed 200, 250 multifamily dwelling units and we're located in District 1. Also associated with this request is a text amendment to record the development program for the request. Mm -hmm. The aerial is subject property shows that it's uh, east of Avalon Road and south of Grove Blossom Way. The current future land use is commercial. The proposed future land use is Grove Center PD medium high density residential. And the zoning is A1. If this does get transmitted today, when it comes back for adoption, there would be a land use plan associated with it. 630 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 1,500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received one response in opposition. A community meeting was held on February 28th with three residents in attendance expressing concerns for traffic, school overcrowding, and opposition to multifamily development. I will note, however, that there is school capacity for both of these requests. At the local planning agency hearing, there were no speakers. The local planning agency staff are recommending that the amendments be found sufficient and in compliance and transmit the amendments to the state reviewing agencies. So that was case um, item H16. Item I17, which is adjacent to the property, I16, this is a request to uh, change the development program, future land use policy 8.1.4, to update it to a new program. Uh, we're located in District 1. This is the subject property on the east side of Avalon Road. The future land use, which will remain unchanged, is Growth Center, PD, Commercial Medium Density Residential, Low Density Residential. And it already has a PD zoning. So this is the current development program showing it has 20,000 square feet of commercial uses permitted, as well as 700 dwelling units that are single family. Um, the change request is to reduce the single family units to 253 and to allow for multifamily units up to 304 units and also keeping the commercial square footage of 20,000 square feet. This would be a reduction of 143 units overall. And the, at the community meeting, which was the same as the previous request, there are three residents with these concerns, traffic, school overcrowding, and opposition to multifamily. And also staff and LPA are recommending transmittal of these requests as well. Staff is available for any questions. All right, uh, with that, uh, we could take up both items, but I'm going to, uh, is the applicant present? Uh, would you like to come forward, Mr. Woodall? Good evening, comments? Mayor and remaining commissioners. <laughs> Uh, Chuck Woodall, Unicorp National Developments, uh, 7940 Via Delagio Way, Orlando, Florida. Uh, in the essence of saving you all time, um, I would just like to comment on rebuttal. We uh, agree with staff's recommendation and the LPA recommendation, and I would just like to hold any time for rebuttal. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor. I have one speaker card for H16. It's Charles Hassel. Please state your name and address for the record. You'll have two minutes. 
Charles Hassel, 16943 Wingspread Loop. Happy resident of Horizon West. I'll be brief. Um, good evening, Mayor Commissioners. I oppose this request. I ask that you oppose this for a couple of reasons. Traffic, the rest of the Avalon Road. It's also a known traffic issue. There's a solution, but it's six to 10 years away to widen that section of Avalon Road. Um, schools, overcrowded. Uh, Any other members of the public present? No other speakers. Heard on the side? No other speakers it? for this item, Mayor. Okay, then uh, Mr. Woodall, if you would like uh, to make any rebuttal comments. Yeah, just quickly, uh, I would like to say we already have a concurrency for traffic and concurrency for schools. Uh, we're building less than the approved intensity. So, you know, we would ask you to approve our plan the way we've submitted it. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, then we'll close the public hearing at this time. And we still do have a quorum. Any questions or comments by commissioners? <laughs> I see none. Uh, Commissioner Wilson, would you like to offer a potential motion? Um, yes, I would. I actually have had many, many conversations. I, I know that there were only three people at the meeting, but we've had a number of conversations about what was um, established in the future land use map. Um, and the potential erosion of that <clears throat> in, you know, part of the comprehensive plans, goals, and objectives is related to do compact urban development with services that are included within uh, a region. And so I, I um, would say that approaching something that's going to change that future land use map here um, that takes away some potential at some point for commercial on that parcel is contradictory to the plan that the... Um, that the comprehensive plan really shoots for in these objectives. So with that, I make a motion for denial. Second, Bonilla. Okay, uh, there's a motion uh, and a second on, for, deni <clears throat> for denial uh, in that Commissioner Gomez Cadero is just walking back in. We'll give her time to be seated. Okay, all right, we do have a question, Commissioner Uribe. Um, sorry, I stepped out for the restroom. But can you just give me a snippet? To well, um, it, it's a, it's a, so yeah. you know, obviously the future land use map, but the comprehensive plan is like the thing that's furthest out to look right. at, right? And as you move in, our ability to navigate sort of what we're telling residents is coming gets less and less, right? So once we get to zoning, it gets very complicated because the future land use map. So out here in this area, um, project will still stay in put as, as, I mean, there's still a lot of value in what it was established as, was commercial and um, residential, but the ask to go to high density, multifamily luxury um, is part of the update that is, So know, they're requesting an R3? Um, they requested a, what? Oh, PD, for, for high density, multifamily residential. And, and can I address this? Because I was blindsided no. by this. You, uh, no, that's not a blindsided. It's, it's a process. Just, just one second. No uh, Mr. Prince, we uh, have a kind motion. of turning. <laughs> Mayor, I ju we just wanted to clarify the motion to deny was as to both both of those items, uh, H16 and I17. Yes. Okay. Can I have one more point of clarity? Is this the application with the apartments that we were, there was a request to change the flooring? Or is this completely separate? No, it's, it's this is comprehensive plan, so way for back. Uh, and has the applicant met with the commissioner? I, we, we were at a community meeting together and heard the same feedback, which was if we were promised commercial and they said it's in a future land use map, it's part of a sector plan or part of a comprehensive plan, why isn't that predictable? So can yeah, I, we heard the I same feedback. It? No, <laughs> still not. Can, can I ask a question to the applicant? Because I wasn't here when it was I presented. know, but this was a, it's a public hearing and the mayor closed the public hearing and, I and I, made a, public I made a motion and I'm, I'm and I seconded it. There's a second, right. so I believe so, we're in. So uh, process-wise, you know, the motion that goes forward, it can, you can either vote it up or vote it down, and we'll see where it lands uh, and go from there. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor. There's a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No, because I don't know. So I'm just going to say. I have to uh, vote no on it. I, I, I'm voting no. I'm, I'm, I got confused. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, I'm yeah so okay, thinking. I'll explain it very simple. There, no, right I, now I, it's mixed I use, and the they want to. I prefer the county attorney <laughs> or either staff explain it, uh, just yeah. so there's no ambiguity there. Um, 
So, ma 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 so but, as a point of process, the vote is done, so now he's going to explain it. Someone can make an motion to change that if. We're tied. Yeah, okay. We're okay. tied. Okay. okay. So, uh, the, the ayes were Wilson. Okay. Did you vote? I or no? I yeah. I she, you well, voted. I didn't. She, yeah. She I, voted I, I vote I. 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 She's confused. But is there? I'm explanation. confused. I is voted this? no. Commissioner you Uribe voted no. Voted no. Okay. Commissioner Bonilla. How voted did you I. vote? She and voted I. I. No. Commissioner Scott. How did you vote? I voted no. I want the. Can you put the map back up? Because now I'm, I'm confused. Okay. I so, uh, <laughs> technically, then. Uh, that yeah, I, I did not mean it's to create any confusion. It's it's three, it was, it it was three there were three. no questions before you closed the hearing, so I didn't mean to do that in, in any way to confuse. Well, but the, commissioners the were not here. They were yeah, no, no, but, but I was just saying, to me, it was very straightforward that this is the opportunity pretty far back to not alter the future land use map that has been okay. put in place. So the, the motion did not pass. Did not okay, pass. so uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Princell, uh, we entertain a new motion. Well, the motion to deny passed, as I understood. No, no, no it three, was three, three to three. Three, three. three to three. <laughs> it's tied. <It's> <laughs> but I have a question. We, we, Is this for the two of them, 16 and 17? Yes. Yeah. So that's one motion for the oh. Yes, yeah, so the motion, uh, the motion was to deny transmittal on those two items, those two public hearing items. So it was a tie vote. So uh, we can try another vote, but if it's a deadlock, this this – these amendments aren't going anywhere. They will not be transmitted. Mayor, we would need a majority vote to transmit. Okay. Mayor, if I may, it may, be, it may be worth clarifying the request again, exactly what public hearing 16 was and what public hearing 17 okay. was. S staff can clarify that. Since the motion failed, is it possible to open for discussion uh, we, and possibly discuss 16 and 17 separately? We were under the impression, since it was a cohesive development by the same developer, um, but they are two okay. separate projects. Uh, I'm going to go to, in terms of, what's the staff recommendation on this, John? It, it, well, in terms of the, the, the request, um, so uh, public hearing age 16, um, Mr. Sorensen, I don't know if you want to go back to maybe some of the, the maps or the graphics, um, and, and Ms. Hughes is, is correct, uh, they are two separate parcels. Um, and they're actually situated differently because one of them actually has entitlements and future land use, and the other one is requesting to substantially change that. And so um, public hearing 16 is an amendment from commercial to growth center PD to accommodate a medium high density residential development. Uh, that's a, sort of, a, 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 again, a, a more significant change than a public hearing 17, which was a modification to the development program, largely of which is already approved. Okay, so if we want to bifurcate the two out, we'll take up H16 AMV and then H17. Okay? All right, so, all right, questions, we'll, we're going to bifurcate them out. H16, but uh, question, uh, Commissioner Uribe. John, I'm coming to you because <laughs> normally transmittal is almost a formality it's in the changed. past. And this project was approved already by the board, and now we're going about going to transmit. I, I do apologize; um, my bladder couldn't hold, so I did leave. <laughs> but I really, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a district one, so I'm, I'm not aware. Can you, can you walk us through a little bit on that? Because I don't want to be unfair and say applicant, come talk, because you guys had your time. So I'm asking staff to fill us in on this because I'm looking at this as transmittal. So, so, so the. This is a comprehensive plan amendment, um, and it is a transmittal phase. So the, ultimately, right. that would go to the state and then come back for a consideration right. by the board for adoption. Um, the, 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 again, when you look at uh, public hearing 16 without this particular request, its current future land use is commercial. So we're not depriving anybody of it. So it, again, it has a future land use, you know, land use designation, but what they're proposing is to change it to, to grow center, medium, high, de high density residential. So they want to remove the commercial and make it high density multifamily. So they're removing commercial to do how? That's a request. High density. High density. Okay. And then 17? And then 17, um, Mr. Sorensen, if you want to flip forward to that graphic, you'll see it's a different property. 
Um, and that property largely today has residential entitlements that's predominantly single family. And the request is to modify that, at least in part, uh, to keep some, sing some of the single family would remain, but they would add, or at least a portion of it would pick up uh, uh, it, with multifamily entitlements. So would it be a mix, like an R1 oh, there, and R3? Well, in, in this particular case, you would have single family detached, multifamily, and commercial within that overall uh, PD. Okay, so we're going to go to 816 AMV. That was a recommended action. Could we make a continuance? I'd like to speak to the other commissioners so everybody's informed on this. I mean, that's well, up to... That's up to the board uh, yeah, at this point. I closed the public hearing, but... Uh, so... It could be a motion to continue it. Well, how, what's the procedure if the we uh, we don't have a pending motion on this at this so point? So I would okay. I wouldn't mind entertaining a motion to continue to get more information from staff and Second. motion to continue. Okay. All right, we have a motion to continue eight sixteen uh, A and B. And uh, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Mm -hmm. uh, for the question. The Mayor, county attorney. Mayor, we need uh, a time and date certain, and it needs to be, in light of that new case law that came out, it needs to be uh, scheduled for no sooner than April 11th. Commissioner, I'm oh, willing I'm sorry. for the I'm next sorry. BCC. I'm sorry. Strike that. Yep. Okay. No, it can be, it can be March 21st, and, and not April 11th. It can be earlier. March 21st. I apologize. Okay. So the okay. Next March 21st at 2 p.m., if that's what you're looking at two weeks. March 21st at 2 p.m. I would prefer a little bit further out. We have spring break next week. <laughs> I think the kids are all on vacation. We have March 21st, April 11th, and then the next meeting after that is May 2nd. Prefer April 11th. Okay. April 11th? I would have just done the next one. I just don't feel that I'm April able to even talk to them. No, but we're also okay. All right, the date certain is April 11th, 2 p.m. at 2 p.m. Okay. okay, is that the motion? Yeah, so a motion for continuance to April 11th at 2 p.m. And second, Gomez. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. All right, one, two, three, four, five, five to one. Um, and we'll move to now H17. I mean, wait a minute, I, <laughs> I-17. Uh, okay, I'm going to, uh, now that we have to bifurcate it, I guess I have to open this up again, All right? Well, we're, we just need to take a new motion on this one, Mayor, because the first time around, we had them together, and there was a motion to deny I-17, and there was a tie vote on that, so we need a new vote motion. Okay. So on I-17, I have a motion to continue to April 11th at 2 p.m. Second, Gomez. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Okay. The motion passes 5 to 1. Okay. We're going to move to the next item. This is J-18. 18, J18, A, B, and C. Uh, open the public hearing on this item. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Sorensen, you are up again. All right, thank you, Mayor. For this item, uh, we're just going to ask for a, a continuance uh, to March 21st, BCC hearing at 2 p.m. Continuance to March 21st at 2 p.m. Um, I'll just double check. Is, is the applicant present on this item? And if so, would you like to? Okay. Uh, they're waving on making any comments. Yes. This this one is an adoption hearing, so it has to be April 11th. April 11th. April 11th. 2 okay. p.m. Okay, we'll modify okay. the, the co uh, commissioner. You're going to modify the motion to yes, April 11th. Okay. okay, I'd like to file a motion to continue to April 11th at 2 p.m. Second, Scott. Um, okay, we had a seconder on the other oh. one. previous motion. Was no, no, that was no, that's just another oh, one. Okay, they're okay. all, all right. Yeah. Commissioner Scott. Mm -hmm. They're all coming together. Oh, we have a second on this motion. Mayor, I do have a speaker card. 
uh, for well, J18. Okay. Um, we do have a speaker then. Uh, All right. All Jim right. Worthen. Oh, he's. he's <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. Then we'll close the public. Uh, we'll close the public comment on this item. And uh, we do have a motion uh, by Commissioner Uribe, second by Commissioner Scott, to continue to April 11th, 2 p.m. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. Mayor, this is John. Um, just to, to clarify, and the distinction between the two cases and the continuances is this is an adoption hearing, and it has an associated ordinance, so we actually have to re-advertise uh, the continuance. Even normally, or previously, we wouldn't have had to. So we just need the extra time to make sure that we can re-advertise them. Uh, it's my understanding this may be continuing as well, but I'll open the public hearing. and. Mr. Conkle, we're going to ask you to frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing K-19 is the Southwick Commons PD land use plan amendment. The subject property is located east of South Goldenrod Road and south of Lake Underhill Road. The request is to rezone 0.93 acres from R1A, single family dwelling district, to PD, plan development district, and incorporate the property into the existing Southwick Commons PD. The request is also to change the proposed development program from 124 senior multifamily housing units to 72 townhome units. This item was continued from the January 10 board meeting and the applicant has requested another continuance to April 11 at 2 p.m. I certainly hope April 11th isn't already <laughs> filled with a lot of stuff, but all right. Um, is the applicant on this item present? And if so, would you like to make any comments? I don't think, I think the applicant that's, that's identified. Okay. And then we'll close the public hearing. Commissioner Uribe, would, yes. would you like to make like a motion? Like a file motion to April 11th to 2 p.m. Second, Wilson. All right, we have a motion and a second on this item to continue this to April the 11th of uh, this year at 2 p.m. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, and with that, uh, I believe we have come to the conclusion of our meeting today. If there's no further business or agenda items, then we stand adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.